Want to raise your chest to a new level? Challenge Yourself is an exclusive, innovative experience designed for Chess24 Premium members. Train like a champ with a unique set of lessons prepared by the coaches of the challengers. Boris Gelfin and co. will help you improve your chess. Play a champ. Play a grandmaster each day in Banter Blitz. Take advantage of this incredible opportunity from June 10th. Go premium and challenge yourself. Air quality isn't the first thing that comes to mind when you think about chess and esports, but it affects our focus, decision making, health, sleep, and more. What's in the air you breathe? Find out with Air Things. Breathe better, live better. I'm ahead of the game. up my rock that when you play versus the opponent who has only one opening it's a uh, like rather i think it's rather you uh, really prepare some strong idea in the line where they play like you are preparing against something you know, what they played in their games and then you prepare some strong idea uh, or you choose something different where it's like both of you are not in this theory uh, just maybe some sideline or or whatever uh, where she doesn't have so many games. Yeah, you played this question, okay? Yeah, this one I remember. Okay. This one I think I have seen, but uh, I don't remember. Uh, yeah, just the analysis. I will be uh, more curious. The game you, I'm pretty sure you have seen the game. Welcome, this is the Champions Chess Store and we are about to kick off the AIM Chess US Rapid. This is the final leg of the Champions Chess Tour before the Grand Final in September. So this is the last tournament before we move on to determine and to crown the king of online chess in a tour that has gone across an entire season, an entire year of the best in the world fighting against each other battling it out in the most excruciating online format of rapid of knockout of round robin all of it and uh, now for the aim chess us rapid we've got a very very exciting lineup so first let's take a look at our star cast let's bring up our players as always 16 players fighting it out in the first part of the tournament which will be an each play each the round robin stage where eight will go on to qualify for the quarterfinals. And this is our field. We've got some of the best players in the world, including the world champion Magnus Carlsen topping the field. We've got two very, very exciting tour debutants with Daniel Narodetsky and Eric Hansen in the champion chest for the first time. Uh, and here it, here it is, Levan Aroni and Shakran Mamadiarov, Anish Kiri, Wesley So, Ali Reza, Lania, Maxime Bashir Lagrab, Jan Krishab Duda, the winner of the World Cup. With a Gujarati Lekwang Liam, Vladislav Artamiev, Jordan Van Furest, 
And as we can see, a wonder Liang as well. He is the player who qualified from the Kramnik Challenge, the Challengers Chester. He actually finished runners up there. Uh, but because Winston is playing in the European Championship, it will be a wonder who's got the opportunity to play against the very best in the world. Now, uh, we've also got, we've also, let's take a closer look at. Aim chess stats. Now, aim chess is all about analytics that shows us where the weaknesses, the strengths. It's a digital trainer showing us all the different aspects of the game where these players excel at, where we excel at. And we took a closer look at what skill set they are super good at and their Achilles heel. So let's take a look at some of that. Now, we took a hundred games of these players, of some of these players, uh, over the Meltwater Champions chess tour and put the score across seven core chess skills and as we can see here we have Magnus Carlsen scoring a hundred percent accuracy rate in opening there's no surprises there advantage capitalization so uh, how many times he's managed to convert a very a very good uh, advantage 79 percent resourcefulness which determines the ability to come back from a worse position is at 19 percent a very high accuracy rate this is how much he is able to play the engine stop moves, the accuracy based on the engine stop move at 91%. Well, there's a reason why he's the world champion. Uh, let's also take a look at Wesley So, the other star performer out of the Meltwater uh, Champions Chess store. Now, his opening once again at 100%. What I find really interesting about all these analytics is how all, each of these players shows a very high accuracy rate in the openings, which goes on to show the kind of prep that these guys are coming up with and just how seriously they take the Champions Chester. Uh, another very strong advantage capitalization at 83%. Time management, he, Wesley has been ahead on the clock 62% of the time uh, compared to his opponent. Decisiveness, now I was expecting this not to be super high for Wesley because we've seen him do uh, make a lot of those quick draws, especially once he's confirmed his spot into the knockout stages. Decisiveness at 42%. Uh, this is the amount of wins and losses in the games. And uh, all these games are part of the Meltwater Champions Chess Tour. And you guys, all of us, can actually go to AIM Chess and get our own report to see where we are doing well, what needs improvement, and what sets AIM Chess apart is that based on that, we will give you the data and the personalized training to actually improve that aspect of the game where you need to work on. Now, throughout the season, we've had the best compete against each other in this very, very demanding format. And as you were mentioning, it continues through the AIM Chess US Rapid. Let's quickly take a look at the format of this event. We start with the round robin stage. It's each place, each three days of preliminaries with five games every day. Top eight will make it into the knockout starting with the quarterfinals. The games will be played in the rapid format of 15 minutes with a 10 second increment. So we've been seeing this, uh, we've been seeing this format throughout the tour and that's where we continue with the AIM Chess US Rapid. Now this is a very, very important event because it is the final opportunity for all these players to make it into the grand final in September, the very, very final event of the Champions Chess Tour. How do you qualify for that? 10 players will be playing in the finals. We've got three winners of the majors who have booked their spot already. Let's take a look at that. We've got Temur Rajabov. He won the Air Things Masters and with that, uh, he qualified. He booked his spot into the finals. Uh, Anish Kiri, who won the Magnus Invitational, also booked his spot and Magnus winning the FTX Crypto Cup. Uh, as we can see on our screens, that was the Air Things Masters. And then we had Anish who won the Magnus Invitational and with that qualified for the finals. And finally, Magnus won uh, the FTX Cup and with that took home some Bitcoins as well as a spot in the finals. Now, that's three players. There are going to be five players based on tour standings. And this is where we are with our tour standings. So let's take a look at some of this. Let's just see what is going on here. I'm also going to pull up chat so that I can talk to you guys about all that is happening here. Uh, what is up chat? How is everyone doing? A shout out to Alokine Battery, the legendary mod of Chess 24. All right, so let's take a look at this. Meanwhile, chat, meanwhile, definitely go to Aim Chess. 
do a scout report check out what's going on there what you guys are doing and tell me what you think about it tell me where your weaknesses are and that also reminds me in fact we will be reviewing some of your games it's going to be it's going to be david myself and simon we'll be looking at some of your games and actually taking you through where you can do better with the help of aim chess give you some really cool scientific data on on actually the weaknesses and strengths that would take take you to study hundreds of games to come to so we're going to make all of that really easy for you and if our mods in chat can just spam the link to where our audience can go and uh, all you have to do is comment on the post so that we know what your chess 24 username is and then we will look at your report on aim chess all right can we just quickly get back our tour standing so that we can see which of the players in danger of not making it to the finals so this is where we are now we know that magnus is already in wesley so has got way too many points 257 very understandable he's always made it to the very top he's won events he's made it to the finals so he's very secure wesley levon uh both very secure of going into the finals now raja and anish we know have qualified through the major events yam napomyachi also is in to the final so that's 3 out of the 5 tour standing spots but this is where it gets exciting chat because hikaru nakamura and maxim vasher legrat still not safe hikaru is not playing this event while maxim is playing this event now for hikaru to get knocked out or not make it through to the finals a lot of things have to go wrong for him in this event One Artemiev needs to win the event, and Maxim needs to finish runner-up in the event, and only then will Hikaru be replaced by Maxim and Vladislav Artemiev in the finals of the tour. Maxim in much bigger danger. He needs to have a good performance here, uh, otherwise, lots of players can overtake him. He is playing in this event, so a very, very crucial event for Maxim to make it uh, to make it through in this one. Now, can we also? Let me see. And of course, we've got joining us. Joining us is going to be our grandmaster expert, Surya Shekhar Ganguly. I don't know if he's with us already. Let me check if he's with us. Also, let's get our prizes up. What are the players fighting for in this tour regular event? And we've got Surya with us, joining us shortly. But this is the prize fund. It is a hundred thousand dollar. Uh, Tori went with the winner taking home thirty thousand dollars. Runner up with fifteen thousand. Now it's very important, uh, not just not just the big paycheck, but also the tour points because it all comes down to who makes it to the five top standings in the leaderboard. And of course, then we're going to also have two wild cards who will make it to the finals. I see Gangs is with us, so let's bring him on and discuss all things Aim Chess US Rapid. Welcome. How are you, Surya? Hi Tani, I'm doing good. Um, last time we had a poll and uh, we decided on gangs. Yeah. Let's stick to that. You know, I was thinking uh, right. you were just coming in, and I was like Surya gangs, Surya gangs, and in all the panic of it, I went. But we're going to stick with gangs. The reason Chat decided that was simply because of all the gangster chess moves and all the analysis that you were bringing on. So I think that's fair enough. We will go with that. Now, gangs, this is the final event. before the grand final and a very important one because we will determine who are the players who qualify for the finals of the champions chess tour and we've got a very interesting mix of players we've got Tanya Narodetsky we've got Eric Hansen in the mix yeah. making their debut so that kind of guarantees a really fun lineup very strong very entertaining chess absolutely and also um, many uncompromising players yeah we uh, we, we see um, Whether it is uh, uh, Duda or uh, we also got Avenger, by the way, uh, we got uh, Daniel, Jordan, and Artemiev. So a lot of uh, uncompromising players, and I'm expecting um, you know some really complicated games, really entertaining games, uh, right from round one. In fact, uh, round one we will already see uh, Magnus versus Wesley, right? That is true. That's a very big matchup coming up. And now, gangs, what makes this event even more exciting is all the analytics that we've got from Aim Chess about all these players, and uh, this makes it quite thrilling because they can really see the weakness, the weaknesses, and the strengths of each other. Now, being a top grandmaster yourself, how useful is that in preparation? 
you know the moment i saw this i was wondering that uh, maybe uh, later in the future it would be possible to make it of classical games also so that you know i can also put i would also like to know something like this about my online games and also classical games i think it's a fantastic thing you know you get to know about your um, accuracy where you are going wrong uh, your end games your your opening things it's it's a fantastic uh, way to improve and what i really liked about it it just doesn't give you the data only and then based on your uh, data they are also giving uh, some kind of uh, test yeah, some kind of personalized training i think that is very important you know it's just not uh, analyzing where you are going wrong but based on that preparing some sort of exclusive material mm. so this is useful for every level i would say i think that's a very key feature what you're talking about i actually played around with it a little bit uh I am going to be in the online olympiad so I've been working a little bit for that and I thought I would use this feature to look up what it is that I can uh, that needs of course everything needs improvement but where it is in the online chess format where I'm making most mistakes and I looked around I played around with it and like you mentioned it doesn't only highlight what your strengths are where you where you're doing well and going wrong but gives you a digital personal trainer which is what really sets it apart uh, so a very cool feature definitely check it out chat and uh, as we know that we've got some stats on the players and gangs you were mentioning this massive match up that we have what a kick off with magnus facing wesley i am expecting a wesley shutdown to start with i think he is just going to be like you know what starting the day starting the event with magnus Don't need to take too many chances. But Magnus is going to be playing with the white pieces. Let's take a look at some of the stats that we have on both these players. Uh, gangs, one of the most interesting thing is the hundred percent accuracy rate that we see in their opening prep. We also see that actually Wesley has managed to convert more. Uh, be- has managed to convert better positions. Well. At 83% compared to Magnus is 79%. Resourcefulness as well higher for Wesley compared to Magnus. Accuracy as well higher for uh, Wesley compared to Magnus. Uh, I mean, according to the stats, Wesley is a beast in these online chess formats. Yeah, you know, I was actually uh, paying a little bit attention on this resourcefulness, and it might sound odd, but uh, I think uh, the stronger the player is, here the resourcefulness uh, will be lower. because you know the opponents they are playing when you get a minus position like uh, minus 3 minus 4 you don't escape usually so mm-hmm. basically uh, let's say wesley's chances to to swindle from minus 4 is lot lower than uh, you know if uh, let's say a club player is playing against another club player because there the chances are higher right so that's one thing and opening accuracy yeah this is quite obvious i mean they uh, they will play the opening flawlessly there's just absolutely no doubt on this um absolutely yeah so <clears throat> this is really really uh, useful uh, useful data and once again uh, to have a personalized training based on this sounds very attractive definitely definitely and i and i have to say that i'm loving these stats i mean it really gives you an idea where the players are excelling in and where you can catch them on now the one thing gangs that i found very interesting and here's a pro tip we of course use it for our own games right to see where we can improve but it's also a really great tool to prepare against an opponent because you can actually put in the username of your own of an of any of any player and check out what uh, Uh, what the scout report says and see where you can where you can actually catch them so there's a little bit of uh, advantage in that as well how you can use aim chess we also have stats on jan krishov duda and dominguez let's bring that up and take a look at how the players are doing also chat tell us what do you think about magnus wesley what's your prediction as i was mentioning i am expecting this one to end in a draw gangs before we move on to duda versus dominguez your prediction on magnus wesley um okay drop <laughs> that's that's not much of a hot take that's a safe play bit i i would agree with that 100% now here we've got uh we've got these two players once again super high on that opening uh opening accuracy advantage capitalization and take a look at the decisiveness now uh, and this just shows that 
you know players like Duda players like Dominic Wise who are not playing every online event when they are their decisiveness the decisive results that they have is is quite high 62% for Duda 56% for uh, Dominic Wise that just goes on to show the non compromising play both these players bring to the board yeah also let's not forget that Dominic Wise was uh, once upon a time also uh, world blitz champion and he is uh, he has always been at uh, uh, a top level player and particularly when it comes to rapid and blitz he is exceptionally strong and duda we already know duda is duda mm. uh, it's more <laughs> for the introduction so also i see a clash of style by the way tania here uh, dominguez has been very solid player uh, throughout his career and duda is uh, a very dynamic player so here uh, it's it's a very tough call it's mm. 50 50 you know, I love such matchups. I really like it when you see, as you mentioned, this clash of styles where you've got somebody solid play against somebody extremely combative, extremely aggressive. I think it it just guarantees a game full of fireworks. So I'm very excited about this one. I also want to compare another very interesting matchup that we do have. Let's see if we can bring up as Maxime Vacher Le Grab, the latest the winner, fresh from his victory at the Sinkfield Cup, takes on the beast. The one who brings so much excitement on the board, Shakriya Mamadiarov. Uh, and there we have it. These are the stats that we have from AIM Chess about their performance in online chess over the last 100 games that they have played in the Meltwater Champions Chess Tour. And I, I really like how the accuracy is always so high for these players, gangs. It really goes on to show uh, that even with such little time on the clock and being low on the clock, and I think this is what sets these world's best players apart from, well, some of the good players, top grandmasters, is that even with less time, their accuracy remains A class. Absolutely. <clears throat> I would once again like to emphasize on two things uh, that is, when we see resourcefulness very low, and uh, sometimes, uh, let's say, if uh, if an unrated player, let's say, has more resourcefulness, that does not mean uh, uh, these players are not resourceful. It is just that at that level, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't come back that often. Mm. And same with, uh, let's say, if we look at the end game, forty-seven percent or fifty-five percent, it does not mean that they are playing bad end games or anything. It's just mm. they are not playing at that level, and it is based on those results, right? That's a very good point. So actually. Uh, advantage capitalization accuracy being so high is the reason is the reason why resourcefulness is difficult because the players are just not giving that chance to come back into the game exactly. and i By think this game on, will be, uh, yeah this particular game is going to be completely wild yeah, i mean <laughs> like two of the best attacking players uh, in the world yeah, and they will be fighting on the first round this is going to be a tremendous game Two big games coming up. Magnus taking on Wesley and uh, Maxime taking on Shark. I think we're in for a ride. The players have set up their Opera browsers. Their everything devices are on to make sure that they've got the best air quality to bring out the best in chess. Uh, and I think, gangs, we've got lift off really soon. Let's quickly bring up our matchup before we move on to the chess action. These are the pairings for round one. We've got five rapid games coming up today. And we are ready to go with Dominguez taking on Duda, Shark taking on MVL, Artemi versus Eric Hansen. That's going to be a very, very interesting one. I think uh, Gang's Eric, uh, he, of course, he's he's one of the best streamers, biggest streamers in the world, but he's also a very strong player when it comes to these shorter time formats. Anish taking on Daniel, Daniel Naroditsky, a wonder against Ali Reza. So young blood there. Lavon Aronian against Le Kwang Liam, Jordan versus with it, Magnus against Wesley and do we have lift off? Uh, yes, we do actually. Let's uh, let's jump into what do you want to start with? Uh, I want to do a quick opening tour. I want to do a quick opening tour and see what the players have chosen. All these players who have a one hundred percent accuracy rate according to Aim Trust data. Let's take a look at what they prepared for this event. So let's start with Duda versus Dominguez. So yeah, we got this uh, knight of bishop e3, knight g4, bishop c1. The usual move is knight f6 here. You know, uh, black would just like to repeat. And if that would have happened, I believe uh, Lanier would have played something else. But in the game, knight c6 awkward. Bishop e2 attacking the knight. 
Um, the, the move 96 is not that popular. That's why uh, Lanier is thinking. And now already we got into a territory which is not that common. I mean, usually 96 is so common. And here, instead of saving this knight, black goes for attacking the d4 knight, which cannot move, by the way, because of queen takes f2. So it's a <clears throat> it's not exactly a normal nad of that we are used to see. Mm. That's actually an interesting start to the opening where black has given up that g4 knight and picked up the d4 knight. So quite a quite a unique trade we've got there. Uh, now, gangs, you were all of course watching the World Cup and Duda's magnificent performance there, uh, beating Magnus in the semis, going on to win the finals against Karyakin. What do you think was the standout about his play over there? The quality of play. What do you think was the one was the one overreaching factor for his success in the World Cup? Resourcefulness. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, you can put this in inches, and I think that will be the <laughs> topmost thing that is uh, that we are going to see. Resourcefulness. Um, That's very interesting. So, if AM Chess took the games, the over the board games of the World Cup, you would think that the resourcefulness percentage would be super high for uh, Duda. Absolutely. Let's see. Uh, let's move on to some other games. Uh, let's take a look at the one we've been talking about, gangs, with the Sharks taking on MVL. You know, I was expecting some um, some wild nad or some wild opening, but instead, look, we got some uh, G three Grunfeld symmetrical structure. And we are uh, in the territory of, uh, yeah, very hardcore main theory. And uh, this is going to be a slow game, rather. I mean, I'm not expecting any kind of fireworks starting right now. Hmm. That's interesting because we were just talking about their style of play and how this game is definitely going to be a blast to watch. And I, I agree with you that it's just, it's about, it hasn't happened yet. But we can't expect this to blow up at some time. I'm going to ask the mods on Chess24, on Twitch, as well as on YouTube, to ask our audience, to ask our viewers their prediction on this matchup of a shark taking on MVL. Are we going to have a decisive game? 1-0, one, 0-1 zero, zero, one, or draw? I want to see what our viewers have to say about that. But because this is going to take some time to heat up, let's move on with our opening tour and take a look at what is going on with Artemiev against Eric Hansen. All right. Also very, uh, gangs, you know, I just want to mention that Artem has not played so many events. He's played, I think in all, he's played two events. And I'm going to ask our producer, Tad, to correct me if I'm wrong on this. He's played two events in the Meltwater Champions Chester. But he's played them so phenomenally well. And, and the fact that he's still in the race to make it to the grand final in September by just playing two events. He made it to the finals uh, of these events. It just goes on to show how dangerous an opponent Artemiev is in these formats. Oh, absolutely. He's a he's exceptionally strong player. I remember the year uh, when he won the Gibraltar, the very strong uh, tournament. Uh, he was actually even staying in Spain. Uh, and he was walking like 45 minutes to get to the tournament hall. Mm -hmm. And he was not even prepared before the tournament. He had his uh, university walk and so on. And uh, yeah, he ended up winning the tournament exceptionally gifted player and uh, yeah. definitely a very 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 strong uh, strong guy so we got a rating uh, here d into e4 is one way of dealing the position and uh, yeah we got a white is not looking for any uh, direct opening confrontation or uh, any direct advantage but it turned out uh, i would like to emphasize here for example after playing uh, a5 and c3, the moment black played a5, kind of stopping any kind of queenside uh, expansion, the knight on b1, which uh, Artemiev didn't develop for quite a long time, makes its jump on b5, targeting on, uh, on c7. And now actually, from a practical point of view, I kind of, I would rather be white here. So takes, takes happened, uh, bishop to g4. I'm expecting, uh, yeah, I'm expecting some sort of f3 at some point. Not 100% sure if, uh, if that's what we're going to see. But if, if I don't play f3, my problem is how do I deal with uh, taking on d4? I believe it will be f3 at this point. 
F3 is an interesting move because Black can't really fall back on oh, H5 because the bishop gets trapped there with G4. Does he just want to provoke the move F3 to actually fall back with the bishop because bishop H3 takes on H3, the C7 pawn is hanging as well? Yeah, so probably I'm just thinking like maybe after F3 you have to take here, kind of saying if I take then you have the square and if I take on D4 now you go bishop H3. Something like this. Interesting. Yep. Shall we, Artemiev, uh, taking a little bit of a think here, Artemiev, uh, after bishop g4, a move that clearly provokes white to go f3 to hit that bishop, but in that process blocks out the g2 bishop as well. Uh, there's less pressure on the d5 pawn. So nice move there by Eric, uh, bishop g4. I think... A very dynamic opening. We saw the pawn structure e4, e5, d4, d5. And whenever that happens, we know that middle game is going to blow up. Let's quickly continue with our tour because I see action is heating up on some of the other boards. Uh, let's take a look at Anish versus uh, Daniel Naroditsky, our other debutant at the Meltwater Champions Chester. Wow, Kings Indian, yeah? We got some Kings Indian play. Usually, we don't see much of Kings Indian happening nowadays, but... Um... Yeah, and also a different kind of system. Of course, knight c6 is way more popular, but e takes d4 has been played a number of times. And actually a very interesting line with knight c6. So Daniel, I think the approach here, if I can uh, speculate correctly, is that he doesn't want to challenge Anish in some, uh, the so-called trendy line, where definitely Anish will be more uh, well-prepared. Instead, he takes him to some line which is... Uh, let's say, not as popular uh, as other lines at top level. But um, Anish plays uh, very logically, as usual. And after f5, queen d2, we got a position like this. Attacking the bishop here. I, I don't like black's position much. Actually, I don't even understand how where this bishop is uh, going. Okay, it went to e6, and the first thought comes in mind is what is happening after f4, f5. Mm. I, I like uh, white's piece coordination. Everything is controlled. Yeah. I'm controlling d5 very nicely. I'm controlling the e4 square nicely. So I'm, I'm in time to play f4, f5. Why not? And knight By the way, knight d5 on the board, which is also fine. Because there is a deadly pin, you don't want to play d c6 because then the pawn on d6 will be weak. Mm. In fact, you can probably even pick it up immediately by taking everything on f6 and then going queen d6. Knight d5 putting a lot of pressure on that pin knight. Queen f4 threats, knight e4 coming in. I think big questions for Daniel here. Uh, speaking of big questions, the game that's really caught my attention, gangs, is Levon versus Lake Kwang Liam. Fireworks yeah. on the board already. Can we quickly actually, jump to that? Yeah. Absolutely. I'm just, uh, I'm just dying to get there and give me a moment to even understand what is going on. I mean, seriously, at first, if I have to take an instant call, I would say why this yeah. is a very serious problem here. It looks very dangerous for white, but can we just back up and soak up what just happened in this? Because it's impossible to understand otherwise. So we had a Spanish. Yeah. Yeah, there were, there were a lot of theories here. I remember at some point this rook a5 move was very important. So, uh, yeah, a4 is one of the main line and takes this particular line. I remembered uh, it wasn't great for uh, black theoretically because of this rook a5 move, if I, uh, if I remember correctly. And uh, this particular sacrifice is the only try uh, black hat and it, there were some long legs but it, it was uh, not working I mean uh, we are attacking this uh, bishop and the point of getting the rook to a5 with this rook on e1 is when you move the bishop I want to take on e5 mm. and bishop f2 I'm pretty sure this is all preparation and, I mean, uh, it has to be, right? Liam is, is up to 15 minutes on the clock. He definitely knows what he's doing. And you don't go Bishop F2 unless you've had this position at home. No, no, I mean, absolutely. I mean, uh, 
yeah, if you give me some time, I can also look into my file. I'm hundred percent sure I also had this position, and I also I I have this memory that this position is fine for white, but of course you know when it comes in rapid, uh, yeah, somewhere. Uh, so this is insane. He went to e4 to uh, threatening that h2 pawn. So the king had to fall back to g1, trying to defend that pawn. And black, who's just sacrificed a piece, he sacrificed a piece for for not even a pawn, just for play against white's king. Brings up the last rook into the game, looking for a rook lift. But white still has has a piece in this position. Let's see what happened because the live board that we have, it looks like white is destroyed right now. Yeah. So. At this point, rook e3 happened, knight h5. The only thing I can and sure was, uh, well, we cannot take it, right? Because there is queen, queen g6. g6, queen g2 coming in. And that's actually checkmate. You don't even pick up the yes. rook. You actually end up mating the king. Yeah, you just, you just mate the king, absolutely. But I'm, I'm like 99.9% .9 convinced that I never saw this f4 move. Um, can't be completely sure, but... Something like rook g5 comes into mind. Just taking Just control of the g file because what you need to do is stop black's queen from coming into the attack from g6. Yeah, and once you play h6, I would like to sack it somewhere, maybe, maybe on g4 or on g2. I don't know. Very interesting. But that didn't oh, happen. Actually, actually, it's possible to even take here to attack uh, this guy. Maybe that's the point. Hmm. Also, the h3 bishop would be hanging in that case. But in this position, Levon decided to play f4. And that sort of brings in the knight to f4 as well. A queen g6 can be met by knight, a rook g5, as you're pointing out. But after knight f4, black not only defends the bishop on h3, but again puts pressure on with the threat with queen g6 coming in. Does white go I, rook g5 here? I know why f4 was played. I'm pretty sure he started his calculation with rook g5, stopping queen g6. But then he spotted h6 when all the squares are not available. I believe, as I said, like maybe f into e4 is the way to go. The reason he played f4 is now if you play queen g6, I have uh, rook g5. And once you take knight into f4, now I can play rook g5. Since your knight moved, I have this extra square to hide my rook. So now if you play h6, I want the rook to be on g3. That's the reason of f4. But instead of playing f6, black says, okay, now you lost your f pawn. All I need is to roll my f pawn all the way down. So he goes f5. And um, already at this point, um, it's very hard to suggest how to uh, how to stop black. Black is going to you know, slowly start pushing his pawns. So Levan goes for rook g3, attacking the bishop. Bishop g4. If I could, I would take uh, on g4. But the problem here is, I guess once I take some of this rook will come and then, you know, I'm getting into some very serious trouble here. So yeah, bishop very G4. difficult to sacrifice that rook for the bishop on g4 to open up it. Instead, uh, he decided to go with. Let's just continue with the game. Yeah. Uh, so bishop g4 here. The queen sidestepped and now knight h5. So Liam really keeping up the tempo here, attacking piece after piece. And Welcome let's take a look at what happens after rook g4. Fg4 will be played. I'll take here. I don't actually understand this knight g knight h5 move. Can I take this or not? Does he simply want to take on c6? Is that an option here? Yeah, but now it feels like I will consolidate somehow. Yeah, my pieces will start coming. I imagine if I play something like D D4, for example. Slow it down a little look, bit, the attack. Yeah, it doesn't look very scary. I mean, anything else apart from knight h5 um, would make sense. Although I don't know what, what. For example, why not to take this pawn first? Keep this knight on f4 because nobody is moving anyway. I really like this move because it stops d4. I can take attacking the bishop and look at my queen, which mm. is protecting the rook. And yeah, absolutely. Queen on c6 defends the rook on e8, uh, stopping d4, very important point, but knight h5 played. So gangs, you think that white needs to sacrifice this exchange at this moment, give up that rook, go rook g4, pick up that e4 pawn, and how would you evaluate uh, this transaction? 
I would be very happy here uh, as white compared to you know the position I had just one move before. Here I would be terrified with my pieces. And once knight h5 happened, I will just uh, take on g4, take on e4, and say you know you had you had two scary uh, you had two scary pawns on e4 and f5. You had a scary knight on f4, and all of them are gone. So queen c6, I believe, will happen and. I really like the move d4 somehow, like trying to bring more pieces, taking control over the f4 square. It doesn't look very uh, scary at this point to me. Well, and a quick update. Well, it, a big moment for Lev here. So he's got to decide he's taking his time, a very critical moment after knight h5. Will he take on g4 in the line that Yangs is showing us? Uh, we'll come back to this. We've had a first result, Gangs, and I'm slightly disappointed to say that it was the game where we were expecting maximum on, action. Uh, on, Shakriar Mamadyarov and Maxim Vashir Lagrav has ended in a draw. Wait, how did they even play it out so many moves? Yeah, I mean, so we just, where, where did we leave? We, we left it here, yeah? And then we just got a very symmetrical position. Actually, even this... I believe uh, is some sort of theory. So, uh, yeah, basically uh, this all has been played. Mm -hmm. There's nothing, really I, nothing happened there. I have absolutely nothing to add. This is not something new. And that's why they all get 100% on their accuracy in openings. <laughs> All right, well, this one ended in a draw, but things are heating up across other boards. Uh, let's take a look at Magnus's game. What's going on there? What is the world champion doing against Wesley? Now, surprisingly, I thought this will be an early shutdown, but it looks like that's not where it's headed. I mean, I'm kind of liking White's position here with that knight on d6. Definitely. Uh, I totally agree with this. This knight on d6 is going to remain forever or it will be replaced by the pawn. Now, I, I am a guy who likes bishop. So for me, the first move that comes in mind is uh, knight into g3, but that did not happen. Um, if I attack this knight somehow, I'll force knight g3. So I'm thinking about uh, rook e1 currently. But I, I should probably also watch out for, uh, there is one trick, yeah, though, uh, like, let's say, if you take, take, and there is move like rook d8 that I should be thinking about at least. And now if you take, takes here, no, this does not work. Okay, this does not work because, okay, I take the queen, take. you go bishop b5 in I the end? I go bishop b5. So this is not something that I will be bothered about. Uh, but there are moves like... Similar idea, gang. Similar idea. You're mentioning rookie one forcing black to take a decision with that knight on e4. Magnus does something uh, something like that, but instead goes with the queen to d4. Also really nice because it hits the knight on e4. An additional pressure on the b6 pawn. And he's saying, you know what? I don't know where I want to put my f1 rook. Does it belong on e1 or d1? Time will tell. Absolutely. This is a much stronger move. I was actually... While considering rook e1, I was also considering to move queen d3 to, to have queen g3 option. But yeah, both, yeah, also queen d4, I really like it. There is a, there is a very direct target. And now it puts the question, was queen b8 a good move? Not exactly sure. Uh, I think Wesley know... also needs to find a way to fight that knight on d6. So probably wanting to get that rook on d8, pin that knight, try and put pressure on... a pressure on it. Uh, is there an option currently? Can he actually ignore the threat of queen b6 and go rook to d8? Uh, you can't go knight e4 because it's pinned. But after rook d8, would, black, would white have the option to pick up the b6 pawn? I mean, I would just consider something like just rook fd1. Mm. But yeah. Uh, take... He goes b5. That is a very dynamic move by Wesley. Uh, wow. That is very interesting because the pawn is just on pre here. The bishop can pick it up. The knight can pick it up. What is the threat actually? So if I take, let me first understand in a very layman manner. So can I try to do some x-ray? Like, you know, I take here. You take, I take here. Something like this, let's say. But, mm -hmm. but 
it doesn't look very appealing to me. So after bishop c6, you still have bishop e5 in that position. Yeah, that was that was uh, kind of my point. But I am thinking even if e takes d6, this doesn't look uh, super appealing. Uh, so th is this the idea? Like bishop b5 to take on g3 or he wants to start with rook d8, not sure. Bishop b5 on the board. Magnus doesn't hesitate. He barely takes any time. Uh, gobbles up that pawn on b5. And what did Wesley have in mind? Down to eight minutes, both players. Now we will come back to this game uh, and see how Wesley creates his initiative or what was his idea of giving up that pawn. But can we quickly go to the Jordan Van Forest and Vidit game? Because I see a massive clock difference there, a massive difference in their clock time. And uh, not just that, a mate in one threatened currently with that queen on A8. What is going on here? How is White fighting this? I'm just trying to digest that apart from this, let's not forget black is one whole piece of. And there's no rook d7 check. For a moment, I thought, wait a second, what about rook d7 check? And then you realize the bishop on h3 controls that square. I mean, how did this happen that, you know, white was a piece down and as a compensation, black got attacked. <laughs> <laughs> so black has an extra piece and black's the one who's threatening checkmate in one. And with it looking very relaxed there, we can see both the players. Uh, I think this is, Jordan is completely busted here. I would be very relaxed even if I'm playing Alpha Zero in this position as black. <laughs> Trust me. I'll be like super relaxed. So, how did this happen? Um, okay, some normal... Uh, theoretical uh, discussion here. Why typically... Uh, goes for uh, this kind of line to prove compensation but strictly speaking i mean just going by the theory white has not proved advantage in fact black gets usually very comfortable position so it's i'm curious what uh, you're going to be shocked gangs you're going to be shocked with what happened but go on let's go on because uh, let's see how this proceeded and got to the live board and everything looked fine here right like rook d5 how can white end up and now Okay, doesn't doesn't look. Doesn't and I look think he just missed this. He just completely missed. He went rook g seven, calculated this tactics. King takes g seven, picks up the rook, and after bishop h three, I think he missed the fact that rook d one, rook t seven. What we've been talking about is impossible, because here he can just come back with the bishop to g two. Simple oh, no. move, keep everything under control. But instead, Jordan made the move. Rook to d1, giving up the bishop on a8. And the only explanation to this is that he thought rook d7 is a possibility here. Absolutely. As they say, Tanya, I mean, uh, I don't know how true it is, but very often it is uh, visible in a number of games, even at high level, that it's very easy to miss backward moves. That's what they say. And uh, I heard the most commonly missed move is queen going backwards, diagonally. These are the moves we, you tend to miss. Here it is bishop going backwards. Mm. So, yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. This is the only, the only explanation why Rook D1 was played. And Bishop G2, White can't be worse in that position. I mean, Black's king uh, is not looking great after that. If instead of blundering this piece, had he just made the move Bishop to G2, uh, I think everything is under control. It's still everything to play for. King G2, that knight on A5 will take some time. Rook T1 coming next. But what a big miss by Jordan. And with that, he resigned. F4 on the board was played. But of course, the position is completely busted. Gangs, what a start for with it. Absolutely. And this is going to reflect in Jordan's uh, in chess uh, accuracy. Mm. All right, we right. Let's move on. Uh, let's get an update on the Levon game. I see major developments there. Did Levon, the artist as you call him, gangs, did he find the idea of sacrificing the rook, the exchange? I mean, I am 100% sure he found it. But the thing is, whether he played it or not, uh, <laughs> or he rejected it uh, on some uh, different ground. That's the only question we uh, we need to know. I'm actually super surprised, Tanya, that uh, he didn't take it, actually. He started with the move d4. It's a bit baffling to understand why would he leave these two pawns, you know, when he could... Uh, he could actually, yeah, he could have simply eliminated this. I'm, I'm right now still trying to digest what, what could be the possible reason why Levon didn't opt for this. Maybe, 
was it this he was bothered about no it feels wrong no i'm surprised i, I don't know at this moment uh, i don't have an explanation hmm four was played because now once again i did not uh, get rid of these two pawns and that is scary that is very scary Let's take, let's take stock of some oh, what is going on with the material balance here gangs because we see that white has got two pieces for a rook but as you're mentioning one the knight and the bishop they're not really playing they're not really developed currently and this f5 e4 pawns they really block that bishop on c2 while black's bishop on f3 is a complete monster right now so levon has some big problems to deal with i see we've had some more moves uh, let's get up to date with the live position and see if things improved for lev F4, we get here. H4, the rook is unable to leave this uh, particular file because we cannot really allow uh, queen g6. Very and after H4, h6. And how are you going to keep your rook on this file? I, mean, I don't see a square for it. It is You can't take knight takes f3 because I think oh, white black can simply go oh, e takes f3 then. That's that's the only move, I believe. Knight f3 on the Knight board. Knight f3 on the board, and he takes g5. Let's just show that line which you had that after e f3, yes. rook e5, saves the rook and, and the queen, and yes, most importantly, the bishop on c2 stops queen g6. Yeah. So eight g5 on the board. It again, I mean, this game is so wild. It's uh super hard to evaluate. I mean, if you just look at the position, would you want to be white or black here? I would be terrified to be white here. So now again, things are uh, not clear. For example, I'm not understanding what is happening after bishop b3 check. How do you respond? Uh, I don't want to go king h7 because you allow knight g5 with a check. So king h8. And now here, and I'm giving this threat, another threat. Mm. Suddenly, I start liking uh, white position, actually. Because you yeah, might have to play something like queen g6. Queen g6, so that queen h4 is met by queen h7. Yes. Not uh, not super thrilled at this point. Mm. As, as black. I'm just still trying to find uh, what would be the best way here for white. Do I go to the end game? Like, do I play something like this? But this end game, I'm not... Uh, although these pawns are not exactly looking scary anymore because look this knight here uh, managed to shut down at least one rook on e8 and now if you play f3 i want to go bishop e3 if you play e3 then again there is bishop c2 check or even pull back the bishop to d1 control all the squares mm. i actually like white again Oh, that's a bit of a roller coaster of uh, evaluations changing on every move. It is. It is. Here, uh, uh, Bishop b3 on the board. Bishop b3 check. So, King h8. It doesn't make sense for Black to actually give up a rook with rook f7 because White can also grab the g5 pawn anyway. So, King h8 is what we're expecting from Liam. And then, as uh, you mentioned, uh, I'm actually curious uh, can about I King h7. I play King h7 because then I eliminate h takes g5 because I have a beautiful square. So now let's say, can I, can I move my queen to a better place? For example, can I, can I just take it, let's say, so that after check, it's not a mate and uh, this square is taken. So you have to play knight e5, then I take and I take on c3. Mm. But it feels artificial. Because I'm allowing uh, knight g5 with a tempo. But maybe this is what needs to be done because you allowing h takes g5 just looked very bad. And that's really crazy that you go king h7 and then king h8 because the h file isn't open. That's a very, uh, that's that's a beautiful way to play in this position. Yeah. And at this point, really, it's very difficult to explain things logically because some positions are so wide. You have to just uh, kind of calculate and... Uh, yeah, and, and figure out things. You cannot just play on feelings. And to play such kind of positions uh, with this time control is crazy. I mean, you have two minutes on the clock and you have to decide whether you want to go king h7 allowing the check 
or play king h8. Allowing h takes g5, threatening mate in one. So tough decision for Liam. And I, it just comes back to this strategy that Levon has had throughout the tour where he's just playing fast and putting a lot of pressure on his opponent's clock. Sometimes it does backfire, but we've seen most cases, it really Indeed. comes to give a lot of reward to Lab. Yeah, and Levon playing fast is uh, saying like, you know, today morning I brushed my teeth. <laughs> Levon will always play fast. And uh, by the way, I just also want to say that Liam was also World Blitz champion. He's actually exceptionally strong Blitz player. So, um, it, uh, by the way, King H7 on the board, Tanya. Wow. That was an amazing idea, gangs. King H7, which was a move that instinctively you don't want to make because it allows knight G5 check. But as you mentioned, in these kind of positions, you can't rely on instincts. You need to calculate the line. Mm -hmm. All right. So we will come back to this and see uh, why... It, just really quickly, can we take a look at what happens after HG5? HG5, E takes F3... Uh, by the way, HG5 on the board, just as we are speaking. So if How Black can... actually, he doesn't take the knight. He goes queen f5. Yeah, yeah, he goes queen f5. Because he has Let's just point queen. that out. Let's just point that out that after E takes f3, queen h4 check. check actually ends up losing the queen. So yes. Black doesn't have time to pick up the piece, which is why he goes queen to f5. And now queen h4 check given. King has to come up, come up to g6. And bishop c2 on the board. What a pin. Look at these two pawns, which were monsters, sorry, uh, which were monsters, but nobody moves. The <laughs> pawn on f4 is nicely blocked with the knight on f3. And the pawn on e4, it will take an eternity to move because of this deadly pin. So this is some kind of a wow. blockade and, and a spectacular blockade, actually. It's such a unique position that we have on the board with Black's king on g6, the e4 pawn pinned. Uh, rook h8, as you're pointing out, is not something that works because of queen f4. Yeah. Rook h8 is queen takes f4. And I'm just thinking, all I need now is to make sure as white to vacate this square. So if I can move the queen, I'm actually seriously considering moves like queen h1 or queen E1. But then there's queen g4 check. At least it gives black a check on g4. That's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. We cannot. We cannot do it. So um, yeah. So so we cannot. We 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 are also stuck a bit with this. Uh, Liam with this down to a minute, gangs. Liam down to a minute in a very tricky position. Let's just try and find a move for black. Uh, what can Liam be thinking here? So rook h8, queen f4, queen h3 doesn't help because the e4 pawn is hanging he decides to go with rook e6 so what is the threat he cannot even take here because i'm attacking i think here. it's just a move i think it's just a panicked move because you're down to a minute on the clock I, nothing moves and I Lev love. very calmly going for c4 d5 bringing that knight into d4 50 yeah, seconds for liam king f7 trying to free up that now all he needs to do is move the queen away uh, and the queen doesn't really have too many squares, unfortunately, for black. Actually, nobody has to move even. Like, for example, let's say if I play d5, you play rook g6. Still, everything is fixed. Can you just take on f4? Actually, I'm thinking, is, this, is it the most uh, human way to finish the game? And then you but, take here. D5, say, as you're saying, played. Yeah, rook g6 will happen. And after rook g6, Levon will simply take on f4. That's That would be the most... Uh, human way to finish the game. Uh, the line that you were just showing, can we just quickly have it on our analysis board gang? So rook g6, queen f4, you trade the queens, and if black uh, tries to win a piece somehow, uh, let's say picks up the f3 knight, bishop g6, king g6, bishop c7, and it's too many pawns? Yeah, so this pawn will be blocked, and there is just, uh, you know, it's basically, I'm not even sure which pawn I'm going to queen, but one of these will, or a couple of these will get queened. Wow, this is a turnaround because we thought Lev was in big trouble after all that happened in the opening, not going for rook g5, allowing black to go knight f4. It looked like Liam was the one who was going to drive this game, but massive turnarounds here. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to see where Liam actually went wrong. We will have a look at that, but let's stick to this game because it's down to 30 <laughs> seconds. And queen, f4, by the queen f4 played. So this is the ending that we are expecting. 
yeah this levon will win talking about ending we have got a very interesting ending which uh, should be completely winning in magnus versus wesley let's go to that one so we can call this a lev win eventually after all the ups and downs absolutely there is just no doubt on this so let's go to the magnus board <clears throat> i want to point out here uh, the nice technique by by magnus that uh, you know take, taking the best possible square at this point surprisingly um the diagonal and also the file and the king remains weak so wesley decides his best chance as uh, in the rook pawn end game but here uh, there is just no match at some point uh, this rook will have to move whenever the king goes all the way towards the a5 we, we start picking up all these pawns so there is literally uh, no game at this point yeah king f4 i believe x6 will be played <laughs> now there must be 100 ways to win uh, g4 sometimes you can even just wait let him play here then go king e4 and then enter from this side hmm. very nice technique by magnus there putting his own rook behind the pawn making sure that black's rook on a6 is stuck forever the a pawn too far away so when black's king steps away to try and win that pawn he moves to he moves way too far from the king side pawns uh, and h takes g4 on the board what can pick up the pawn with the king or do you think f takes g4 is the right technique here um both both are winning I, both I are think, winning at this point it really matters uh, king g4 should also win uh, mm. essentially at some point right you will <clears throat> you run out of moves uh, imagine okay let's say let's say even i take fg4 okay let's say black doesn't allow white's king to enter and attack the f6 g6 pawn pawns can he just try and wait in these positions let's say king e6 yeah so king e6 <clears throat> i would start with uh, maybe here and gang can you just tell us what is the technique for white here what is the plan that helps white win in these positions i'm afraid there is just not one plan but there are <clears throat> multiple ways to do it for example after uh, king d6 <clears throat> like this even if we get to this position why black is kind of stuck with uh, these two squares <clears throat> so <clears throat> sorry no i can problem. i can just take like c4 hmm king c4 and there's no way to attack the pawn and if black actually moves back from the rook with the rook from a6 white can start pushing the, the pawn to a6 and there's just not any time for black to pick up the pawn he decides to keep the structure on the king side and goes king g4 Uh, Magnus knows that he's got a lot of time in this position. I think King G4 is the human approach in the position. You don't want to double up the pawns. And overall, I have to say that it's been a pretty smooth game by Magnus so far. Uh, just technically flawless. Yeah, at this point, um, it's it's so difficult to to come up with a defensive uh, fortress. At uh, I just don't see because. Uh, what do i do do i put my king on e5 the worst part you know like always black white can wait if he doesn't want to uh make any decision and when you play king d5 i come to f4 you cannot move this pawn because then it will give you an entry you cannot move the rook because the pawn will move further and slowly i'll put you in zook zone mm. oh this is just completely uh wow completely lost i mean I believe still the game will go on for some time. King e5 on the board. I'm expecting some pass move from Magnus. Just some to kind try of. and get that king, king f4, king on the other side rolling. So yeah. once uh, Black's king moves away, where he goes with f4, he goes yeah. with f4. Uh, does he want to also commit to f5, for example, after king d5 or king e6, or is he just going to go king d5? Does he want to play f5 here? Yeah, king d5 should uh, should be completely winning also. because once again i i play g4 at the right moment i will take on f6 i can i don't mind giving the pawn on a5 with my rook on f6 imagine if the rook is on f6 at this point at this very position with the pawn on g4 you take rook into e5 your king on on d5 is rank cut off and that's a technical winning position this king can never go back which means my pawn will queen mm, very interesting 
So, well, these two have been the best players on the tour so far. Uh, Wesley as well, a complete, completely on beast mode throughout the champions. Chester, Magnus as well on his uh, A game here and starts with a banging win against uh, Wesley in this one with the white pieces. A tough start for Wesley, something that he's not used to at all in the preliminaries. We've seen Wesley cruise through undefeated in most events of the champions. Chester in the round robin stage. This one is a different narrative. Uh, let's just say that, gangs, this is going to be a Magnus Carlsen endgame show. Uh, let's move on to another very interesting endgame that's caught my eye. Lanier against Duda. And I see that Black has an extra pawn, but White just feels like he should be active enough to hold this position. Or what's... Wait, no, um, wait, White has an extra piece. Yeah. White has an extra piece. How did this happen? <coughs> So let's see the position where, uh, wow, Bishop H reminds me of Spassky Fischer. Bishop H2 was such a bold move. But how did he end up losing a piece here? That's it. That's how. That's how, yeah. <laughs> so, aha, uh -huh, so Rook C3 giving, a, giving some sort of a threat of uh, Knight B6 and Rook C7, hence T5 was played. And then a very sharp tactics check. You cannot go here because there is this check. So you have to come to this diagonal. Mm -hmm. uh, bishop e7 happened. A very strong move, uh, bishop c5. Now, Dani, I also want to point out a very interesting tactic, if I am calculating correctly. The point here is if you play bishop d6, which feels the most logical, there is knight c8 check, right? Very nice, yeah. And then and bishop d6 play. and you win the rook. At the end, at the very end, I just pick up the knight. Knight, very nice. So bishop d6 was uh, not possible. And if you king. go king f6, there's, I think, knight d7, and you're forced to step onto the g file, once again, uh, losing the knight on g2. Correct. And uh, now rook to c2, piece is gone, e3 square is controlled. There's just, wait a second, why not bishop d6 here? Oh, that's what happened in the game, because now we cannot take... And we cannot take here because of the fork. But after bishop d6, bishop to d4, oh, giving wow. up the threat. This is a fantastic combination. Such a beautiful combination, uh, starting with uh, this knight b6 idea. And I wonder if uh, Duda actually missed this uh, final move, bishop d4, with a double threat of rook c8 and hitting that knight on g2. Most likely. Most likely, uh, that must be the case. And what, okay, this final position that we have, because white's pieces are a little far away from the queen side pawns. So let's just catch up with our live board right now. White does have an extra piece, made the move king b5, but white needs to keep the pawns alive. Is this completely busted for black or does Duda have some chances to bring up that resourcefulness on the aim chess, uh, chess skill set <laughs> counting? I, I want to point out one uh, spectacular fortress here, which is not possible in this particular position. But in general, uh, imagine a position where, uh, let's say, we get this pawn, we get our king to a8. This pawn is gone. And OK, our king on a8, and this is gone. Now, that position is a draw if black had a white color bishop. Even with a whole extra piece, with the king on a8 and bishop on c6, it's a dead drawn position. It's a, it's a theoretical fortress. It's a very unusual fortress, but that is how it is. But I don't know what is the evaluation with the uh, with an extra dark square bishop. My hunch is this should be losing. So, you, uh, Gangs, you mean even with three versus two, the pawns alive? You mean even if black has a6, b7, and white has b3, b2, if, white, if black has a light squared bishop in this position and the king on a8, that's a fortress. Yes, so I'm saying let's say black has king on a8, a bishop on c6, and you have uh, king, bishop, and knight. And even if you have, uh, it not, it's just not even double pawn. If I have a single b7 pawn, and you can pick any pawn, a pawn, b pawn, c pawn, it's still a fortress. It's a very well-known fortress. Very unusual, but uh, also very well-known. All right, look at Duda. He's gone for a5. So the aim is clear. He wants to try and trade off as many pawns as possible, making sure that White's pawn can't get to b4. At some point, he wants to try and get an a4 if possible. Lania not allowing any of that. Knight d4, 
check now is bishop d4 a move worth considering because after king a6 very hard to imagine black getting those trades in can we take a look at he goes for king a6 not trading the bishop for the knight and now knight f5 on the board i was actually curious Tani, at this point if something like uh, if something like this is a possibility but maybe maybe not because i i do have an outside pawn but no it feels it feels wrong Maybe yeah, just knight e6, knight d4 in that position, and then b4 if you go a4. Anyway, yeah. so king c4 played here, and so if black tries to go b5, a4 at any point, white wants to make the move b4. Uh, not necessarily. I wouldn't mind taking that. Why not to take that? And I mean, okay, let's say let's put this yeah. Like let's say you play a4. Even if I take and play king c4, I'll actually pick up this pawn. Mm. So b5 on the board, king d5 played, and now black, as you're pointing out, can't rush with this a4 trying to trade it off because you end up losing the pawn. Does black have, he goes king b6, so just keeping keeping the tension alive, threatening a4 or b4 at the right time. It's an interesting decision, yeah? He is uh, willing to allow this. This looks lost to me. Can I, let's, can I... let's try and make some moves here. Let's try and get that H pawn rolling. So hopefully one of the pieces, either the knight or the king, are sort of stuck trying to hold that. So H5, yeah. knight F5 on uh, is the move that you... By the way, he's gone for A4 directly. He decides... He, why didn't give bishop D4 check? He didn't then. go bishop D4. He kept the pieces on the board. Uh, uh, my, my hope in this position was, uh, you know, if I could change... My hope was I will keep on playing knight h4, knight f5, and I'll zoom zoom. I'll have this forever extra tempo, yeah, and slowly I'll pick up these pawns. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that did not happen in the game. In the game, we saw bishop f6, a4, b4, and bishop to e1. Both players down to 20 seconds on their clock. Duda plays bishop e1, hitting that pawn on b4. So oh. king c5 now to defend that pawn. And also black's king is really stuck. This looks completely busted now. Yeah, this is completely wrong. That is just uh, okay. But the H pawn is rolling, gangs. The H pawn is not rolling anymore. Yeah, it is not rolling anymore, and uh, we'll probably play. Yeah, king and of after C6. bishop e one, do you just go bishop, bishop e seven then? Bishop e seven, and you also have this. Once you play bishop e seven, there are two squares available to target this pawn. <laughs> Be, the only thing yeah. is that once you go knight d4 or knight d6, black might be able to get h4 and some counterplay with the h pawn. Yeah, but there are some mating patterns. Yeah, this is mate actually. H1 it would be a check, so it just depends on timing. Very interesting to see if that actually happens. Uh, Gans, can we just take a look at some? He goes bishop f2, so not allowing knight d4 and uh. White can make the move knight d6, but that might allow h4. So he decides to go bishop c5. And now do you just go knight e7, knight d5, knight c7? Yeah. Why not to mate? Why not yeah, to just mate? knight c7 is a square. But can we take a look at that? Because it's just all about timing. He goes knight d4. So let's say h4 here. I'll take, and you have to play the move. Bishop, bishop. g3 now. And now I want to play this. Oh, this will be so cool. <laughs> I want to do this. <laughs> we might see this. We might see this. I think if this happens on the board, this is very study like. This is the position of the day. Four seconds for Duda. H4 played and knight b5. I'm telling you, we bishop might be bishop b6. No, knight at b. Oh, he goes knight at b. But that's also made. That's also made. He wants to go b5, knight c4, checkmate. Also very nice. <laughs> And unstoppable, and that's it. Jan Khrushchev do that, resigns in this position. Uh, let's just show the mate on the board, gangs. If black plays the move h3, there's no fighting b5. Even this. I mean, it depends <laughs> what you want. Yeah. If you want to give a pawn checkmate, you play knight c4. If you want to give a knight checkmate, then you start with b5. So both are doable. Both are possible, but uh, the result remains the same. And with that, uh, Lania starts with a win. Do we have any other live games remaining? We've actually wrapped up all our games. Let's take a look at the scores from round one. And there we have it. Lots of excitement. Speaking of decisive results, take a look at that. We've had five decisive games with three wins for white and two wins 
four wins for White actually and only with it scored uh, with the black pieces that game against Jordan. What a big blunder by Jordan. Missing that idea that Rook D7 is just not possible. The other players to score a big point at the start of the AIM chess. US Rapid, Lania Dominguez, Vladislav Artemiev. Magnus Carlsen beating Wesley So and Levon Aronin in a very up and down game. The other games ended in a draw. We've got game two coming up very, very soon. We'll be right back with all the action. Want to raise your chest to a new level? Challenge Yourself is an exclusive, innovative experience designed for Chess 24 Premium members. Train like a champ with a unique set of lessons prepared by the coaches of the challengers. Boris Girlfriend and Co. will help you improve your chess. Play a champ. Play a grandmaster each day in Banter Blitz. Take advantage of this incredible opportunity from June 10th. Go premium and challenge yourself. Air quality isn't the first thing that comes to mind when you think about chess and esports, but it affects our focus, decision making, health, sleep, and more. What's in the air you breathe? Find out with Air Things. Breathe better, live better. I'm ahead of the game. up my rocket but follow me i'm ahead of the game i'm ahead of the game i'm only ever slinging i'm working over time got the song and i'm the singer the melody the vibe i'm a prodigy logically i'm impossibly wanted then they'll remember my name they'll remember my name i'm ahead of the game i'm ahead of the game that when you play versus the opponent who has only one opening it's a uh, like rather i think it's rather you uh, really prepare some strong idea in the line where they play like you are preparing against something you know, what they played in their games and then you prepare some strong idea uh, or you choose something different where it's like both of you are not in this theory uh, just maybe some sideline or or whatever uh, where she doesn't have so many games. Yeah, you played this question, okay? Yeah, this one I remember. Okay. This one I think I have seen, but uh, I don't remember. Uh, yeah, just the analysis. I will be uh, more curious. The game you, I'm pretty sure you have seen the game. Yeah, I remember it. Okay, put it in chat. How do you know all the positions? Yeah, okay, completely <laughs> ruining the fun, yeah? <laughs> you guys know this position? Yeah, Mamedi are ruining. Oh, okay, what do I do with you? <laughs> so let's take someone with a random, with a random account, with a random name that just seems attractive. Play live online against the world's top chess players while they stream their thoughts live. As a Chess24 Premium member, seize the chance to have your moment of fame. Get a peek inside their lives with question and answer sessions, in-depth teaching, analysis and interviews. The Champions Chess Tour, with countless accompanying events, is happening now. 
Tune in on Chess24. Watch chess tournaments online? Don't just watch. Go to Chess24 and make it an interactive learning experience. You get live commentary in multiple languages, including different streams in English from beginner to expert. It's not just commentary, since there's also an interactive live board. Choose your game and try out your own moves. All moves by the players get near instant cloud analysis from the latest chess engine, which will also analyze any move made by a pre. Welcome back, everyone. We are about to lift off a round two of the AIM Chess US Rapid. Now, Surya, for me, one of the surprising things from round one was just how easy Magnus made it look against Wesley. We don't see that happen in the Medwaters Champion Chess Talk. Absolutely. And uh, did you even, we did not look at the opening. For example, even this move, Bishop F4, we don't get to see this um, often, right? I mean, we see Knight C3, Knight F3, G3, whatnot, but uh, not exactly Bishop F4. And I was actually checking this. I would be very curious to know how many games have been played in this particular position. It's just five moves. Five moves and we are in some sort of uh, fresh territory. I haven't seen this much, to be honest. And it's such a fresh position. And it just looked like from start to finish, Magnus got a good position out of the opening. He won that extra pawn. We remember when Wesley played the move B5. Uh, we can maybe just get there on our analysis board how we got to B5. Magnus sure. won that pawn and eventually just converted it without without much difficult, without actually any difficulty. Yeah, one thing I would also like to mention that uh, one of the critical thing is like, can black take here? But of course, uh, it, it does look very dangerous if you start uh, taking pawns at sooner or later, uh, white will develop, he will get his uh, knight to c4. Rook b1, and... bishop b5 ideas, who knows what's yeah, happening rook... to black's king. Exactly, exactly. So no wonder... Uh, Wesley didn't take that. Okay, CD4 is still possible, but he played knight C6. Mm. This position, I already, uh, I already actually like prefer white. This knight is going to make the journey to D6 as we saw in the game. So Tanya, you were mentioning the point where. Uh, uh, and we loved that... white's position right around here. We loved it that Magnus got his knight to D6, and it looked like Wesley was in trouble. And we saw the spawn sacrifice, and Magnus managed to convert it, but it's still. It's still just round one. There's so much action upcoming, uh, 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 gangs. And I think we're about to lift off game two. Should we take a look at the pairings that we've got for this matchup, for this yeah. coming round? And here it is. Jan, Jan Tristoff Duda, who had a tough start Stop. in round one, takes on Wesley So, also, uh, who had a difficult game. And with it up against Magnus, and I think that's going to be a big, big game for with it. He got very... I, I wouldn't. I don't know if you would you call that getting lucky. Where uh, uh, in the previous game against Jordan, Jordan just blundered that piece. Would you call that luck? Um, yeah, in a way it is, but uh, you know it's not like Vidit was losing or something. He mm. just has had a normal position and his opponent blundered. So it was unprovoked blunder. I mean, it was the most obvious move was Bishop G two. I'm pretty sure uh, Vidit was not expecting uh, yeah. this uh, that his opponent will miss Rook D seven, Bishop D seven. But yeah, a bit of luck there, but uh, he played a good game. And, and that's all he played a good game. Do. You, make your, you make your own luck on the chessboard with it taking on the world champion, Liam, up against Jordan. Liam had a very up and down game against uh, uh, against Levon Aronian. Levon did win that one. He plays against Ali Reza. Daniel against a wonder. Eric against Anish Giri. Maxime is taking on Artemiev while Lania up against Shark. And I see we've already got lift off on some of our boards. Uh, let's take a look at what is going on. I see a Caro. I see a Caro in the Maxime versus Artemiev board. And I see a Dutch. <laughs> I see a Dutch. How many times do we see Dutch? No, I'm not sure how many times we see Caro either, but let's start with this one. So with it, uh, uh, playing D4 and Magnus going for F5 against him, it's definitely not Magnus's opening of choice too many times. What do you think is the approach here with him taking on the Dutch? Uh, he has played Dutch a number of times, but mainly with E6. 
not the lelin god dutch hmm. this one is more speciality of hikaru he played this uh, so many times uh magnus was more uh, inclined towards uh, the stone wall kind of structure and playing dutch it actually shows uh, clearly that magnus is up for a fight he is not looking for any uh, solid option or something he just wants a dynamic position he just wants to get a position vidit That's usually fun. prefers to play all sorts of uh, b3 systems or you know get the bishop on uh, this diagonal so i'm expecting he will play b3 Very interesting. So Magnus starts with a bang, wins uh, against Wesley in a very convincing game, and says, "I'm ready to fight with the black pieces." Takes on the Dutch. We'll see how this one proceeds and develops. Uh, let's do a quick opening tour. Can we get a look at the game? Love on our own. And he's playing against Ali Reza. What is the opening here? What happened? Love on had quite an exciting start, winning that first game after a difficult opening against Liam. and this one not such an exciting opening uh, prop, gangs prop, yeah. <laughs> yeah levon if we check his database it, we will see most of his i mean throughout his career he mainly played uh, knight c6 he was he was playing marshal opening also some berlin but not much of petrov for sure so we get this uh, modern uh, modern main line of uh, petrov with knight c3 and all this has been played there are n number of games in this position uh, this everything is uh, is played in this position so we are in the very very main theory hmm. as of now <laughs> all right so this one is a theoretical discussion uh, let's move on with our opening tour uh, what is going on on the maxim vasher lagrav versus artemiev game now maxim started with a draw against shakriar mamedarov and he's taking on artemiev who won game 1 Yeah, we got a caro can advance. Um, a standard line. I remember there was some uh, Nisipiano game. Uh, he was playing this as black. Uh, I don't have any uh, recollection with uh, Bishop G four, and this is where I'm missing Peter Leko once again. Uh, the human encyclopedia would have. Uh, Uh, given us the exact history of this uh, this particular line so bishop g4 i don't really uh, recall uh, uh, what is the theory with bishop uh, g4 and g6 but uh, just by looking at this position if i have to pick a color um, i would pick white uh, i think white black, black has to take here no Or, we cannot allow c takes d5 i'm pretty sure we will see d takes c4 on the board now the only question is i don't want to take here because i don't want to shatter my pawn structure so either i'll play h3 or i'll think about something like queen 2 a4 i believe objectively it is close to equal but i would prefer to be uh, white here All right. Well, still, still in uh, opening theory, and as we see, our team here going into a little bit of a think after C four, so a little unsure there how to react against uh, this move. We'll see what he finally decides. Uh, let's continue with our tour. Let's take a look at how Lania against Shark progressed, and do we have a Berlin here? Yeah, we have a Berlin very main line of the, uh, the opening. all this has been played number of times bishop e7 g4 um is a move that we don't see uh i mean it has been played but it is considered with the bishop on e7 at this point uh, knight h4 should give black a comfortable uh position and that's what happened in the game uh we saw knight h4 takes takes king g2 um using the fact that if you take on g4 there is this move rook d4 and suddenly the bishop on h4 is lost hmm. you can go h5 but it doesn't really help because white just continues to put pressure with the move like h3 or f3 is that the point yeah basically uh you play this or this and then uh, you're losing the bishop i'm not a big fan of this move f6 and i'm trying to understand why um uh, Why f six was played almost instantly? Yeah. 
because if I take, how is he going to take? Uh, he took with the bishop f3. No, this position is definitely not uh, great for black. And can you explain that a little bit? Uh, can you explain why you think that black, despite having two bishops, is not doing well here? Okay, first of all, let's get to the very Berlin basic. You remove all the pieces from this position and black is dead lost. So, mm. so let's understand that uh, very, very clearly yeah? because uh, black has a double pawn. So he will never be able to create passed pawn on the queen side while we create a passed pawn on the king side to deflect the king on the king side and then our king run to queen side. Does it make sense? Yeah, that's actually a really interesting way to look at this position, that you just understand how bad the pawn structure is. But speaking of bad pawn structures, a few trades have just happened, gangs, and are we still maintaining our, uh, our vantage point that white is better here? Yeah, I would still say white is better here. And uh, because it's, it's much more easier for white to push his pawns. So I would still, still prefer to be uh, white here. And also, I'm just wondering if I make a move like bishop f4, how do you actually protect this pawn? Do you play rook c8 or, or do you want to play rook d8 maybe? Kind of saying that, yeah, if I take, you want to take here and then take on a2. That's quite interesting. By the way, bishop f4 on the board and rook c8, Mamadeira plays instantly. And maybe in that line at the end, why black has to think about moves like rook a1, picking up that pawn on a7 as well. So instead he decides... You're absolutely yeah. right. You're absolutely right. That that must be the reason. That is... Not to mention rook d8. Not to mention rook d8. Yes. <laughs> that yeah. might be a bigger reason. <laughs> yes. I would I would rather take the rook instead of taking the pawn. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. So rook... no, I only spotted it once the position appeared in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, Shark decides uh, to play pragmatically and goes rook c8, not giving up that pawn on c7. Why does he has to sort of find a way to take out his both his rooks? Bishop e5, that's a nice move. Placing the Tell bishop... me, Tanya, why is castle not a good move here? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great move. Unfortunately, it's illegal. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So I, I want to push this pawn. So I would like to play king g3 and f4, f5 quickly. This would be my uh, reaction. Yeah, uh, king g3 on the And this is a really nice point because you've been talking about pawn structures and we see that white has got the majority on the king side. It's a three versus two. While on the queen side, these three pawns hold black's four pawns. So white really wants to start creating the pressure on the king side. Very often when we're trying to find moves or plans, we look which side of the board we've got a pawn majority and where we want to create our passer. And we try and, and find a way to push our pawns there. So rook d8, but this kind of invites white to win a pawn at the cost of allowing black counterplay gangs. Rook takes D8, rook takes d8 bishop c7 rook d2 i think that would be black's dream in this position yeah yeah this definitely we are not going to allow i'm considering moves like um i'm thinking should i should i play moves like rook d4 or just a move like a3 hmm. what do you think about a3 Let's take a look because the idea is that now your a1 rook is free and after rook d1, you can just capture on d1. So after a3, how would black react to this move? Does black have time to make a move like rook d5? I'm really hoping that you capture the rook and I can solve my problems of the pawn structure. True, true. I would like to play f4 and I believe you want to play something like rook d8, yeah? That's the dream. Again, I don't know if black has enough time. Something like take. You want to take Maybe here. rook d5. And maybe some, maybe create some, some sort of counter. This yeah. feels like there's counterplay for sure, no? True, true. Maybe rook d4 is better. All right, we'll have a look at what happens after rook d8. How Lenia tries to create play in this. Well, as of now, a Berlin, which let's see if it eventually heats up or not. Meanwhile, other games action is on. So let's jump to those gangs. Uh, where do you want to take, where do you want to go to? Should we take a look at Wesley versus Jan Shishtov Duda now? Duda playing with the white pieces. What is this opening? What is going on here? Uh, can you break uh, this down for us? Yeah, this is four knights. We should be five knight d4. There are, uh, there are essentially five moves that I have seen so far. And castle 
was played c6 bishop c4 now there is also this move bishop c5 which is very interesting actually even at this point it's possible uh we got d6 h3 b5 bishop d3 mm. i'm i'm pretty sure if you look at database there will be games but uh not not that many and uh, guess what uh, what was played here at this point this this is actually pretty instructive queen f3 on the board and and a very very interesting move i mean the moves that come to mind are trying to develop somehow just normal moves like bishop e6 but i'm guessing if you're asking the question it has to be something more exciting than that Does, did he go yeah. h5 no he didn't go h5 because the pawn fell on h7 g5. g5 saying that you know i want to play rook g8 and g4 wow That's i mean a nice move. this reminds me of uh, many games but uh, yeah typically the first game that comes in mind is uh, levon versus kramnik from berlin uh, from this berlin end game in candidates and we got a position like uh, like this it feels so wrong for who though i mean for for white at this point it yeah, does, i mean right that's what i was thinking i was thinking once you open up this g file you've developed your pieces uh, it just feels like black's the one coming in with all the play i'm a bit surprised why not actually knight to g4 i would rather have my knight to g4 And if and you play something like queen g3, do you want to go h5? Yeah, I was thinking h5 or even rook g8. Mm. And rook but g8, you don't care about the pin. Well, he decided to go for bishop g4 instead. Let's see how it proceeded. Knight g4, yeah. bishop g4, both interesting options. Hits the knight on c3, and white decided to take on g4 and attack black's knight instead. This take is very here. move by move. Queen h3. I'm not completely sure because. now after all this exchange suddenly i feel this king is safer than its counterpart mm. so right now i actually okay after all this black won the pawn but look at his king and d4 on the board i'm actually not sure who is better anymore i would rather be white here now queen d7 that's a nice move trying to trade off queens as you mentioned the king feeling unsafe so you want to get rid of the queens a uh, white declining that trade because well duda you we know his style of play queen f3 f5 defending that knight and i really like this move a3 just opening a up the game making sure making sure the rook is uh, yeah getting a getting a target gets into the open file mm. and b3 um, yeah 100% sure it will be uh, I actually I'm not because rook takes a3 there's also another option queen a3 But a3 is just such a cool way to bring your rook into the game Yeah basically the c1 bishop it's very nicely developed it might sound odd but you know it doesn't have to go anywhere it is controlling an open uh, diagonal so it doesn't have to go anywhere at all mm. But the bishop on c1 was actually hindering the rook to come into the game and a3 solves that nicely and that's what matters wow and he didn't even capture wow. back okay. take a look at what he does he just sacrifices the a3 pawn brings the rook to d1 while black has to watch out for the pin on the d file so actually d takes e5 is also a threat on the board if you take on b2 after bishop b2 suddenly all of white species are spitting fire down the board black's king as you mentioned still very unsafe always has to watch out for queen h5 check uh, a3 rook d1 this is This is Duda at his at his best. Yeah, Bishop G seven will be played. I'm. Uh, I, I think. I mean, it's very hard to imagine what else can be done here. But a move like Bishop G seven, let's say, take castles. Oh, I cannot castle. <laughs> oh no, I can castle. I have to put the king on H eight. You taught me this, right? <laughs> That's right. You have to go all the way to the end of the board. <laughs> yeah. Um, how is this position actually? Feels, I do like feels... the black king on g8 compared to the black king on e8 for sure. So bishop g7. I want to ask you, gangs, is there any way for white to actually stop black from castling? Is there anything that's more dynamic than rook a3 in the position? Well, hard to imagine. One thing I would like to include either now or later is just to take on e5, he's just to make sure you know your yeah. He's gone for a move. Sorry. He's gone for a move. Bishop g7. Ah yeah, bishop g7. So I'm expecting either d into e5 or uh, or taking on a3. 
also i am wondering duda being duda would he start doing something even more creative no i think just rook a3 d into e5 why not to play like this let's say i take you take i i take here castle oh again here yeah, castle i'm just one pawn down but this pawn on f5 is so weak hmm. so but would you not say that because black does have this extra pawn and the king on g8 yes it's slightly unsafe but nothing that can't be taken care of that probably wesley wesley's doing fine as well once he's able to castle and sort of just get his king to relative safety true true i was wondering if i could play something like bishop f4 but first okay can you, you cannot can take you grab because on there's b2 there's queen b3 maybe i'll play queen g7 mm. yeah. also we do so, have a result gangs we we got our first result of um, uh, of round 2 with ali reza firuja joining against levan aronian and just let's quickly get the final position up on the board uh, and we do see that white has the opposition white's got his very active king on e5 but there's no breakthrough black will just maintain his king on e7 not allow white's king to d6 or to f6 keep moving that bishop around a little bit every time you threaten that i think black will go bishop e6 if as you're pointing out bishop h3 ideas black will keep that under control with a move like bishop e6 and make sure that you don't get that in and this is just a dead draw yeah this is this is completely dead yeah would you say that if white actually got that sacrifice in on f5 that white would have some real chances uh, winning chances in this position uh i'm i'm not even sure about that i'm i'm not sure even even if you if you get something like this is it winning or not but again black doesn't have to allow this it's so it's this... quite It's quite a good idea to not allow this because as we see all this of white spawns. Yeah, yeah, this looks this looks actually winning. Dangerous. I, dangerous at least I don't know. Yeah. All right. Well, this one ended oh. in a draw. Uh can we get a quick update on the Daniel Naroditsky versus a Wonder Liang position because that also looks like a very exciting middle game. Uh gangs just I think just a single pawn just one pawn has been traded in the entire game so far all minor pieces on the board black has launched the pawn storm on the king side uh, it's opposite side castling how are you evaluating this position i have absolutely no idea <laughs> but i don't like this bishop so that's the I like first black. thing and i like black I, i also like black because uh, i look at this d5 knight i look at this b2 bishop it feels like some day once i get protection here actually mm -hmm. Ah, you see, right now I am unable to do this trick because after this I am trapping the queen. But there is knight c six check. So if my king was on a eight, I would have already played f four at this point. Uh, yeah, it just feels like black is slightly ahead in this uh, opposite side castling play. Knight e five on the board, as you're mentioning, uh, and that day doesn't seem very far when you will be able to break through on the king side. Uh, I think but there are threats, Tanya. There are there are threats coming also. we have mm -hmm. to take care of this uh, b5 uh, move i don't i don't know how exactly to do it i mean i would really like to make this work if i could i mean this would be my first line of thought without a doubt let's take a look so queen That's e4 on the board. Still bishop f5 so by the way he's gone for the, he's gone for it he trades on e5 and f4 on the board after queen takes e4 do you want to go bishop f5 And yeah, we're getting a best very best. big update, gangs. We will come back to this. We're getting a major update on the Vidit against Magnus board. Dad is informing us that Magnus Carlsen is in big trouble. Ah, is it because knight b five and bishop to d two? Is the queen in trouble, or is is it just getting trapped? Knight g four played, so at least knight b five. There's knight e three, but what happens if white actually falls back? Bishop d two. Oh, Vidit really enjoys this kind of positions. Mm. I mean, at some point, e5 will happen. Vidit is also ahead in time. Uh, oh, this position looks fantastic for Vidit. Look, this bishop is basically dead. Yeah, h3, knight f6, and oh, knight e5 on the board. Ninety five plays. I mean, with its with its move is rookie one here. I mean, he's uh, he usually really likes this kind of slow moves. You know, preparing e five, not doing anything uh, immediately. I would expect uh, rookie this one. This is a Dutch happen. gone very wrong, no, for black. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very true. 
so white has basically got a massive space advantage in this position no pieces are traded off so far so he's enjoying that black has got no breaks what is white's idea does white want to go in with rookie one because e4 is something that you need to time really well if you want it at all white's position looks very pretty but how is with it what is with its active plan here uh, the first thing is uh, not to think about winning i think that's very important because if you try to win this game from here you will end up looking all force variation and he will not find a win so uh, with it should remain true to his style which is uh, you know being calm improve mm. your position step by step and just don't bother about uh, how you are going to win the game just with every move you sort of improve your position because time management will be very very important I was just looking and, at that. Uh, I was just looking at that, and with it, has that under control so far? He's up about two minutes on the clock. Let's quickly bring up our aim chess stats for our for our two players, with it and Magnus, and see where it is that their strengths lie. As you've been mentioning, with it, very good in these kind of positions. Take a look at that. 100% accuracy in the opening, advantage capitalization to 52%, very resourceful play by him as well, time management at 36%. Let's bring up Magnus. I, I'm hoping that eventually we can get a head-to-head -head stats on this. And this is where, what Aim Chess has to say about Magnus's core chess skill set. Let's come back to the position. As you're mentioning, it's still a slow fight though. Even though white looks really good here, and it is the kind of position that Widith really enjoys enjoys playing, but Gang's still far from over for black. I mean, when you have like, you know, all 32 pieces and pawns on the board, uh, it is far nothing from is over. going to be over. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a complicated... Uh, I mean, I understand why it is uh, clearly better or maybe in computer's world completely winning also. Uh, but still, it's not uh, when you are playing over the board, you are looking for plans. You want to come up with some concrete plans. And what, what would that be? I don't know. Do I want to play E4? Because if, if I play E4, first of all, okay, I'm giving away this square. There is stake and bishop uh, takes H3. Sometimes even uh, computers tend to overestimate these positions because you need, you need some very concrete plan here. The other way to look at this position which I think is more pragmatic, is that uh, how black is going to play. Hmm. Uh, black does not have b5 break. He, can, he doesn't want to play e6 because then uh, the d5 square is weak. So this game would be, um, yeah, there will be a lot of maneuvering going on at this point. Magnus not looking happy at all. Can Black actually try and get that knight to b4? Will that be helpful at all? A plan like knight c7, knight a6, knight b4. I look at it, it looks really nice from the knight from e8 getting to b4, but then you're like, what is it even going to achieve once it gets to b4? He's going knight for knight c7, played. keeping knight e6 under control. And f4, Vidit goes for a very direct plan. So he wants to eliminate this knight, which is good, and then play e4 at some point. Maybe immediately. Is that an option? Can you just go knight up seven and say, all my pieces are beautifully placed. You don't have space in your position. Go for e4 directly. And he goes yeah, for it. With it, for it taking yeah. this on. Yeah, this looks, uh, this looks so dangerous for black. I mean, black can technically win a pawn right now, but uh, that would be as good as suiciding by taking on c3 and taking on e4. But yeah, this is not happening. I'm expecting... Some kind of um, direct play. Can I play e5 or e6? What happens actually? What happens if I play e5? You would have to take here. Let's don't believe uh, creating yeah. a d5 weakness as well. Yeah, we get a position like this, and white does not have a single weakness. And typical Vidit kind of move would be to, um, by the way, Magnus plays rook e8, preparing e5. Uh, basically saying that if you play rook e1, then he will play e5. There is no he way black to. is... Yeah, yeah, black cannot allow e5. There's just absolutely no way black can allow e5. Or you might want to take here. That's also actually an option. But then knight takes e4 and the knight jumping into g5, bishop c3. And I control this square and bishop and c3. I mean, looks... I understand it is bad. Yeah, it's really bad. But still, uh, 
White has to show some technique. White has to uh, come up with uh, some concrete ideas at some point. Well, rookie one on the board now. Big questions to Magnus. Will he take on e4? Because as you mentioned, the one thing that we can't allow White to play is to go e5. That is game over. So Black has to decide between pushing his own e pawn or trading and simplifying in the center. Magnus I having can... a think here. Yeah, I cannot imagine anything else. Okay, maybe Bishop d4 check is another option. How is Magnus looking? You know, he's not looking happy, and Vidal looks very composed. Vidal always looks composed. I think he's that's that's just his style. Even sometimes, actually, regardless of what the position is, and I've often seen this about him, he has so much control over his nerves, and he just it's just never a panic situation with him. Magnus definitely looking a little uneasy here. Absolutely so. Um, he he's probably thinking whether to play e5 or f and d4. I can't I can't imagine uh, anything else. Yeah. Also, I e5 mean, on the board. Dream scenario out of an opening against the world champion. No, you're up on the clock. You have a position in which you're the one who's fighting for everything. And now Magnus says it's time to decide. Uh, going all in here, making the move e5. And what are the options here? So I think what you're pointing out, creating that d5 weakness. Can we take a look at this line with d takes e6? Yeah. First of all, I'm slightly surprised why Vidit is taking more than two seconds to make this move. I mean, this itself is... Uh... You don't want to take on f5 because bishop f5 comes in with a tempo. You don't want to take on e5 because that gives a nice square for black's bishop to go to e5 as well. So, uh, gangs, you've got the live board. Let's quickly take a look at what happens if d takes e6 with it still having a think where he wants to trade. Yeah, so take, um, how do, how do I take that? If six, then there's knight d5. I would love to go knight d6, knight d4, but then white has got knight d5 coming in. But even this, yeah, I go queen d8. By the way, d takes e6 on the board. Yeah, now it'll be interesting to see a knight e6. Now, I was thinking that maybe knight e6 is actually the way because you want your knight on uh, d4. Mm -hmm. This is much better than, you know, after... Uh, Instead of keeping this knight on c3 and this knight keeping on c7 to forever protect the d5 square, you would rather like to have the knight on d4. e takes f5 on the board. And with it blitzed out, e takes f5. So it goes on to show what he, why he took a little bit of time. He was not just looking mm -hmm. at one move. He wanted to calculate a bit ahead. Absolutely. Now it's a big question, yeah? What do I want to put here? And also how black is going to take? Rook f5 or g f5? The first feeling, I don't know why, is to take gf5. Rook f5 allowing this pin on d5 looks a bit scary. Yeah, but I go here, queen d8. I don't G see anything F5. immediate. Bishop c3. And then do you, you go knight d4? Yeah, true. Well, g takes f5 on the board. Things are really heating up on this one. Hey, 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 hey. Am I winning an exchange? Am I actually winning an exchange or not? Well, there's already ah, no, you... d4, rook g3, rook g7 as well, no? Yeah, yeah. And knight d4. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not winning an exchange. So I'll start with bishop c3 in this case. And then knight d4. No, the thing is, the advantage is not exactly uh, because we are winning something immediately. The advantage is more strategic. Hmm. It's, it's a very uh, long-term advantage in general. To sum it up in like, one single thing, white has a break at some point if he wants to. Black does not have any break. And black has all these weaknesses. Why In white's position, there is only one weakness. And okay, even if the knight comes to d4, it's not uh, creating havoc. Yeah. All right, well, this one with it, very comfortable. He's the one with the advantage. We will, of course, come back to this game. But because you've got little time, uh, let's quickly get an update on the Jan Tristoff Duda versus Wesley game. Lots of developments there. Let's stick to the live board that we have with us. Gangs, what's your breakdown of the position here? Uh, let me get there. Hmm. I wouldn't be sure that's that's my breakdown <laughs> at this point but yeah i would probably pick black black has an sure extra I... pawn black has an extra pawn but not a great pawn structure but where is white's uh white's play as well i think i would i, I would agree with you that if you have to pick a side here you pick the side with an extra pawn 
here what is my counter ah no i was thinking can i play move like rook a5 actually that's quite interesting rook a5 can you go queen b3 uh you take on f5 or what i have i really have no clue i want queen to take on f5 that's but then queen d1 this. and then d3 yeah, there is also d3 by the way, king h2 hit. on the board king h2 on the board d3 hitting that rook i i i'm liking black more and more rook e7 do you want to play that is or very would scary you play? For, for white no hey it does look scary but D3 also this pawn is not going anywhere so if i play a rook e7 on the board makes sense because makes i think after rook, d, after rook d2 black had this bishop e5 which could be very annoying yeah rook e7 i'm trying to get queen b7 so if you go d2 do you just simply go rook d1 is that the idea or queen b uh, queen b7 maybe bishop f6 although there is also a tactic here i can i play bishop h6 actually oh wow that's a really interesting line but after bishop h6 let's just show the tactic first gangs i want to take here but yeah bishop h6 looks pretty strong no I Where like it. I the more this? I see it, the more dangerous it looks. Does White have? You don't have time to make a move like Queen B seven or Rook E five because Bishop F four is a check. Comes with a check exactly, and you don't want to play moves like even Queen A four because then you are losing the attacking Ooh. idea. So what do I do after Bishop H six? Actually, do I... do I play? No, Rook A four. I don't want to. Maybe I have to play Queen A Queen A four. Yeah, or should I put the Bishop somewhere else? But then black would be happy to go d2 no exactly no maybe bishop maybe queen a4 very nice move maybe queen a4 but uh, black can never be worse even after just trading and going queen b6 here yeah? yeah i i agree but i'm not sure if uh, if i'll win this uh, oh if black will win this position maybe rook e5 and you want to play d2 tania yeah d2 and hey, then... wait 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 are we missing rook e8 by the way we are oh, missing rook that's nice e8. yeah that's very yeah. nice actually yeah so queen a4 yeah rook e7 on the board and duda still having a thing so bishop h6 queen a4 and if black goes d2 here because you still can't take on h6 because of queen d6 right I still cannot take that. That's right. Yeah, I still cannot take. But I can play something like Rook D one just to. Uh, actually, actually, I'm threatening to take here because then if you take 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 on D two, I have the move Queen uh, G three. He decides to go Rook E eight. He decided not to play the move Bishop eight six. Uh, Wesley goes for Rook E eight, trying to trade off that active Rook in the position. But this feels like White should have something here. first question that can white actually just simply take on a7 or is that too much of wasting time rook a7 feels uh, uh feels wrong somehow intuitively mm. i mean this rook was doing so much on e7 it feels wrong to to take to trade it off i i would actually love to play rook a5 but uh, issue is what do i do after rook e7 uh, take on d5 and you take on d3 you take on Oh, that's. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what is this position actually. Wait, he decides But, to go rook to e one. By the way, uh, what was played in the game? Rook, rook uh, a to e one. Wow. Hmm. So he has to take now. Yeah, what else? I really done? like your idea of bishop eight six, and I'm just constantly looking at that. Even now, after rook e seven, rook e seven, bishop eight six is a possibility. Ah, oh, that's true. And this time, it could be even stronger actually. Because you don't have rook d one in any of the positions. Indeed. I mean, after queen a four, maybe black just goes d two directly. Yeah, hard to hard hard to say what. Uh... But maybe bishop. No, bishop e bishop e five. There will be d two. So how how uh, white is going to play after bishop h six? I don't know. 
Duda if uh, what Duda has in mind, but also Wesley needs to spot this idea of Bishop eight six. Uh, previously, actually, what is this, Tanya? Take on e seven. Also, what about just Queen d six and Queen eight six and Queen d six? King h three. Ah, yeah, yeah, of course, of course, no. True, true, true. I have to come back here, maybe. Then you take, take on e seven, no? But I don't know. This feels wrong. Like there's Queen e one, Queen h four coming in. Yeah, true, true. Rook e seven, Bishop h six looks very difficult for White to actually tackle in this position, and Wesley having a think. Duda holding his face. Bishop f6 was played. So Wesley constantly avoiding Bishop h6 and he will I never be such a tactic. I don't know if he spotted it. You, you had this idea of Bishop h6 in the previous position where he went rook e8. And I'm just wondering if he's, if he doesn't. Wait Not a second. Sure. Wait a second. Uh, do I actually have queen b7? Is this for real or not? Oh my God, that's very hard to believe. Let's say I put my king in a safe zone somewhere. I don't know where. Intuitively, I'll put it here. And now actually I'm threatening. Wow. I'm kind of threatening mate, no? You're threatening mate. And maybe you're right. Wesley doesn't miss this stuff. He just spotted a lot more than we did. So this is ridiculous if he spots this. Yeah, I mean, first you see bishop h6 and then you spot queen b7. This is, and this is uh, actually working. I mean, I would never spot queen b7 if uh, if I didn't know that Wesley actually thought and did not play bishop h6. Because knowing Wesley, I know there is no way he's going to miss bishop h6. I mean, we just cannot say, you know, once it's okay, but twice he's never going to miss this. Yeah. Bishop h6, queen b7. That's a brilliant idea. Can we just quickly have that on our analysis board? Uh, and then we'll quickly come back to the, to Which the live Sorry, board. This one, yeah? Queen b7, yeah. Bishop f4, king h3, the square where you don't have a check. And the point is the rook is hanging on a8 with a checkmate. Not just that, rook g7 mates on the spot. And Wesley probably uh, just saw this. I, I st Still, this position is complicated for me. I mean, I would not be able to give an evaluation. What complicated, but he decided not to go for this and queen eight, bishop f8, and probably you just go rook e8 here. I mean, I'm still not sure. Ah, there is maybe there is some rook d8 issue, but then it's a question, yeah. Why why did I keep my queen king on h1? Uh, sorry, h3. Maybe it was better on g1. But uh, yeah, we should probably catch up with the live board at this point. Mm -hmm. Wesley decided not to go for these complications. Bishop f6, rook falls back to e1, d2. The pawn has moved forward, attacking the rook. And finally, the rook stops it from d1. And now the move, bishop e5, trading the bishop. This was the other move that we were worried about for white. Yeah, this is uh, very thematic. Here, at least he knows, you know, uh, there is no, uh, no tactics calculation is needed. And for sure, black is better. Wait, is it a blunder, queen b5? Ah, no, there's queen a to check. Yeah, wow. Oh, wow. So queen b5 was a really nice idea. And black white doesn't have time to trade because bishop f4 comes in with a check. You don't have a great square for the queen, but the saving oh. move, which is enough, is queen a to check. Very nice. But even, this is even why we I... need to call you gangs and not Surya. <laughs> but even, even then, uh, king h8, and I don't know how I'm going to save this. Queen b5 on the board, by the way. So queen yeah, a2, actually, king h. Yeah, queen a2, king h8. How do you save this? Looks like lost. So if bishop e5, queen e5 check, and then the queen just comes in and that's game over because queen e2, rook g8, or just queen e1 would be immediately game over, actually. And king h3, there's also queen e2, rook g8, threatening mate. Right. It's on the board, and uh, if unless I'm missing something obvious, this looked dead loss to me. And uh, yeah, it's and that's it. Yeah, you're right. Wesley So is back winning the second game after a loss to Magnus in the first one. Uh, and we are being informed by that that in fact, Queen A4 was the final losing move by Duda. He had to go. Bishop takes E5. Let's just quickly show that line. 
Um, Sorry, uh, what what have we got? What was instead the instead of Queen A4, which was the last blunder by Jan Krzysztof Duda here? The way to survive for black for white was to trade on E5 and put the king calmly on H3 on the light Seriously, square where it yeah? doesn't have a check. The queen from A6 wow. defends, protects the E2 square, which is a key square in this position. Also, Queen C4 check idea. So a move like Queen E2 would be met by Queen C4, Queen D4. This is how white had to go. But instead, Queen A4 lost. And I'm not sure, Rook D8, maybe just I mean, Queen C4. Yeah, I, I will be petrified in this position. I mean, there is a pawn on D2, which is going to Queen. I have a king on it. I mean, look at my piece coordination. Maybe just Queen C4 check. And that is the point here that you've got this check on the board. And I mean, I, I, I am still perplexed how I'm uh, holding this. I don't know, Queen F7 ideas. What is going on here? Trying to create some play maybe. And probably, Rook probably, yeah. Who knows what's happening after Rook G8, but this yeah. was the way for White to go. We don't oh. have the engine analysis with us, uh, but Queen A4 was the losing move. Let's quickly jump back to the Magnus game where the action is still on. Vidit has picked up a pawn, but Black looks like he's got a lot of play. What is going on here? Okay, uh, this doesn't look like a big progress from the position which Vidit had. In fact... Uh, from a human perspective, I would say a lot has gone down because, okay, Magnus will take rook takes e1. And no, this doesn't look winning to me. It doesn't look winning to you anymore or it does? No, I mean, at first glance, it doesn't. And now it does because queen e7, you're pointing out, picking up the d6 pawn. Now I'm pointing out queen e1, but still it feels... Uh, so what happens if black stops this? What if the black king decides to come to the rescue, controlling all these e6, e7, e8 squares? Oh. Uh, let's just make a move. Why queen not to take? I mean, to understand. Yeah, first thing I need to understand is, okay, you give a check, I play this move. Ah, now I see the point. But queen g5 check, check and you pick up all the pawns with check. You pick up all the pawns with check and after queen e7 check, you start losing these pawns. Okay. So, so that means uh, I have to choose. With, oh, queen takes b3 on the board, by the way. Oh, wow. Not king f7. King f7 was the move that uh, I was considering in this position to stop queen e7. So, ah, I know what Magnus wants. Magnus will, will give the h pawn and stay on the h file and say, you know, you do whatever you want to do, but please stop the perpetual. Hmm. How do you stop the perpetual? How do you stop the perpetual? He's got a minute on, on the clock to figure that out. So king g8, queen g... After queen f6 check, you anyway go king g8. I stay only on these two squares. So which means at some point you will need your queen back. Or white will have to also at the right square with the queen, maybe queen e6 check, defending that pawn, also put the king on g2 and h3. Yeah, that, that's... That should be the way. But even, even here, Tanya, let's say I give a check. You go h3, and I also protect the pawn. This okay, is going so to be let's, a long Let's game. keep up with the live board. He decided to give a check with e8, get some time on the clock. I have no doubt that Vidit is not going to repeat with queen e8. He decides to go yeah, queen sure. g5. He's going to pick sure. up that h5 pawn with a check, and then it just comes down to how do you improve that position? Yeah, he will, he will keep giving some checks, which, is, which are very important. Give some random checks. You know, every time you gain, uh, what is it, 10 seconds, right? That's right. Yeah, so you keep gaining 10 seconds and then you decide where you want to put your king and queen. Do you want your king on h3, queen on e6? But at the very outset, give some aimless checks. Well, this has been a dream start for with it. No, winning again, winning the first game with the black pieces uh, and then uh, coming back, playing against Magnus. And this is a game for two results as well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm actually looking at with it the, the first thing that comes in mind is uh, uh, why is he wearing uh, kind of a warm cloth? <laughs> I mean, he, does, he doesn't look sick at all. He looks uh, very focused and everything. And it, I cannot imagine, uh, maybe, the, the, maybe the air conditioning, yeah, that has to be... Well, we can see yes, the yes. air things, uh, air quality monitor readings with us. It's about 26 degrees where with it is right now. So Wait, pretty warm in that? the room. How do you see that? Uh, we can see it right below our players. We've got the data by air things. What is their air quality mon uh, uh, 
air quality condition in the room that they're playing in. And we can see that with it's got 26 degrees, which is quite oh, warm wow. actually. So it could be all the tension. I feel it often happens, gangs, when you're playing chess, you tend to feel a little cold. It could be the nerves playing up. It could be uh, the general... It just feels like you want to stay a little more warm. So I think it's just with it, with the air conditioner on, just making oh, sure true. he doesn't... Absolutely. So King so here, Tanya, on the board. Queen E6 we, we were discussing this position, yeah? And King G2 is the idea that we wanted to look at here. Yeah, he would continue. I mean, I have absolutely no doubt. Even if Vidit had like two seconds, he would have continued this position. Uh, oh, he takes queen, takes f5. No, but this is just a draw for... It is it because you still can go with the king to d1 and you won't have queen d3 check. Yeah, but you are just giving the vital pawn, no? No, now every everything draws. Queen uh, queen f2 check, queen d4 check, queen d1. There will be like trillion checks uh, happening. Yeah. Is this just... Is this no, Magnus escape now? definitely. Queen no, has to is... check and with it thinking, but it might be too late as you're pointing out because queen d4 check coming in with king c3. And if you go king to c1, there's queen e1 check. But there are like 100 checks available here and uh, there is no way, you know, this pawn, right? This pawn will make sure the king never goes out and uh, both players knows that this position is just a draw. Yeah, I was a bit surprised he took here, you know, he could have given, uh, as you pointed out, he could have given some check and then maybe try to get the King to a safer zone. Yeah, this is an idea that Peter had many times in the position in our commentary that in all, often these queen pawn endgames, the king is safest on h3. And uh, we've seen that in so many different positions where it's very hard for black to give a check once the king is on h3. Yeah, absolutely. And this looks like it's about to finish right about now. And with it, you can look at him. He's leaned back. He kind of knows he's messed it up somewhere or at least not posed the most challenging questions to Magnus in this endgame. Yeah, he definitely messed this up. I mean, he had, uh, he had a fantastic chance in this game. In this game. Right, Shall we move to some other game? Yeah, and with that, we see a repetition on the board. Uh, this one's going to end. Can we take a look at the Lake Wang Liam against Jordan Van Furst? And this one has ended. It ended in a draw. Now, I see that Liam has an extra piece, but just one H pawn remains. This is a fascinating endgame, gangs. What is going on here? My usual comment first. I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> uh, um, so, one thing that comes in mind, the first thing that comes in mind, this knight is beautifully placed, restricting the king to come here. If you look at this position, this knight, it covers not only these two squares, but also this particular square. Because you cannot come here because of knight d3 check. Which means the knight restricts the king forever, literally, to get to the queen side. So that's why king b6 happened. And now king c3, ah, they're just repeating at this point. What can and I it's say? actually a draw. It's a three-fold repetition. So it seems like White didn't have a way to break through then. Uh, yeah, my only concern will be something like King B2. But then maybe he was worried about King C7. And King D6 coming in. And time. then King D6. And then King is, uh, mm, King is coming. So things can get tricky for the knight actually in these positions then. Indeed. All right, we still have one game on, so let's go to the live action. Maxime Vachel Legrave trying to squeeze out the win against Artemiev. Uh, can he do it in this position? Or has wait, he already wait, done wait. it? No, it's Artemiev who is winning, right? Artemiev with the black pieces. Sorry, that's my fault. Yeah. But this looks dead lost to me. Absolutely, there's just nothing going on in this position. I, I, I have no idea what computer evaluation would be, but... Uh... It doesn't matter at this point, really. So King D3 defends the E4 pawn. Uh, what is Black's idea next? Does he just want to go Rook C2 and King E2 once you rook... move that Rook from A4 away? I mean, I play Rook C2. You'll have to play probably King G1, then Rook C1, back Rook, rook maybe F1, F1 or Rook E1, Rook E2. There are like... Actually, also there is this other idea. It doesn't work with the King on... Uh... Or maybe even, even there it works. Yeah. Wow, Artemiev is just insanely strong in these formats. He's down to 20 seconds, but we've seen so, him do this so many times, convert these positions playing on seconds. 
ah, he plays king d2. Yeah, I was expecting. Uh, basically, he needs the rook on d5. Once the rook comes to d5, everything is winning. So after rook a4, wow, he goes e3. Did he have to rush with this move e3? Because now if you trade on e3, f2 is still not winning because there's king to g2. Also, there's rook a2 check. So he goes king e3. This is actually a very interesting position. I mean, without the pawns. Um... Okay, let's point out, gangs, that rook h4 is impossible because black just goes f2 and that's lost. You can even start with a check because this will be a very nice mate. <laughs> that will be very pleasing. And if not, then you go F2 after giving a check. But there are stalemate ideas. You know, I'm thinking maybe something like this. And under, under normal circumstances, a position like this, the so-called Lucena position, mm -hmm. is possible. But here... But you could go Rook F2 in that position. No, you can't go Rook F2. No. Yeah. Uh, rook E3 now. No, so Rook E3 is also not there. But how do you actually... How do you improve this position? Uh, you come to e2, yeah? You come to e2. Still winning. Also, king e3 on the board right now. And rook c2, f2 is a big idea. So, is there another move except rook a8 here? No, rook a1 would be the most traditional way. Wait a second. Okay. Actually, rook a1 is a draw. Because you play f2, I play king g2. But if you start with a check? How? Oh, you rook start with a check? Okay, I play king g1 or king h1. I don't know. Okay, let's just, just for the sake of it. Okay, I play king g1. Because this is a very standard draw, yeah? Rook a1 on the board. MVL escaped. Board. Are you, so you're saying that this is a draw now? Yes. Okay, rook c to check. King g1, rook g2 check. G1. Um, somewhere here. And you know, now all your ideas after king f4, rook a4, king g3, rook g4, king h3, rook h4. Or rook takes g2. Rook takes, also rook takes g2. Rook h4 and also this, yeah? Like, really make it study like. <laughs> That's amazing. So he goes rook d3. Rook d3 on the board. Uh, he wants to get here, but it is actually not a threat because uh, let's say I play the move uh, King G1. So if you play this, I have this. And you can and trade you cannot... after Rook D2. You just trade and go King F2. Exactly. Ah, no, but here you have... Uh... Sorry. Uh, yeah, you don't, have, you don't have time. Yeah, like there is no time to get King into Rook G3. Yeah, no, this looks like a draw to me. Oh, that's quite an escape by Maxime. So what by the way, King G1 moment... might be the only move at this point. Gangs, we've got our analysis board with us. Can you quickly show us that turning point? Because we thought our Temiyev is just crushing this with black. No, no, he was... E3. He was... E3 was the moment, right? Yeah, yeah, E3 was the moment. Actually, after... Even here, I'm very skeptical with uh, what he did because maybe this pawn could have been used as an umbrella or I'm missing something. Like, uh, how could I have played? I have. I'm. I'm thinking if I could use this pawn as an as a shield, but maybe I'm I just cannot. Yeah? At the players, they are both just. It's hard. Artemia finally moved, but both players are absolutely focused and not moving, barely breathing in this position that we have. And no, I yeah, found the on, win. Gangs, go on. I found the win actually. Like e3, f3, rook c1 would be actually winning. No, wait a, wait a second. There is the still rook, rook a2 check. check. There is still rook a2 check. And now I can take. And then you have to give a check because you can't allow f2. f2 would be lost. No, no, no. This is draw. This is draw. There is, you can just, uh, you can still meet me. So rook oh, to check. Nice and yeah, can we just quickly show that one more time what you just had? And then a rook e3 and then king f2, oh, yeah. f3. Yeah. Very nice. Okay, let's come oh, up. I, 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 I got I got a message, I got an information that king d3 is winning. 
I good luck have finding never, that. Good luck finding I, I'm, that with 20 seconds on the clock. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you, there's just no way you find something like this. But what is more uh, weird is uh, you don't want to play E3 so quickly. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I would expect uh, at this point uh, to play play rook c2 and try to get the try to get the rook to d file somehow like something like rook d2 that's how i would have uh, continued and then trying to get the king to e2 but although probably this was bothering him so yeah it may be I, i'm 100 percent sure this was winning but it's uh, it was not at least uh, uh, absolutely trivial King e2 and has something no, changed maybe. in the position now because king e2 on the board and f2 is a threat now. Gangs, can we come back to our live board? Yeah, absolutely. So king g1. No, this is there is no where is it? Oh, wait, what happens after f2 here? No, this is lost. Isn't this just game over now? Can we and that's it? Artemi, I've just won. Gangs, can you just back up and show us what happened in that? Because we thought suddenly Maxime was in control. No, this was a draw. This was a draw. Okay, still this is a draw. Gave rook a3 check. King e2, rook a1, still a draw. Rook b2, rook c1, still a draw. Rook b3. I have to give a check, yes. I have a feeling here rook c1 would be the move. Can I get a confirmation if uh, rook c1 was the move? We do have a confirmation that rook c1 was indeed the way for white to hold this position. And the point is that you have to stop black from giving a check and driving the king away. Yeah. Basically, every time, yeah, like this is the drawing concept. Like every time f2, you want to... This is a classical drawing concept. I know this position without the pawns, of course. But uh, essentially, this is the theme. When you control this queen... And you are also locking down the rook because rook can never go anywhere because you have rook c to check. Mm. Now, in order to get this, the presence of these pawns makes it slightly complicated because every time black has an additional idea, thanks to this pawn, there is f2 check and rook to g3. I mean, if these two pawns was not there, I could still play something like rook a1, f2 check, I laugh and play king g2. But here that is not an option because of rook g3 check so i have to be slightly more precise i have to now give a check king e3 and again this is threatened so rook c1 would be again the only move right at this moment when you after f2 check king g2 there is no rook g3 hmm. and uh, yeah that's why uh, rook a2 is a blunder and uh, yeah and then we and now it's already we we over because you can't get that fortress, that structure that you're talking about with the king yeah. controlling it from g1 and the rook because now there's f2 check and black gets in that rook g3 check, which had exactly. to be stopped. Exactly. Incredible stuff. And let's not forget that Maxime Vachelagraf, this tournament is extremely important for him. Currently in the tour standings to make it to the finals, he has to ensure that he qualifies uh, to the quarterfinal stage, makes it to the knockout stages. Otherwise, Maxime Vachelagraf will be out of the race to make it to the finals of the Champions Chester. Round three is about to kick off. We will be back after this very short break. Air quality isn't the first thing that comes to mind when you think about chess and esports, but it affects our focus, decision making, health, sleep, and more. What's in the air you breathe? Find out with Air Things. Breathe better. Live better. That was an amazing round two with so much action. Let's quickly take a look at the results that we had at the end of 
round two. And this is how it went. Once again, we had four decisive games with three wins with the black pieces and white scoring three wins with the, no, that's four wins with the black pieces. Wesley saw a wonder Vladislav Artemiev and Shakri Mamadyarov all won their games. The other games end in a draw with it missing an opportunity against Magnus and a wonder scoring a nice win against uh, Daniel Naroditsky there. We've got game three, round three action coming up. Let's take a look at the matchups that we've got. Let's bring up the matchups. And these are the pairings. Shark takes on Duda, Vladislav Artemiev after a nice win against Maxime, where it felt like Maxime was just about surviving, takes on Dominguez. Anish against Maxime Bashir Legrave. A wonder plays against Eric Hansen. Levon will take on Daniel. Jordan Manfur is the winner of the Tata Steel Masters up against Ali Reza. Magnus against Liam and Wesley against With It. Uh, very, very exciting matchups. Gangs, which one, which one do you want to jump to first? Because I see we've got action. Um, let's speak, uh, let's speak uh, Shark versus Duda. Let's start with the Shark attack. With the white, I have to say that so far, we haven't seen the Shark attack. Not yet, no. <laughs> playing uh, as solid as possible but this one we might actually see hmm. all right let's take it from the top let's just see how this got here it looks like a queen's gambit decline yeah um one of the one of the classical line uh, is also this many games in this uh, in this direction duda plays bishop to e7 um, I, as far as I know, this is considered not uh, the ideal setup for a black. Of course, there are there are so many games, but usually the knight comes to e2, castle, white eventually tries for some sort of f3, e4. Uh, that is, in fact, the reason why uh, bishop f5 got more popularity. But of course, this is the classical, uh, one of the classical way of playing. White should be quite happy with this position. And shark goes for a interesting option. He plays. Uh, Plays h3. Well, h3 is always the kind of move that you need at some point in these openings. You want to take that square of g4 away from black's bishop. Uh, white still not committing whether he wants to go knight f3 or knight e2. We will see if we get a shock attack on this one or not. Meanwhile, let's continue with our opening tour for round three. And the other one that has caught my attention is what is going on in the A Wonder against Eric Hansen board. Now, A Wonder winning that previous round, I think that's it's been it's been a great start for Liang and uh He's made it here after finishing runners-up in the Kramnik Challenge. Uh, Gangs, did you have the opportunity to work with him? And what's been your experience with him uh, for the Challengers chess talk? Uh, I, I haven't uh, had the opportunity to work with uh, him. Um, but I did, I did see, I did follow his games and everything. Uh, but he was, uh, he was not uh, exactly trained uh, under me. Mm. So not... Uh, not not much of uh, ideas mm. but yeah I, I definitely saw his games he's very resourceful so and also a bit uncompromising so we are going to see some interesting uh, fight here in the game uh, that's true for all these all these young stars all these kids i think the one quality that they all possess is just being completely combative uncompromising as you say in their play that's what we saw in the previous round with a wonder as well uh, and yeah take it away from the opening gangs yeah, so queen c2, e4, uh, this is one of the very main line. And uh, there are a huge amount of theory, long lines with the d5, e5, knight, e4, uh, considered to be completely equal. By the way, at this point, I have to highly uh, mention that if you want to make sure you are okay with this queen c2, castle, e4 line, do get my chessable course. And there it is clearly given how exactly black should... Uh, make sure uh, everything is uh, under control in the game uh, d6 was played and uh, e5 a move um, this is uh, this is a particular position that uh, white should be quite happy about uh, getting this position uh, from the opening uh, i would i would 
consider bishop to d3 at this point, hitting here, keeping the option open where I want to run. Maybe, maybe I play bishop d2 and uh, even consider moves like g4 or, you know, just be normal, play bishop d3 castle and uh, get a stable position. Now, guys, you've done an entire course on the Nimzo Tarash and it's, uh, it is unchessable for anyone who wants to play this opening. In general, do you prefer this position, these positions that we have with the white pieces or do you think black is doing absolutely fine out of the opening in this one? It's a matter of choice. Uh, I would prefer to be white at this point. Uh, black's plan, I believe it should be something like this. You know, you get the rook to c8, do not put the knight on c6. So, so that you have the diagonal open, you have got the file open. Uh, that, that's how I would... Uh, I would try to play at this point. Also, maybe d5. So these are the two uh, two ideas that comes in mind. Hmm. Very interesting. Now, you were mentioning bishop d3, by the way, on the board here. Uh, you mentioned some plans for white here. He can go short castle or choose the very creative and attacking g4 ideas. Now, we'll see if a wonder comes up with that. But the board on which we do have g4 already is the one in which we were hoping to get the shark attack. Shark. Oh. And oh, this fine. one as well. No, no, let's let's stick with this. Let's stick with this before we move on because also a very interesting opening. We have G4 here as well. Levon taking on Daniel. Uh, mm -hmm. Take it from the top. Yeah, so Kings Indian once again, clearly Daniel is uh, showing uh, that he has uh, absolutely no uh, intention to play some solid lines. He would rather play stick to Kings Indian. A very modern theory with uh, Bishop E2 and Bishop E3. The typical idea is by delays, uh, knight uh, the development of the knight to f3 and if you play a standard move like e5 then you would like to play d5 and very quickly play h4 g4 h5 uh, i have played this number of times from uh, white side and uh, daniel plays a move knight c6 he says okay i don't want to play e5 or c5 uh, but i would rather go for knight c6 and we get a position like this this all has been played by the way uh, i don't remember uh, what game but very recently i saw exactly this position h6 hmm. uh trying to get uh, g4 so g5 at some point it might be a threat but right now um i believe after g5 uh, yeah there is probably something like this all sorts of uh, attack is coming oh this is super scary so, for white yeah, so King F1, why is he saying, okay, look, you know, I might not uh, uh, play G5 at the moment, but I'm kind of saying, you know, your uh, your knights are uh, stuck there. So I'll just uh, maintain this position and how, how do you continue? So naturally, black wants to open up the position, black wants to break. And here white goes knight F3. Again saying, okay, if you take CD5, I take CD5. Uh, show me how exactly you are going to break the position. But somehow it feels like things have gone not ideal for uh, for white. Like let's say CD5, CD5. The move that could bother me would be B5. I mean, these are the moves I'll calculate. B5 and Knight G4. These are my first choice, actually. But after the move knight f3, now that black doesn't have ideas like queen h4, is white already threatening to go g5 and pick up that knight? Or is it still not Is it still uh, not what white wants? Can we take a look at this line after this move with the b5? g5, g5, g5 yeah. So I'm just wondering uh, if I can have some slow compensation. Like first of all, okay, b4, let's say. That's not slow at all. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because I was only looking at coming to G3 with the knight and then B4, suddenly there's no good square. And the point is that if you go knight A4, then when you give knight G3 check, the bishop on E2 will be hanging as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, somewhere, I don't even know which knight I want to move, but some knight will come uh, come to Okay, fair G3. enough, gangs. If you play B5, not allowing B4, what happens if white grabs that pawn on B5? Yeah. So, but how do you do this? Do you do this with bishop? Probably, yeah. 
Bishop, because knight b5, knight d5 might not be pleasant. True. Uh, actually, that is not uh, what I had in mind. I mean, I now I do not like uh, the move b5 as such because I have to waste a tempo, yeah? In order to save uh, save my rook. Because if I play bishop d7, Oh, oh, by the way, God. the other move, what the other move that I was, the other move that I was mentioning, that some way you take on g4. This also I like actually. You put your knight on f5 and then you throw b5. Both. Well, he, he's done it without taking on d5 first. So let's just see if there are any differences. Let's get our live board up on our analysis. So he didn't take on d5. He sacrifices the knight for two pawns immediately with knight g4. Uh huh. Oh, that's interesting. How, how should white continue? Should white play king g2? No, probably not. Black wants to come <clears throat> knight f5. How do I deal with this? Should I stop so that I can take? Hmm. Actually, not a bad idea because I'm really kind of worried about not knight happy. F5 yeah, I'm really worried about knight f5. The thing is this bishop, right? How do I move this bishop? If I play rook to h4, then you take and it, uh, this rook is gone. But if I play rook g1, then there is bishop to h3. So probably to start with bishop d3. All right, well, Levon's having a think here. He's up on the clock. He's got about 14 minutes. He's had a good start in the event. He beat Aliam in the first game, too, with Ali Reza playing against Danny. Now, Daniel has not had the best start in the event. Uh, he is currently on half a point. After drawing with Anish in the first round, he lost to a wonder. But I like that he's still playing uh, exciting chess. He's not trying to play it safe. And I think that's just Daniel's style. Uh, he, he doesn't play safe chess. Absolutely. He is playing very, very uh, uncompromising. And that he showed it from the uh, very uh, first round, yeah, going for Kings Indian. So what do you think about Bishop D3? Would you, uh, would you play Knight F5? But Knight F5, my idea was to take. What is your thought on this? Let's try. Let's take a look because the position is kind of hard to say. There is definitely compensation. I, I want to check G takes F5 here uh, because I like the bishop on G4 pinning that knight on F3. Uh, what happens after G takes F5? Hmm. So now I'm hoping uh, I need to unpin my queen. How do I do that? So one idea. Right. Do you want to go king G2? Yeah, I don't want to go here because there is bishop D4. Uh, also or queen, queen b6, b6 so. check yeah. yeah so king g2 but then uh, yeah king g2 is maybe the move i'll play because i'm i'm counting that if you play king h8 i might have something like knight g5 not clear at all not clear at all and by the way he doesn't go for bishop d3 stopping knight f5 it goes for your other move that you're mentioning Knight g5 on the board. Well, knight f5 is still not possible because the bishop on g4 is hanging. So in some ways it does stop that. But what happens after bishop e2, knight f5? All right. So bishop e2 will be played, I believe. What else, what else can we do? Yeah. Bishop or e2, we... knight e2 looks like... I don't know if bishop Actually... c3... What's going on after bishop c3 here? Oh God, what am I going to do after bishop c3? Because... If you I take here, there is, uh, but just to understand, uh, is there some Levon trick? No, there is no some, there is no Levon trick here. I was wondering if uh, I could create something here. No, it feels unrealistic. I was wondering if this is an option, but probably not. No, my king is and too how crazy is How crazy is rook takes eight six in that position? Uh, you mean... Yeah, yeah, it I mean, yeah, I'm like two moves away. Yeah, it yeah, feels yeah. wrong. Also, you can simply just uh, eliminate. Mm. Uh, okay. So let's not do that. Uh, but knight h5, bishop c3. Maybe I have to take here. 
Yeah, but then Bishop D2 on you. Bishop D2 to... again, you are re renewing the threat. Yeah, like now you are threatening rookie, uh, rookie one. And Queen D2, there's Knight G4. But after Knight G4, do I have this move? Kind of hoping to get uh, Rook H8 at some. Not that scared. No, not that scared without this. There's no Queen H2 check. Not that scared with Queen C3 still not on the board. Once again, you're two moves away from getting your Rook into the game. So maybe just a move like. Okay, just need to find one good move. But what is that move? Can you start with Queen F6 or Queen B6? Okay, Queen B6 is nice. Actually, Queen B6, Knight E3, I don't even know how to respond. Because suddenly, I, I the move that I was counting on was uh, Queen C3. But here, Knight E3 check and I'm running into discover. You it's just not a single square. square. King. Bishop C3 on the board is Knight G5. Just a massive blunder by left. I don't know this queen b6 position. Uh, can I actually play king g2, Tanya? I'm trying to get my rook to h1 as quickly as possible. Okay, and if knight e3 check, you go where? Yeah, that's actually uh, the problem here, right? I cannot go to these two squares. I cannot go to this square. So that leaves basically, okay, you don't want to go to h5. If you okay. go to h1, then you are missing. Yeah, go on. Yeah. If, if I go to f5, then again, I have to watch out for some rookie three's ID, rookie three kind of moves. So maybe king h1, trying for queen h2. Yeah, actually, love has actually threatening rook h2. Something completely different in mind. Love has something completely different in mind. Take a look what he's done, gangs. He decides to not go for this not this is not what he wanted to play but immediately actually takes on c3 gives up the queen on e2 and this rook, and rook six position but we thought this is not enough for white well there were like 100 reasons reasons why this was not working for me for example okay let's say i play a move like uh, this i mean just some random move yeah you take i just take here Uh, maybe yeah, you mentioned this idea, no? Rook C2 or Rook E3 and just hit that bishop. Yeah, but now I'm seeing there are some forks, yeah? But it's you can start with queen to f6 here? Well, queen f6, there is rook takes f7, but even queen here, yeah, yeah, queen c3. No, this looks dead to me. Look, and look at Lev. Look at Lev. He usually is just leaning back, looking very chill on his chair. But now, it, Lev's got no chill right now. Oh, this looks... Uh... He's shaking his head. He knows that there's been a big, big uh, bungle up. Rook yeah, C2, like just... you said, just getting rid of the bishop, the dark squared bishop. Rook H7 was the massive... I have a funny board. move that I would like to show, but uh, no, it just doesn't work. Uh, never mind. But show the idea. What did you have in mind? No, no, no. no. I was wondering if I could play bishop H8, but it just doesn't... I'm not threatening anything. Also, there's a black has queen b6, queen f2 ideas that you need to watch. Everything, out for ev everything yeah, wins. Everything. Rook h7 on the board. I'm pretty sure rook c3, b c3, wow. we will see. And. Um, well, Daniel, no. all he has to do is convert this. He's completely winning against Lev. Yeah, he, he is. He's not going to miss this one. All right. There so are so many. We, yeah. Do you want to move, move to on some on other board? One? Yeah, yeah, let's move to some other board. Wait a second. Whoa. Do I see a blunder here in a wonder game or no? Everything Did is under control. A wonder make a blunder. Yeah, let's wonder that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just thinking after bishop, only after bishop to e3. Suddenly you cannot take this, yeah, because of d4. Oh, nice. And after nice. bishop e5, knight c5, it feels unreal to me that uh, it was planned. It, it looks more like a blunder to me. Knight c5 on the board. And where do you fall? Well, queen b7, do you have a way to defend that rook on a8? Queen b7, is that a threat? Yeah, it is. Uh, let's say I play a move like bishop d6. Okay. And then you want to take seven. here, yeah? Then you want to... You probably want to take on... Uh, Take on e6 and then take on uh, b7. Also, ah, it's maybe it's not easy, yeah. And definitely, I don't want b6 knight b7. Yeah, that would be really pity, no, Tanya? 
It's very beautiful though. But yeah, it would be uh, a pity, of course, for Black to fall into this. Get your queen trapped after winning a piece on yeah. the very next move. Exactly. So maybe it is all under control. So, so knight c5 played and hard to come up. So, and bishop. So the point is that if you go bishop f6, let's just show that the let's just show the dynamics in the position. If you fall back with the bishop, the idea is to take on e6. Queen b7 is what we are looking at. White black doesn't have a great square with a the queen knight. c7. Wait, there is queen, queen c7, c7 Tanya. And after queen a8, you want to go knight c6 trapping white's queen. But then bishop That's it. no, there is no bishop h7 because the rook on f8 is defended. True, true, very true. So it is after all losing. But that might mean that bishop uh, d6 is the only square for the bishop. Yes, but and it's not very hard to see. Knight b7? Yeah, I was thinking about this, but there is queen c7. And once, once more, if you attack, okay, there is also queen e7. Yeah. Yeah, this will be... Uh, okay, all, now, now I see also this is not forced. I could, I could also play queen 2 b6 with similar idea and after queen a8 knight c6 well it looks like a wonder is in a oh, bit of a trouble here knight d7 yeah. winning uh, the queen all right uh, so we will come back to this and see if eric manages to convert it but can we get uh, a quick update on the shark versus jan trishtof duda what? game because that's i will really but exploded. i will tanya but tell me is this a blunder because to me f6 is a clear blunder there's rook h8 check oh my god and there's no king g7 because of knight e6. There's king h8. And then you've got... So king g7, knight there's rook d8, knight e6. That's game over. And king h8, there's knight f7. Ah, yeah. And I take and I go... Oh, no, it's not a blunder, but at least I'm in the game. I'm very happy to get this position. And if rook h8 here? Ah, there is rook h8. No, you are right. You are right. No, it was not, it was not working. But Look what Lev did. Over. Look what Lev did. Oh my god, okay, I'm not understanding anything. F6, rook, h6. Uh, gangs, can you please explain this move? I will once I understand what it is, and I okay, so think rook, I do. Rook I g6 do is a massive threat. Rook g6 is a massive threat. Oh, the... Ah, this is the trick. Oh my goodness. Tricky oh. Levon. Rook h6 is such a such a genius move by Levon. And f6, that just felt wrong. No, you want to take that bishop on c3. You need to get rid of that. Yeah, you, ca you cannot run anymore. And what is you this? You cannot run anymore. Yeah, this will be a repetition. Rook h6, oh my goodness. No, but also at this point, yeah, I think uh, yeah, Daniel it's is a very good. Very strong player also in Blitz Bullet. He's exceptionally strong. But the sense of danger somehow tells that, yeah, you first take and then you do whatever you want to do. But yeah, one cannot blame for uh, not missing... Uh, so Sorry, missing Rook H6. Yeah, I got a confirmation that Rook H6 is actually the only move. Every other move was winning. So oh. it's pretty natural that, you know, he spent all his time calculating Rook G7 and Rook H8. And Levon forever resourceful and it's uh, very fishy. And now if you look at Levon, he's not, uh, he looks very confident, right? Just unbelievable. Unbelievable. And now it's Daniel who's holding his head in his hands. Uh, what a big turnaround there. And as you mentioned, let's just back up to this moment where F6 was played, gangs. Because after F6, the moves that you're looking at are Rook H8 check, Rook G7, forking and winning the queen. But those end games are absolutely fine for Daniel as we saw. Your yeah, king comes out, your rook comes rook into, H8, into play, yeah. and black is doing fine. But rook h6, this is the artist's escape in this position. Rook h6 is not a move that you es expect here. The point yeah, is that rook c3 now, then there's yeah, the g6 rook, check. Rook g6 check, and also it's uh, very interesting. Yeah? Like, uh, if you go to h8, I actually don't give knight... Do, I can also play this. Uh, yeah, I, I will play knight f7 check. Yeah, and you just take the queen, no? You just go knight d6, yeah, knight Yeah, probably, d8. probably, yeah. Give a check and then take the queen. Because the rook on c3 is hanging as well. Yeah, ev everything is hanging. And after check, there is this. 
Okay, and let's back up. And after rook g6, if you go king f8, there's knight e6. So black doesn't have time to pick up the bishop on c3. Wow. And the line that you're pointing out after f takes g5, it all relies on the rook on a1 being the star piece, not allowing black's king to escape. After these wow. checks, if you go king e8, rook e1 is actually very... Is that is that game over or you still have king f8? Uh, probably I still... Probably I still have King F8 because I, I don't see what White could do apart from repeating. Unbelievable, Rook H. And Danny, Daniel down to one minute thirty seconds on the clock. This is and, a very big. This is a very big miss. And uh, Levon, with this game, who said his resourcefulness was low? I think the aim chess. Uh, we need a new. We need a new reading on Levon's resourcefulness by aim chess after yeah. this game. Rook H6. What a move. So. For me, also more than rook h6, rook h6 is absolutely genius. But I would also like to point out uh, Levon's play here. He knew he is worse. And although computer will say the move like bishop g4 is uh, probably better than uh, what Levon played, you know, <clears throat> in terms of computer world. But uh, Levon wanted to keep the position as messy as possible. And we see uh, the benefit there. You just make one uh, inaccurate move and uh, rook h6 and game over. Just a draw. I'm so impressed with this. Unbelievable, no? And 53 seconds. And it's also a disappointment because this is such a big game for Daniel. Making his debut in the Champions Chester, playing against the world number four. And you get this position out of the opening where you're just crushing it and that's it. It's a repetition. And with that, we see a very disappointed uh, Naraditsky. Uh, on yeah. the screen there. Uh, we've got live action. we got to move on. We will, maybe we'll take a look at this once more once the games are over. But for now, can we get an update on the Wesley with it board? With it, who's had a fantastic start in the event. He drew with Magnus, won the first game against Jordan Van Forest, taking on Wesley now. And what's going on in this one? Um, looks, looks almost lost to me for with it at this point. I I don't see how I'm responding to this knight coming to e3. The d7 bishop is uh, bad. Also the time. Uh, I'm at, at this moment, I'm actually struggling to find a single move for black. What am I going to play? I would probably try to make rook e8 work. At least it has a trap, yeah? If you play this, there is a rook e7. At least it comes with a trap. But uh, after rook e8, can you just trade and go queen b8? Yeah, just trade queen to b8 and knight on e3 is very solid. Pawns are falling. I mean, this queen Impossible. and knight versus queen and bishop would be a disaster to defend, no? Especially with uh, no targets for black at all. White pawn structure, all pawns on the dark squares. Bad bishop for black. Uh, this is a bit of a nightmare for with it. Yeah, I don't. I, I actually, I'm literally struggling to find a move right now that will keep the game going i mean imagine a move like bishop c6 you feel like you know you're attacking but the knight not only attacks but also protects the pawn on g2 um yeah for forces the queen to go out and then there will be 100 moves that uh, wins he decided uh, by to the way bishop, bishop to e8 yeah bishop e8 uh, happened does that uh, allow queen g4 does that allow queen g4 yeah queen g4 is just a uh, game over Queen g4 hits the rook on c8, hits that pawn on g7, and with it shaking his head, he made the move bishop e8, and I think immediately realizes that he missed queen g4. Wesley yeah, doesn't yeah. miss this stuff. Queen g4 on the board, and that's it. That is it. Yeah. Wesley wins uh, with this, but a difficult position really for with it, this one. Let's move on to some of our other live action that we have on. What is going Magnus? on with the world champion? World champion is dominating. And I see a big pawn on d6. Um, how, do, how do I play? Do I play queen to b no queen queen to c7? That allows bishop a5. I cannot play queen b7 because that allows rook takes d6. Queen a6, queen a6. Tanya, am I losing material here already? 
So bishop a4 hitting that queen. There has to be a way to fight this idea. Oh, wow. I think you were right. I mean, yeah. Yeah, he just gave the queen, yeah? Yeah, because there is no other good square. There was no other way. I mean, I was about to say even positionally he's uh, winning, but then it just turns out... Uh, That's uh, a very nice concept. Very nice concept that the black queen actually on c6 is so overloaded. Let's just back up to that position where bishop a4 was played by Magnus. The queen on c6 having to defend the rook on b6, having to defend the, uh, the bishop on d6. Queen c7 impossible because of bishop a5. And bishop a4 precisely converting this. And now he finally gave up the queen with rook a6, bishop c6, rook c6 on the board. And another very nice move by Magnus, not slowing B4. down. He goes for b4. Yeah, you want to play b5 and then get the rook to a6. Make sure this bishop is dead. Uh, yeah, this is just over also. It's been um, a good start for Magnus. He won the first game against Wesley. He got into trouble against with it, but was resourceful enough to hold that position. Uh, and against uh, Lei Kuang Liam, a nice win with the white pieces, making it look easy. Yes, absolutely. We got another very interesting game. Uh, would you like to check uh, Mamedar of Duda? It's kind of getting sharp. Let's take a look at that. Wow, I love it. The open G file, uh, Sharks King on D2. Uh, what were we saying? We are missing the shark attack. Is this the game? Yeah, sure. I mean, this has to be winning. If uh, yeah, This has to be some sort of mate. The move that comes to my mind is something simple, actually. Maybe Queen F3 or Queen F4. I like Queen F4. I'd like to take on G7. That's it. You know, that's amazing, Gangs, because I was having a look at this position literally instantly when we got when you got it up on the analysis board and then you said mm -hmm. this has to be mate and and for me i was for me it was like white's king is on d2 you probably mean mate on white's king <laughs> but then you realize that you're actually talking about mate on black's king because none of black's pieces are actually attacking the king on d2 true true i i wouldn't be surprised if rook g7 is also winning here rook g7 takes and queen h5 how do you stop this uh Okay, can you point out the million threats that you have in this position? So queen eight, six, well, rook check, five yeah. ideas. So, yeah, first of all, if rook h eight, there is check, and after take take, uh, I will somehow try to pick up the other rook. But shark doesn't go for that. Shark plays the move that I was recommending: this queen to f four, and threaten that. Like all, all threats. I am actually losing count. How many threats do I have at this point? And the problem is that white's king is on d2, but black is, is still two moves away from even giving a check. How are you even creating a threat? Even if you go queen c8, rook c2 ideas, it's just one check. Just one check. Actually, this, yeah, this king is super safe on, uh, on d2. Yeah, and you can look at, you look at the position, but you also look at Jan Tristov Duda on the camera and you realize that his position is busted. He's gone for b3. Can we take a look at these lines that you're mentioning now? Does he have I mean, time to go rook g7 or do you go queen h6? Yeah, this at this point, I will be spoiled of choice because even queen h6 wins. Because as you mentioned, this is just a check. I'll just come back to g1. And you have to go g6 at some point, but then let's just show the mate after g6. So queen h6. Um, again, there are so many options. I don't even know what to show. Maybe rook h5. Rook and h5. if you want... Yeah, go on. Go on, go on. No, I was saying if you want to make everything forcing, you take... Ah, this is what is uh, Duda is probably hoping for, yeah? Check here. No, I, I first thought, can I keep it as simple as possible? You know, take and uh, yeah, somehow get to this position. But maybe maybe this is a move that I'll, be, I'll try to avoid. I'll take here. If I want to mate at this point, uh, maybe rook h5 should... No. But rook c2 check here? Oh, here you have f6. Here you have f6. No, let's not, you know, Tanya, let's not do any of these things. I let's like your move queen h6. I like yeah, your move queen h6. Let's play simple. Let's not calculate. Queen h6. So there's a threat of queen g7 check. Mate, there's rook h5 coming in. Rook c2 is just a check. So f6, do you even have time to get greedy with rook e6? Because this rook is now so fixed. 
but nothing will work. And Shark is Shark must be thinking for some force line, you know, he's just checking what is the easiest way to make. I really wanted to make this line work. Okay, Tanya. what about queen g3 there? Can you go queen g3 after king g7 so that king h7, king h8, there's rook h5 mate? It's a start. And king f6, there's queen g5 mate. Oh, that's actually very pretty. Wait, what are you playing? Is this over actually? Oh, by the way, I see that he's gone for queen h6, but I do you, you see know the defense? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure queen g3 was missed. Because uh, psychologically, we tend to see rook g5, queen h6. But yeah, queen wow, g3 this is, is amazing. So much and yeah, now that the position the is in front of me, I don't see a way that black can actually defend this. Yeah. Well, instead, queen h6, f6, uh, bishop, uh, rook into e6 was played that we were checking. But he was so, so right. I mean, just take on g7 and then uh, queen g3 is just over. Unbelievable, no? Queen at six, rook e6. Well, he does have an extra piece. Um, he takes on a2. Is this... Is there I would really consider taking even uh, on a6, just to make sure, you know, this rook, um, make sure uh, my g1 rook is also free. So I take on a6, there is no attack coming. And maybe Tad, maybe Tad can actually confirm if in that line, rook g7, king g7 was actually winning or it wasn't. Are we missing something there? Because it just looked like a mate uh, on the board. I'm a little surprised, actually. Actually, now that rook a6 happened, I'm thinking that I said it's winning, but after queen b2, I still stick to my assessment it is winning, but probably I have to change who is winning. What? Maybe it's black. <laughs> no, because I just don't see a defense. You see, I wanted to take rook takes a2, but suddenly I spotted there is queen b4 check and I'm losing this rook. I don't have a single square because either you give a check here or here and then pick oh. up my rook, everything is protected. Queen b8 on the board, and I'm not sure who is winning. Queen b8 on the board. We are getting a confirmation that indeed in that position, uh, your intuition was absolutely right that rook g7 was the way to go for wide. Rook g7 was a mate in six. And rook a6 is a massive blunder by Shark now. Let's, let's, let's just digest this once again. So here it was simply mate in six. Take, take, and queen g3 check. A move, I must emphasize that it does not come automatically, at least yeah, at does. first glance. It didn't, right? We were, we were looking at queen h6, we were looking at rook g5, we were looking at a million other options because queen g3 is just not a natural check to give. Yeah. And this bishop controlling the h6 square very nicely and rook h5 was mate. Wow. Uh, f6 happened. So rook a6 was the mistake you said, yeah, according to machine. According to Tad, who's informing us, indeed, that rook a6 was the turning point and the uh, queen b8, a good move. Uh, it's, a to it's a total turnaround. And now it's Jan Shristov Duda who is in the driving seat in this position. Yeah, this looks, this looks actually devastating now. Yeah, Shark, Shark doesn't look happy and shaking. Unbelievable. Oh, I have to take on A2. No, what else can I do? Nothing. I have to take on A2. is a massive threat. You have to defend the B2 pawn. You have to get rid of the A2 pawn. And now Rook, he goes for Queen B3. He goes for Queen B3 and not oh, a check. Uh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm a Queen B3? Was this a pre move? It wasn't a pre. Um, there are no pre. You can't make pre moves. Uh, you can't make pre moves. No, no, you can't make pre moves. Ah, queen b3. Okay, he was threatening this checks, yeah? And attacking the rook. And attacking the rook. Makes a lot of sense, yeah. So king e2, rook. now shark trying to run away. And we were talking about king on d2 being very safe. Gangs, not anymore. Not anymore, not anymore, Tanya. <laughs> also, I'm wondering if I give a check like this, are you okay, probably come... Okay. No, where do you go? Maybe to f3 and then to f4. Here? And he has to go to f4, yeah? There's just no other square. What's happening after g5? No idea. <laughs> no, then you come g3. Then you come to g3. Now, because the queen is not hanging. Yeah, and there's queen g6 check in the air as well. Yeah. And uh, king f4 queen might queen. be safer than the king on d2. True, true, true. As anyway, none of this... 
actually none of this happened he took he took on um, he took on a2 he took the rook yeah took the rook queen f4 king f3 check, check, queen, and, check. and this is our current position so black has an exchange a very safe king now white has got a pawn for the exchange this is a game where Jan Fristov Duda is playing for two results. Is that accurate to say? Absolutely. Without a doubt. I mean, that would be the best assessment of this position. Um, would you like to jump to some other game? Let's take a look at that. This has been a roller coaster of a game. I mean, it looked, and we will come back to that mating idea with Rook G7 that was missed by Shaq. Uh, where do you want to jump to? Uh, I'm just let's trying to find Let's take a look at the Artemiyev game. Do you want to take a look at the Artemiyev board? Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure. Let's, let's, let's go there. Hmm. It's kind of funny that you go from all that madness to this sober end game. And, uh, you know, it takes a little while to actually adapt to this position where things make sense. Exactly, exactly. It's like, uh, <laughs> yeah, suddenly everything is so calm, so relaxed, you know. You make, he played E5, okay, you, you make a move like A4, stopping all sorts of B5 ideas. Yeah, it's feels, like the calm. It's so relaxing calm. somehow. I don't have to. Uh, you don't have to find checkmates. You I don't have to find checkmates. You're not scared of blundering pieces anymore. No calculation is needed. So <laughs> this is all good. Uh, by the way, after A4, the first move comes in mind is why not to play A5? Hmm. Decided to play a6 instead. Maybe he just wants to drive white's rook away from c4 and committing to a5 means that that rook is never moving. So a6, b5 is something that black wants to play? Uh, I'm not very sure if b5 is something that I'll be bothered about because it kind of allows also rook a6 check. Mm. Well, he has traded on d5 first and he goes for e3. So trying to break the center himself. Uh, one thing we can say safely that uh, black is in the driving seat. It, uh, irrespective of, you know, even if computer calls this dead equal, I would say it is black who is uh, pressing because he has more space. I can even consider taking. If you take, I want to come to E4. If you take here, uh, maybe even in C5. The other thing, gangs, we can say safely is that black has more space and more lighting. Take a look at that camera situation. True. Very true. Takes on e3 though. Takes on e3. Yeah, takes on e3. F into e3 will happen. And I'm expecting some pawn push on the king side. He's gone for it. I don't know. Your idea with f5. f5. Yeah. Do I play e4? Or I don't. I would love to play e4 actually. If I could. Let's take a look. If e4 right now. And black moves back with the king. I'm not king, sure king if e6, I want yeah? to take on e4. Uh, tough, tough calls. Now you want to take, yeah, maybe. F e four is a threat now because you can't take rook e four because of rook c two and d takes e four. The c four pawn will be hanging in the end. By the e four is on the board, okay, so maybe so I'll protect, okay. yeah, so that if you take, I can, uh, I can think of taking with the king. And now that you mentioned you can think about taking with the king, suddenly the idea comes to mind that maybe black should have taken f takes e4 in the live board that we have, forcing d takes e4 check. Interesting. I would have I have to take here. But this time, I cannot go to king pawn endgame. Yeah? Probably I should not. Uh, I mean, no, that I looks should. very dangerous for white. No, with the pawn structure that you'll end up with. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I would like to make a5 walk. Can oh, I? Wow. Okay, let's put one thing out there that white is trying to defend this position. Um, yes, that is true. I'm actually, uh, sorry, I was like completely lost in this variation that, B okay, let's say I, B5 takes, takes, and I was just thinking, can I play rook c1 or should I play b4 and rook c1? Because rook c1, let's say takes, takes, if I can play b4, this is a complete fortress. Imagine you make a move like this. I play b4 and my king will come to e3. I'll play h3. I'm just uh, 
trying to do it as fast as possible. But then that leaves an open question, what is happening after B4? Like who gets to the square fast, faster? I was trying to calculate this because even if you take the pawn, I can take, but it feels like, uh, I'm not sure, maybe the, even this is a draw, but this will require really more, more time to understand. Because I'm thinking, you know, even if you take pawn structures are symmetrical, I'll probably get this B4 pawn and make a draw. But sorry but for none of making... that happened. Yeah. None of that happened. Our Tamiya have decided to go for another idea. He did take on e4. Lenny had took on e4. And after taking the king went back to e6. And instead of maybe after a5, white also has to think about moves like just simply b takes a5. I don't know if that's good or not, but it's a pawn. Yeah, I thought maybe rook a5, okay, you take on h2. This this hmm. I was not, uh, well, rook not worried a5 about. Is nice. But yeah, you don't want to calculate this king pawn endgame when you know that you know there are other easier way to make a draw like it happened in the game. Yeah, just keeping all the pawns intact. And as we can see, I think this one is pretty symmetrical and should end any moment in a draw. This is very level. Yes, yes. This is just a complete fortress. There's nothing happening. Even rook takes d3, it's just a dead draw. Okay, so then let's go back to the other game where still Shark, after that roller coaster of a middle game, is trying to hold on to this end game now. Definitely one that's way tougher for White to hold than uh, the Artemiev position. What do we have here? Rook H8 played. How are you evaluating this? What are Black's chances of actually winning this game? Um, if I can eliminate these two pawns, I think I'm holding this position. So, yeah, and that's what happened in the game. Instantly, h6. There is no time to play g5 because after h5, I'm winning. So, g6 happened. Wait, g6 happened? g6 on the board. Ah, no. How g6 happened? It's... Ah, there is. What is that? So, rook e8 is a big threat. Does he just want to go king d6? Rook e7. This, oh my goodness. To the... Oh, yeah, because king d6, there's bishop f4 check. Yeah. So eight six was a big mistake then. I mean eight yeah, eight six was must be a big mistake. Or even king f five. Wow, shark down to twenty seconds and king f five played now. So black has a clear idea now. Now that the pawn is on eight seven, it's on the light square, you can just double up on the seventh oh. rank and pick up that pawn. I, I, I'm now completely convinced that uh, 87 was a blunder. Uh, sorry, 86 was a blunder. He rushed it. If you could avoid, you know, if you could trade these pawns, it's a dead draw. But maybe some move like king, uh, yeah, maybe king g4, for example, would have been fine. Because still, it's very difficult to make any kind of progress. Look at these three pieces, yeah, like it defending each other. And he goes but to this 86, side, yeah. Yeah, Shark clearly missed. Uh, clearly missed that uh, he's going to lose the pawn. Yeah, and as you rightly mentioned, amazing stuff. One then, yeah. and that's it. That is it. This after you lose the H pawn, very difficult. But gangs, do you think the mess up that happened in the middle game and knowing what a dominating position probably just moves away from realizing that you're checkmating your opponent and that turnaround? It's so difficult to come back from that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, from mate in six, and not it's not just mate in six. I mean, clearly Shark knew he was completely winning, not just in one way. There were like so many ways to win this game. And now to defend this position is uh, practically impossible. Very tough task. Let's quickly bring up their stats, their aim chest stats that we have between these two players. And we see here... Very, very similar, actually, uh, gangs at 98% opening accuracy, advantage capitalization. It shows Shark has 81%, but this was a big, big miss, a miss by him. Resourcefulness. Uh, we see accuracy rate very high for both players. A good time management, high decisiveness. So the number of wins and losses in that game is pretty high compared to some of our other top players. But very similar strengths uh, and stats there by Aim Chess. Let's get our board back up. At some point, this pawn will come to f4 and that will end the game. He's just preparing. 
will make sure it comes maybe rook d7 now rook to d6 change one rook get your king somewhere and then play f5 f4 move the king yeah so king e4 and sooner or later f5 f4 will happen I really like how you guys make these endings sound so easy. You just move your king, go f5, f4, and it appears on the board. But it's uh, very interesting to see how, and very instructive, that these are the plans that you need to play with all your pieces. You need to play with the king. You need to advance your pawns, and that's the way to convert these positions. Although yeah. still, uh, f5, f4, not happening. No, but now you are still kind of stalemated. Actually, right th at this moment, it's kind of stalemated, yeah? You have to Suddenly, white has only two moves, rook e4, rook g4. There is nothing else going on. Because the d4 pawn would be picked up if you fall back because of the pin on the third rank. The king has to defend the rook. So actually, it's a bit of a zugzwang like you're mentioning. Only rook e4, rook g4. Yeah, I'm still trying to find out the... Do you go king g6 now? Yeah, there is king g6. I would consider something like rook d7 or rook uh, d8. My rook d7 is... Ah, he goes... He goes to a6 and rook, and rook e8, to e6. Rook e6. So he wants to go yeah. rook e4, g4 next? Yeah, rook e4, g4, rook e4 will happen. Oh, rook e7 instead, yeah. And now g4. So g4, g4 you can't e4. go king e2 because if rook takes d4, and after g4, if you go g3. king g3, he doesn't, he's really <laughs> waiting. Duda is yeah, he, not committing. No, no, he wants to go. He wants to go f5, f4. Not but allowing he's taking it. Time. Not allowing it. No, white. Uh, yeah, white is. Uh... Black is playing very cautiously here. Yeah, but the thing is, black knows that uh, the position is winning. So as long as he doesn't cross uh, 50 moves, at some point he will play f5, f4, and he will win. And he got f5. This is what was needed. Finally. Now f4 is coming. And look how he placed all his pieces. Yeah, there are there are no checks. Everything is controlled. The plan that you mentioned, advancing the f pawn, but just making sure that there's no check and the king is super safe. And now after f4, the d4 pawn would be hanging, or is the idea to try and get bishop c1, bishop b2 ideas? What happens after f4 here? Yeah, f4 is pretty direct move actually. Something but maybe you like can't this. take on d4 no because of bishop, bishop d2. d2. Yes. And rook d3, you maybe still it's possible. Rook d3. Can we just take a look at that line, gangs? Because we still have the live board with us. So rook uh, yeah. d3 and then Here, rook d7. Yeah. Looks winning, no? Looks winning, yeah. Looks winning. Yeah, f4, I have to play bishop c1. What, what else can I do? Duda Eight. taking his time. Maybe king to e4 and after rook d7. No, but check you always have this, no? Uh, yeah, and also king h5, but rook d6 just looks very good. True. No, f4 is just uh, over. But he uh, didn't play it, no? He didn't play it. He's not committing the pawns very quickly. He's taking his time. He's enjoying the position. Uh, just keeping all the threats on the board. And he's got a little smile on his face. I don't know why. Yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, having a glass of wine. You don't want to drink it uh, immediately. You want to gulp it want... down. You want to enjoy yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, you want to enjoy it. Yeah. Jan Shristoff, Duda, really smelling and taking a sip of that wine right now. King H5 on the board, uh, not yeah, committing the pawn moves. Uh, gangs, we've got a live board with us. Can we just back up to that moment, that defining moment in this game that we had where suddenly Shark's world turned upside down? That was yeah, a little dramatic, be... but you know what I mean. Yeah, that would be here. Queen F4. I'm, I'm convinced that, you know, there, are, there would be hundred of moves. Maybe Queen H5 is winning. Maybe Rook takes G7 also. Uh, and then Queen H5 is winning. I I believe the intuition says everything should be winning at this point. But Tanya, as you correctly pointed out, Rook G7 takes and not this check, not this check, but slightly counterintuitive, Queen G3 mates. 
Yeah. And it's kind of easy to find this check when you've played through every other check and you see it doesn't work and all the ideas come to your mind. But as you're mentioning, when you're calculating Rook G7, it's not a check that you look at. Yeah. Are we going to see another uh, Levon kind of thing? Because I think uh, another blunder happened. What? No. How? Bishop B2? There's Rook D3, no? Yeah. But this time, I can change the Rook or not? Or I cannot, yeah? How do you want to like do Like, let's that? say I play this. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, no. Yeah, I do this. Can I? You want to go rook g8 check. Is that your idea? Yes. Oh, my God. Okay. Rook d3 on the board. What is going on here? We just left it saying that this is over. Wow. Duda's winning. Did he just uh, blow this? Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Definitely. So what happened? He drank the wine at the wrong moment. That, that's what <laughs> happened. No, he had, you know, he could play a four, like you mentioned here, and then get this position. Wait, but did we? It was the same, no, Anya? No, there's rook on H8. It's a different position. No, no, no. But I mean, we said F4 at this point, but even yeah. here he could have played the same thing, not King E4, but King G4. Uh-huh. Yeah. But maybe, and now if you mean if rook d7, you still have rook g8. I still have rook g8. So f4 was probably not the way to do it. Maybe a calm move like rook h7 first and then f4. Yeah, this I really like. Something like rook h7 and then to play f4. Started with f4. This rook h8 check is nice because you need this square. And after rook d3 check, not to go here or here, not going for the rook, but going for the g5 pawn. That's amazing. And now there's just no way to hold on to this pawn. And I mean, I don't, I don't know what to say. This is just such a big turnaround. So let's just take a look. Can black actually fight, fight for a win here still? And what is the idea? Let's say you move the rook away. Where do you move the rook? You go b7 or f7. I don't know where you want to play. Let's say, then... let's say b7, but b7. Ah, oh, wait. Yeah, what are we doing after because Maybe you go rook g8 check. The rook g8, it's a direct perpetual because you cannot go here and if you go to h7, I'm giving check. Yeah, and if you go king h6, there's check anyway. So rook b7 is a check draw immediately. Here. And take, take, and I take here. But rook d2? And rook d2, there are two ways. Uh, bishop c1 or bishop e5. Bishop e5, maybe f3. So maybe you have to go bishop c1. No, even here, uh, I think even here, this should be, uh, this should be some sort of a draw. I, we have to just figure out what is the exact way. We, by the way, we might have this on the board, gangs. I see rook b7 has been played, rook g8, king h6. So this is our live position. And the line that we are looking at, let's take a look at that. The only way to fight the perpetual is to go rook h7. And we are looking at That's trading true. the rooks, picking up that g5 pawn. And rook d2. We will get to this position. F3 will be played, something like this. Let's say king f4, rook to d2. You put the put the bishop somewhere. Takes, you play something like king g3, rook f1, bishop e3. No, but why can't uh -huh. and rook c2 doesn't change anything? Also bishop e3, yeah. If this immediately picks up the pawn. Yeah. And if rook f1? Rook f1, bishop e3. And then bishop f2 and picks up the pawn. That's the trick. That's the way to win that F3 pawn. Very nice. I, I think we're going to have this played out uh, as you're calling. We're going to have a play-by-play -play on this one. Rooks have been traded. The G5 pawn to be picked up. Is there any other way that black can keep the F pawn alive after King G5? Mm, nope. Uh, my curiosity is why even why thinking at this point. Uh, he's probably considering bishop f6, which is also a draw. To take like this. Uh, king g5. Yeah, king g5 is more human. It's just so forcing. You know, Dani, I think draw is a fair result in this game. <laughs> From almost checkmating to almost getting checkmated, a losing position, and then fighting back, and then f4 being played... Yeah, I get what you mean. It's it's averaged out. 
and um, I, who do you think will be more upset hmm that's an interesting question i think it's always the player who was winning at the end not the player who missed it so much for example yes uh, shark missed that big moment he missed that win but then after that yan shishad dura it wasn't about one move for him he was winning throughout the end game he played it really well he kept up on the clock and then in the end this f4 at the wrong time i would say dura what about you i would say shark because shark was more winning than dura because it was actually mating at yeah. some point this was just mate so i would be more upset here and also from shark's point of view he was first winning Mm. like in each, he started with winning and then he was losing so i believe he will be more upset but yeah it's kind of mutual yeah it's it's tough to tough to really say but i think both players maybe there's another way to look at it gangs that both players have something to be happy about that this ended in a draw and a neither lost duda that he was getting checkmated and shark that eventually he was losing managed to save it somehow uh, can we call this one a draw and we're going to have action on very quick for Absolutely. round 4 should we take a very short break and be right back let's go freedom so fresh so new freedom it's all for you all for you freedom keep your ears to the ground We're talking about freedom Air quality isn't the first thing that comes to mind when you think about chess and esports, but it affects our focus, decision making, health, sleep, and more. What's in the air you breathe? Find out with Air Things. Breathe better. Live better. Want to raise your chess to a new level? Challenge Yourself is an exclusive, innovative experience designed for Chess 24 Premium members. Train like a champ with a unique set of lessons prepared by the coaches of the challengers. Boris Gelfin and Co will help you improve your chess. Play a champ. Play a grandmaster each day in Banter Blitz. Take advantage of this incredible opportunity from June 10th. Go premium and challenge yourself. To say is that when you play versus the opponent who has only one opening, it's a uh, like rather I think it's rather you uh, really prepare some strong idea in the line where they play, like you are preparing against something yeah, what they played in their games, and then you prepare some strong idea. uh or you choose something different where it's like both of you are not in this theory uh just maybe some sideline or or whatever uh, where she doesn't have so many games on all boards that with Yan Shishtov with the Shakriya Mamadarov eventually ending in a draw what a roller coaster of a game we've got game 4 action on let's quickly take a look at the pairings that we've got going into round 4 and that we have it we've got 
Dude are taking on with it after a marathon game, a completely crazy one, a lot of up and down in that one. Lake Kwang Liam taking on Wesley. Ali Reza against Magnus, and that's always a super exciting battle. Daniel Naroditsky up against Jordan. Eric Hansen, Lavon Aronian. Maxime takes on a wonder Lanier against Anish. Anish, by the way, gangs, has drawn all his first three games. So he's still sort of easing into the event. Shark against Artemiev. That one I'm very excited about. And there we have our standings after round three. This is the preliminaries. It's a round robin stage. The aim is to get into the top half of the table to make it to the top eight after 15 games after three days. And right now, after round three, we see that we've got two leaders, Artamiev and Magnus, leading the pack. So speaking of Magnus, speaking of Magnus, gangs, do you want to take a look at his opening? Because it is absolutely wild. But I see both players have barely taken any time, which means that it is part of their prep. It is. It is uh, part of their prep without a doubt. But I always consider this position to be uh, better for white. Uh, let me uh, take you through this one. Um, first of all, Magnus playing dot and center counter uh, or Scandinavian, whatever uh, it is. Uh, we know this opening uh, by both names. It's clearly showing that he is not uh, going to be very solid. He is ready to play anything and everything like he always does. Uh, this is one of the main line. It can come via c6, knight e5 move order also. And after knight e5, c6, uh, basically white goes for this bishop, but he doesn't want to start with g4 because then there is bishop e6, saving the bishop. So standard theory is to play bishop c4. You first attack here, kind of force black to play e6, block the retreat of uh, the bishop and then play g4. Uh, how is black going to save this bishop? Black can either come here or, as happened in the game, black first asks white to, you know, uh, to weaken the king side further. White says, yeah, I want to play h4. I want to trap your bishop and I want you to be here. So he plays knight d7, uh, attacking the knight. This is all well-known takes. Actually, even king d7 here is a move which is very, very interesting. But uh, knight d7, h5, bishop e4, and a surprising move. I knew this, uh, interestingly, uh, from uh, uh, before Anand Carlsen uh, world, championship, world Championship match. We were also checking uh, center counter at the training, and this is one of the lines uh, that we were also considering. And castle, a very uh, unique move, I must say. And by the way, this also reminds me not exactly in this position, but all this g4, h4, h5, or the famous game uh, of Anand Lotia. But uh, this line here, yeah, you just play g4, h5, and you castle. Uh, black has to go bishop d5. Now there is just no other way. And takes, takes, and the move bishop d3. Uh, I remember I was always uh, seeing this line. Uh, computer used to give uh, good advantage for white, claiming that this pawns, it's not very easy to break. And if you go short castle, it's uh, white who is killing on the on the king side. And Magnus goes for long castle instantly. Mm. I don't remember what uh, was the preparation, but it was considered that uh, uh, that black is uh, black is under trouble. So bishop e three happened in the game g six. One of the moves that comes in mind is, yeah, I was just going to say, just h6, shut this side and try to play b4 at some point. Hmm. Actually, I was curious, could I start with b4? Well, that's always in the air. And I like the fact that he's gone for h6, keeping it a bit flexible. b4, of course, a really nice option. You, you give up the pawn to open up the b file. I won't be surprised if we see this on the next move, gangs. I'm just wondering if all these opening choices by Magnus going for the Dutch first, then going for the Scandinavian. It also feels with the World Championship looming and him preparing for that. It's also a way to not show maybe what he wants to play with the black pieces. And also in some way giving a mixed signal that, you know, I do have these openings up my arsenal that you need to prepare against. I think there is a lot of psychology and dynamics about the upcoming World Championship match and the kind of openings that we're going to see Magnus play in this event. That is very true. Very true. It's uh, he doesn't want to show what he's going to play. It's 
we can safely assume that you know in a classical game he would probably in a world championship match he would probably not play center counter or touch uh, rook f8 yeah he wants to play he wants to probably break in with f5 yeah i'm still Good considering to, to play uh, something like b4 and i feel that after a move like b4 taking on b4 just feels very dangerous for black you it do is, give up this you, you do pick up the pawn but then you're opening up all these files which just makes it look maybe you can even go c3 or c4 in these positions yeah, yeah. now b4 queen c7 looks uh, <clears throat> more uh, logical and i was hoping to break it anyway like something like this let's say then get your rook here and now we see yeah although our pawns are advanced it's not very easy to break the position for black so at this point if i have to pick a color i would uh, rather pick uh, white so rook f8 played and b4 after b4 if you're not picking up that pawn on b4 how would it continue after a move like let's say queen c7 do you anyway break open with c4 yeah yeah that's what yeah i'll play c4 takes takes and uh, not even sure how exactly black is playing do you want to play king b8 i would like to go rook c1 not a big fan of black's position here don't like it at all mm. you you're saying you don't like black's position at all but looking at magnus he feels he looks very relaxed he looks like he's enjoying his position right now but it's very hard to tell with him as well yeah i'm just curious what he has in mind to do you put probably not on c7 a you need to find a better square but what are the you don't want to go to b6 so that leaves basically these two squares okay intuitively where do you put your queen would you put it on a3 a4 well, he goes a3 and maybe that's why he doesn't want to allow this queen a3 square uh which probably rook b1 rook b3 not really sure what is going on in this but he starts with a3 he starts with a3 which feels a little bit slow to me uh, f5 played as you were looking at this counter idea that magnus has on the king side and now do you have time to go b4 because f takes g4 you still have queen f8 so maybe b4 is still an option here i just want to understand one thing from a psychological point of view if let's say firuza was not playing magnus and uh, if uh, his opponent was uh, not blitzing out all his moves I'm pretty sure a player like Firuza would start with b4. But you know, when you're playing Magnus and he's blitzing out all all his moves then you feel like uh, yeah, it's probably part of his preparation, you know, let's try to be more safe. Because a3 is not exactly Firuza kind of play, yeah. He would uh, normally go for uh, something like b4. It also feels a bit slow to be honest. It's a bit slow and also not just on the board, on the clock as well. It looks like it, it... It looks like Alireza is not very confident about his position. He's down to eight minutes. Magnus has almost doubled the amount of time, and he's just playing moves. He's just he's just blitzing out move after move. He's gone for f five now, and suddenly not very clear for Alireza because he needs to still, even after b four, Black has the option of simply retreating with the queen. Yeah, now actually, a c four, not even C4. playing b four. Yeah, that was his idea. Okay, now I actually do not like. Uh... uh white's position at all would you take on g4 here or would you keep the tension with black first of all even a move like f4 or maybe f4 he wants he has b4 probably that is his uh, uh big what's point what's going on there can we take a look f4 b4 f takes e3 you take on f8 yeah my point was if i could force you to play bishop c1 i would rather play f4 but then i saw there is b4 and after this there is queen takes h2 check bishop h2 check at like king g2 mhm mm yeah king h2 this queen yeah. c7 but you yeah. got king king g2 here yeah so i cannot play f4 maybe to take on c4 because this time i'm kind of opening the queen so i guess c4 uh not sure yeah maybe even rook c1 is possible but bishop c4 does hit the e6 pawn Mm -hmm. True. True. Tough to say. 
C4 on the board and for, for the uh -huh. and Magnus finally taking a thing here now. It's not an easy decision. Also, do I have a move like E5? Wow, that will really blow things up, no? E5, I mean, look at that center. That is one volatile center. So you're threatening E4, all the pawns are attacked. What do we start with here? So if you take on D5, you go E, you go E4 anyway. Yeah, here, yes. Probably you have to take with the queen. So queen D5 and... And now I should be happy. No, I'm getting both E4 and F4. Mm -hmm. And you can always so jump with the knight and start picking up the D5, G4 pawns. Oh, still, yeah. Knight F6 coming in after that. Exactly. No, E5 looks like a positionally very sound move, no? Ah, we have to calculate B4. Yeah, E5, B4, because now if you move the queen maybe you can still move the queen no what what happens after a move like queen c7 queen c7 i'm maybe somehow not a, not a big not a big fan of yeah then again i have to calculate all sorts of mm. probably uh could you put your queen somewhere else maybe or not um queen a4 looks like the only other square no because queen b6 there's all this e takes d4 uh, d takes e5 stuff i don't know what's going on there and how about e4? There are just so many possibilities here. It just. You know what? I think Magnus is going to go for e5. We've seen him do this with the black pieces in all these Spanish positions where if there's a d5 break in the center, he always goes and gets them. Uh, I think he is. He's going to play this move e5. It's yeah, too e5, attractive b4. for him not to. But e5, b4, he has to figure out. Yeah, I just realized that there is queen takes d5. So. A lot depends whether we can play e5, b4, e4 or not. Can we? But even that line after e4, queen takes d5, knight f6, it's still quite a mess, no? Yeah, and actually the more I look at this position, I feel no, e4 cannot be, yeah? because e4, okay, takes, takes. After g5, this knight can be dead. Actually, I just, no, black... No, this position black will suffer forever. No, this is not. What not about the way. that other line that you were mentioning with queen b6 and queen d5? Queen this b6 uh, instead of uh, here, yeah? Yeah, queen b6. And because if you take on e5, then maybe that knight takes e5. C5, no? Oh, yeah, no, there's it, c5. No, it, it has to be queen c7. Maybe queen c7. Uh, this can be an idea. I was, was the I, point? So C takes D5 was what you were mentioning? Yeah, this is what I was worried about. C takes D5, E4, I thought, and Queen G2, and maybe here just, you know, play King B8. I like this because after Rook C1, you just go Queen B6 now. Yeah, and you say, you know, okay, I don't want your piece, but I just want to uh, give checkmate or as you said, you know, get some positional thing. Yangzil, Magnus, go for E5, make a prediction. I'm saying yes. 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 He, uh, so there are essentially, if I don't play e5, what else do I do? I mean, other option is to take here. f4, we said there is b4. This was very straightforward. I think e5 will happen. All right, we will come back. We've taken a look at all the complications, whether Magnus decides to go for E5 or play something a little more pragmatic. Uh, there is no pragmatism going on in the Jan Christoph Duda versus Vidit game. Another wild opening uh, by Duda. Uh, can we take a look at that one really quickly? What is uh, What was the opening? Some kind of rating. How did you get to this live board on my right, starting from this ready position? It's insane. <laughs> Hi, it's Reverse Kings Indian, in fact. And uh, yeah, it's just we are just getting a Reverse and Kings with Indian. It really, with it really went for it with H5, G5. Uh, you know, this would be a complete uh, normal position with the. Uh, I mean, uh, in Kings Indian, White would have castled by now with that extra tempo. But as black uh, 
with it takes the advantage that yeah i ha- i don't have this extra move but that also means my rook is on h8 so he goes h5 i really like this oh by the way tania do you remember uh, just uh, we were checking this levon game and i was saying in one of these variations in kings indian why to delay playing knight f3 keep the bishop on e2 e3 and go h4 g4 yeah is in that somewhat similar here very similar to these ideas yeah uh typically just reverse colors no yeah absolutely but by the way i just want to point out that this idea of g5 h5 it's not to attack the king it is actually meant to stop white from expanding on the king side black will start playing on the queen side also the pawn formation here simply stops white from getting into f4 what happens after f4 that's what happened in the game the advantage of g5 is you take twice and white does not get a pawn on f4 which means there is a very fantastic square available on e5 and if white cannot play f4 then black says you know which side are you going to play you, if you cannot play f4 on the queen side you don't have anything on the center you don't have anything i like f3 yeah and f3 played f3 played and also what you mentioned this idea of g5 being more of a positional move to get that e5 square and not to either king. it's very similar to those reverse kings indian lines where white plays h3 g4 against uh, black's f5 absolutely absolutely and we saw a very uh, thematic sacrifice by duda uh, in kings indian we see like a million times black plays rook f4 hoping to uh, open the bishop in black's case it would be the g7 bishop and after rook f5 with it says i don't want to take your uh... why is duda shaking his head he's not happy about something that's just happened in the position is this uh, is this is this trouble for white out of the opening yeah of course i mean white uh, cannot be happy at this point at all i mean there is just no attack uh, happening you have to watch out for uh, knight h4 This is a bit of a grudge match gang. It was Duda who knocked out with it in the quarterfinals and Epic with it had a fantastic performance and then in the quarterfinals of the World Cup it was Duda who knocked him out. So with it with a chance here to take his revenge. Totally. And um what is he going to do after knight h4 by the way? Queen g7 is that an option? It's an option but probably not a very good one because king, maybe you king just king d7. king d7 yeah you just yeah. give king d7 and there's rook g8 coming in Actually my next move is king d7 for example if you make some move yeah i don't know bishop d2 or bishop f4 i would like to play king d7 Oh, this so, looks like this looks like a tough position for Duda out of the opening, no? Yeah. All oh, there is another. Of... Yeah, go on, Tani. No, no, please continue. I was just going to say that uh, all these ideas that you are mentioning, knight coming to h4, black threatening rook g8, attacking that bishop on g2, white still look at that knight on a3, completely out of the game. The rook on a1, bishop c1, not developed. Meanwhile, black's got all his minor pieces out. The king from d7 would be absolutely safe. with it in driving seat here yeah i was thinking to check some other games uh, yeah, can, is, we the, uh, can we take a look at the left board because it's a, a, a is that fine if we just quickly jump over to the left board because there's a lot nice. going on there it's completely winning <laughs> there's not a lot going on completely winning for black yes uh, it's in job Yeah, he's got an exchange, and that's it. Not only is it completely winning, he has won the game, uh, and Eric not happy. Levon wins. A smile on his face. Let's move on to Ali Reza Magnus. Let's get an update on that, guys. Did you want to go anywhere else? No, no, no. Let's uh, let's let's get to this game uh, because this is very wild. E five happened. Uh... I told As you. We were, uh, we, were yeah. we were talking about this. E five is a move that Magnus will play. exactly we actually had this position yeah we said b4 uh, and now uh queen c7 c5 bishop e7 yeah 
So this version is so messy. Um, I would consider a move like F4 and E4. What do you think, Tanya? I am just a little bit in shock about the last few moments of the Lavon game, but maybe we'll take a look at that because it looks like it looks a little strange. We will come back to this. Let's stick to this. So Bishop B5 on the board. And uh, Gangs, what were you mentioning here? So I'm saying I want to play E4, F4. I don't know in which order. I would probably start with F4. And then yeah, E4 is coming. E4, maybe there's Queen F4 stuff that you need to exactly. look at. Somehow blocking that. So F4 looks very attractive here. I don't understand how white will play here. You will have to move here sooner or later. I'll play E4. I want to start with C6. I want to go wild with white and start with C6. Okay. So let me actually take this. Oh, no. If I take, you want to play Rook C1. That's your point. Yeah, but you can take on E3. What's going on there? Oh, then C D7 and Queen takes E3 maybe. Yeah? No, no. B takes C6, Rook C1, F E3. Ah, this way. Yeah, I have also knight b8 if uh, worst case, yeah? Yeah, because you win this tempo with the queen attacked on f3. You don't have time to pick up the c6 pawn. Exactly. And after c6, uh, b takes c6. Can black, does white have time to just move away with the bishop? Let's say bishop d2. Because I'm not worried about c takes b5 because of rook c1. Mm-hmm. So now I will play very positional. Let's say, for example, you move somewhere. I don't know where. H3, B3. B3. Okay. I play... Uh, I was actually willing to play Rook F6. Okay, let's go Rook. By the way, he goes for E4. So he... Yeah, I was thinking that's... No, that's also fine because Queen F4, there is... A, it's possible to take and then play g5, f4 if I want to. Mm -hmm. So lots of tempo. So he moves back queen h3. More forcing then. If queen f4 doesn't work, then e4 is just more forcing because you hit the queen. Yeah, exactly. So this Bishop position Bishop. looks so much better for... For black, black. No? Yeah, yeah. I would actually consider playing g5. I really want to get c6 in. Yeah, I take. This is my idea. Rook c1 and you go knight b8. Ah, take. You, you should probably take with... Uh, yeah, rook c1. Oh, I have bishop c6. c6. Bishop c6, you're right. Yeah, you would probably take here. Even this I like for, uh, for black. This could be a little messy, no, though? I thought I could take. Rook C1, and you want to put something yeah, some on Rook C1. Yeah, some Rook C1. I want to put something on C5. I don't know what, though. He decides to go Bishop G5. So the same line can happen, but he's made the move Bishop to G5 instead of G5. I don't mm -hmm. understand this move. What is the idea of Bishop G5? C6. Okay, C6. maybe C6. C6. Not... Yeah, actually... You know what? After seeing all this, what move I like the most in this position? Knight b8. <laughs> King b8. Knight b8, there's g5. So maybe g5, yeah. rook f5. King b8, uh huh. Prophylactic thinking. Yeah, just, just king b8. Uh, Ali Reza is going to play c6 in this position, unless there's an immediate tactical repetition that we are missing. But if not, he is going to try and create his own threats with c6. He should, yeah. He can't just sit passive in this. Also, Bishop G5. Gangs, can you can you explain to us why this move, Bishop G5? What is Black's idea? You're not hitting the H6 pawn. You can't go F3 anymore. Does he want to go E3? What is, what's going on with Bishop G5? Well, probably from a positional point of view, okay, I'm keeping a threat of E3. I'm making sure this is under attack. And most importantly, I'm not worried about C6. Why Magnus is not worried about C6? Only he can extend. Yeah, maybe this was the point then. This is this is what he was uh, hoping for. But I am not a big fan here. I think uh, White is getting a tremendous counter. Will he play King B8 or King B7? King B7, Rook C1 is a bit scary, no? It is. It, it is definitely scary. 
because all sorts of checks are coming now. I'm I'm, I'm not a uh, big fan of this uh, Bishop G5 move at all. Bishop G5, Knight F6, both of them feel, when you look at the position of the live board, it feels a little bit of an unnatural setup for the bishop and the knight moving away from the king. And also, you're not really threatening anything immediately. Yeah, exactly so. And uh, right now, I just... One, there could be one idea that white has, which is that black has, that Magnus might have in mind, is to go e3, knight e4 at some point. It looks very slow. And first question, what do you do with the king? What happens what after is, king b8? Yeah, king b8, okay, let's say I still play rook c1. How, where do you put b7. your queen? He goes queen b7. And he goes queen b7. So starts with queen So now b7. bishop c6. Bishop c6, you'll have to. So queen, queen, b, queen c6, your idea is to pin and win. Uh, got to move that queen. Can you move it to b6 perhaps? Oh, this looks so scary. So still hitting that bishop. Hopefully, we'll pick it up someday. Hitting that pawn yeah. in d4. Let's move the king to b8. Here. Yeah. And like e3. Move... This is what I wanted to say. That maybe his idea... But e3, rook b5 is... Yeah, so like every move is coming with a threat, yeah? That's what I do not like uh, about this position. All of this on the board, by the way. So bishop c6 played right now. Rook c1, bishop c6. And the question is, where does he want to move the queen? I kind of don't see a better move than... Queen b6. Yeah, queen b6, you have to... Or maybe, you have to play. is he considering queen a6? Looks very unnatural, but I don't know. Maybe queen a6? Ah, but queen a6, finally, I'll get my idea, Tanya. For all this time, I was desperately trying to make queen h4 work. What? Because after take, maybe some checks, maybe some discover check, <laughs> but it was not working. But once you play queen a6, I might actually consider playing this. But is it working? I have no idea, but it looks interesting. King Probably B7? it's not working. Yeah. Rook C7. Probably it's not working. King b6. Uh, what can I say? It feels so close, but who knows? Yeah. Queen h4 is a stunning move, though. At least it's fun, yeah? <laughs> and it's still not over because you have ideas like b5 and uh, picking up the a7 pawn. Yeah. Maybe okay, computers will love. He goes queen e7. He goes queen e7. But yeah, these, these are the moves. Okay, we should, we should keep in mind. Uh, who knows where it can work, yeah? Uh, rook c5? Again, giving threats. Okay, so rook c5, rook b5 is a real threat in the position. No time still to go e3. Or is that time to go e3? Can we just you try might that to, line? Can we try You might line? have to go to go e3 because uh, there's Can just no other way. Line? Yeah, e3, I'll give a check. King c8, because king c7, rook b7 is not something you want. And now it gets very messy because if I play this, you have... Yeah. He takes D2. Definitely going to take that position. Check here, check somewhere. Okay. And check here. So this does not work. Mm. Maybe Magnus just has everything under control and maybe there's Bishop G5, Knight F. It just feels wrong. I have to say, even if he does have everything under control and he's calculated this, this whole setup with Bishop G5, Knight F6, Queen E7, it, it doesn't feel right for Black. Oh. It cannot be. It just cannot be. I mean, feels uh, completely wrong. But I don't find out what is going on. So, by the way, oh, e three on the board. E three on the board. So things are getting things are getting interesting here. What is your threat, by the way? Ninety four is is an idea. So if I give a check, I have to go d seven. No, no other option because king c seven only invites rook c one check. Yeah. Now this king is so exposed. Yeah. I mean, I can move the bishop maybe. I ah, actually, I can. Can I actually take here? 95. Okay. Then I take again. And king somewhere. Mm, not sure what's going on. Here. Check. Yeah. Yeah. Feels wrong. 
this will be mate because after this i can even actually think about queen f3 mm -hmm. yeah very bishop, dangerous yeah bishop d5 threatening rook b7 would be would be over by the way, fe3 was played fe3 fe3 so is your idea still possible start with check on b4 yeah i would like to give this check give a check here and then play bishop into d5 Wait, that did not happen not, why were we not going with the king to e8 is there or oh, there's rook e5 in those lines mm -hmm. yes you he king e8 you mean no after yeah, the king was... on d5 i was thinking because but then there's rook e5 right, right. there's rook e5 yeah he went he traded on e3 and goes bishop e1 we are getting all this why okay, what about position? knight e4 what about knight e4 controlling that g3 square which would be there devastation. Is queen also we have to check uh, yeah. but how do i get to this yeah maybe i take but then if no i don't take then there'll be bishop f4 exactly i start with queen h2 this is so tricky okay queen d6 is an option is that an option or it probably fall no queen d6 i don't like it for some reason feels wrong yeah, it, it does feel wrong. That's, that's true. Like something should be hanging after queen takes d6. Yeah, yeah. Knight will have to fall back to d. By the way, knight e4 on the board. So we might be seeing what, what might happens. might be seeing queen h2, yeah. Okay, so queen h2. What is black's move after queen h2? Because you, you don't have a square with the king. It's hard to imagine that black will survive after king c8. I think there should be some mate in that position. Maybe bishop just simply also, bishop have... e8. Also, I have another question. Can I actually take this guy? How do you take? I want to say, I want to say queen, actually. Uh, don't ask me why. Because <laughs> I, I genuinely imagine. have no idea. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Um, it's so complex. Eh? It's very difficult to give a concrete I evaluation. Yeah, I'm just hoping that maybe queen h6 might be a check one day. Bishop f4, I still have. Rook d8 defense d5, but no concrete reason. By the way, queen h2, your move on the board, gangs. Queen h2 played. Okay, yeah. so let's find a line. King can't go to see it. Can we yeah. check what happens after queen? Queen c7 feels wrong as well, right? Because uh, you just you take, go bishop d5, bishop e4, maybe. No, that no, no, there is, there is, there is knight c5. Oh, there, it's not that simple. But you have rook here check and then bishop b7 check maybe. This is strong. And king d7, there's rook d5 check. King d7, there is rook d5. And take, take, I was thinking if black can create some, some kind of mess here, but uh, everything seems under control. Although I don't know what is, uh, how to evaluate this position. Uh, there will be probably queen e5. I mean, only white can be trying here with no rook f2 check, no knight, and that bishop on you dominating the e4 knight, queen h2. Can we take a look at queen d6 and see if black is surviving that? Yeah, I thought to keep it uh, simple by taking. Can I? And now the only move is knight d6. This one's easy. Yeah, and then I wanted to get here. Immediately or first take on f8? Uh... Either way, I'll get, no, if I take first, then, no, actually, this would be, uh, this could be a blunder, no? I am running into bishop f4. Or oh, this will backfire completely. But that can happen, aha. Uh -huh. The difference is that in the other line, after rook f1, king f1, rook f8, you will have king e2. Exactly, I would have king e2, and I will pick up this very important pawn. And actually, I might consider first picking up this pawn even. It will probably not matter. I can just take this and start collecting uh, more pawns. Magnus Carlsen down to a minute and a half. Ali Reza 25 seconds on, a, on the clock and an absolutely insane position on the board. But more trouble for Magnus than for Ali Reza here. Yeah, I think White's moves will flow now. And uh, Ali Reza looks so focused at this point. I mean, look at him. I, I always please. feel when Ali Reza is playing Magnus, you always see him with extra determination and extra motivation. Absolutely. Like he wants to win. He wants to win. He doesn't care who he's playing <laughs> against, but especially against Magnus, he's always uh, trying to find complicated ideas. And we always get a lot of excitement on the board. 
Absolutely so. So what is Magnus considering? There is there are basically two moves, yeah. King C. Am I saying this right? King C eight was played. Can somebody confirm? Are this Bishop D seven check wins a queen? I mean, Bishop yeah. anywhere Play. check, not. Okay, bishop d7, not bishop d7, because that would not win. Yeah, bishop d7, king e7, rook c7. It wins a queen. So Maybe Magnus... No, queen e5 is mate. Mate, mate in one. Mate. That's mate yeah. on the board. Yeah. That is it. That is game over. And Magnus in a bit of a shock there. But I think it was all over. Bishop d7, even if king d8, it was completely lost for black. And with that, we were just talking about Ali Reza coming in with extra motivation to face the world champion. He scores his win here. Yeah, and Magnus was in uh, huge trouble in both his black games. Yeah, he was also losing to Vidit. Yes, Thanks. and actually, actually, gangs, Ali Reza has had a fantastic start. He drew with A Wonder, he drew with Lavon, he drew with uh, Jordan Van Forest, and going into game four defeats the world champion. Yeah, fascinating. And what a game this was, right? It was an absolutely wild game, eventually coming on top. We'll come back to this. We've got live action on other boards. Can we Let's get an update on the on the Jan Christoph Duda game? Yeah, yeah, sure. I actually wanted to uh, jump also to Anish game because we haven't seen a single Anish game so far. He's just wow. been having very, very sober draws. I've been keeping an eye out on his games and his positions. And so far, it hasn't been... He, he hasn't been bringing in that excitement that we've been seeing in him this past year and a half. It's been pretty pretty uh, positional, strategic play by Anish so far in the event. And I think he's had three draws. Let me just confirm that. And yeah, he starts the event with three draws against Daniel, against Eric, and against Embriel. And what is the position that we have now? Uh... Black's last move was rook g5 to g2. <laughs> uh, let me just digest that. Okay, so the queen on h4 is hanging. Let's not forget that. Okay, so queen h4 was a blunder. Rook g5 or something else probably. And after queen h4, this was missed, yeah? Okay, so oh, what it's... is going on? Queen h8 check, you just... Queen h8 check, there is rook g8. And queen h6 check. Okay, we are one piece up, yeah? You just go king e7. And everything is under control. under control. And here he wants to take here. One hell of a tactics this is. And after queen takes d8, we take king g2. And now we can take here. I can also consider moves like, no, knight. What move do I play here? Do I play knight... Uh, I mean, knight, knight g6, g6? That still might be knight b7. Is that just, is the line over? Here, there is this you're saying, yeah? I thought rook b8 still. But then maybe you will take on c5. Maybe knight c6. Okay, none of that happened. And instead, after, can we just, uh, can we can we back up and see how we got to the live position? Because both players yeah, are playing just... the same. Just took and played c4. And what is the evaluation here, gang? We've got let's do a bit of a count. Let's let's get back let's to get basics back. here. So no material advantage. Am I counting it right? Yeah, that's five pawns each. But with its pieces, just feel a lot more active. But is that enough? Uh the biggest challenge in this position is Tanya. Look at the time. This is the only thing I'm seeing right now, to oh, be honest. Wow. That's a seven-minute advantage to Duda, who just continues shaking his head. Yeah, because uh, the position is, uh, after all, very easy for Black to play. It's equal pawns. We have uh, all pieces are very nicely placed for Black. It's so much easier for Black to play this position. So much easier, but is there any advantage that Black has? Is there a big threat right now? Uh, rook d5, it's a nice square for the rook. You kind of eye that knight on f5. You might want to jump over with your rook, attacking the pawns on the queen side at some point. Take on d3, rook c5. So king g3 played by Duda, coming in with her king to f4. 
And can you take advantage of this situation with the knight on f5 and the rook on d5 currently? Um, not sure exactly. So I don't see a... nothing, right? Oh, knight d3, yeah, knight d3, c d3. And rook f5, you just take on c4. Take, yeah. And rook c5? Mm. Even b3, actually, because this pawn is not going anywhere. I will have rook f1 and king is coming. Mm. Instead, right, cd3 like was played. Yeah, he trades on d3 with the pawn. And now knight d3, now knight, but this is a bit of a draw for now, no? Rook f5. Yeah, this is draw. This is draw, and now time will not really matter. Uh, if he wants to draw, there's a million ways here. Play king e7, play a5, uh, literally everything. Or play b5. I was about to say that b5, a5, b4. If you want to make a draw in this position, you'll you'll have lots of options to do so. All right, so this one looks like it's uh, going to end in a draw. The tactics have all fizzled out. And though with it is down to 30 seconds, the position has no problems at all. We'll call this one a draw. I was just going to say, let's take a look at the Anish endgame, but that has once again ended in a draw. That's four draws uh, by Anish so far. And where else? Can we take a look at the Daniel Naroditsky jordan Van Furest matchup? White has an extra pawn on B3. How winning is this, or is Black's activity with the rook on e4, king on d5 enough to hold the position? Uh, it's definitely enough to hold the position. This is too active, and most importantly, there is an outside pass pawn coming in. Uh, this I would consider as uh, completely wrong. Also, it's a knight pawn, and the king is uh, very close, so this is definitely drawing. Uh, I'm wondering why this rook g4 move was needed. Maybe just against rook a5, rook g5, picking up that pawn. So he just probably wants to, wants to keep that defended and go h4 next. So king to c6 and then play h4. Yeah, just eliminate these pawns and then everything is fine. King d6 and go h4 next. b4. Yeah. And how does and that how go after h4? Yeah, b4, h4, takes, takes, should be just dead. Mm. All right, and can we... Uh, so maybe he wants to play rook g6. One more interesting. We have one more interesting endgame. Uh, this one, I think we can once again say that... Um, you were mentioning rook g6, is that... And it's on the board. Does that give any chances? Uh, well, um, h4 maybe is not possible anymore. No, now we just, uh, there's no threat. So we just wait. Yeah, we wait with king c5. Can he actually get amb ambitious with a move like king e4, king f3, or is that too much? Uh, no, I, I mean, we would not want to do this, I think, because uh, there is outside past pawn, yeah? Mm. You want something yeah, like this, is... right? Yeah, but the b pawn is just too, but maybe h4 coming in and still not so clear. Okay, rook g6 on the board. Oh. Wait, 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 wait. What was the game? Did he miss rook g5 after king e5? Did he miss rook g5? Exactly, that was my point. Did he miss rook g5 or not? Oh my god. Yeah, because this will come in a check. Did he just miss rook g5? Wow. Move to move. It's win. The pawn is on h3. Unbelievable. Daniel Naroditsky win missing a win with rook g5 and that it reminds me of what happened to him against levon as well in that clutch moment gangs can uh, we just yeah. go back yeah. can we just go back to rook g6 can we just go back to rook g6 can you just tell us what happened here one more time yeah basically everything was drawing maybe something like king c5 just wait instead he decided we were actually checking king e4 instead maybe he... that's fine as well yeah, absolutely. Instead, king e5 happened, and now there was this direct opportunity to play rook takes g5 and win the game instantly. Unbelievable stuff. Because it all matters that, you know, when you take this pawn, when white queens, it comes with a check. But instead, b4 was played. Uh, now this is just a draw with uh, king c6. Daniel realized it after making the move. I don't think he realized that he missed this chance because otherwise 
we probably would have seen some reaction on the board. Yeah. King B7, and now this should be just a draw with the pawns traded off. Or is white still trying to get something here? Because the F2 pawn is still alive. If the F and the H pawn get traded, then it's a dead draw. But maybe white still has some chances here. Maybe we're writing off Daniel a bit too soon in this one. Mm, you mean something like this, yeah? That's the dream. But can you get it after king e3? Black gives a million checks. Yeah, but I could hide on uh, on G2 if I want to, yeah? Well, he starts uh, with F3. Suddenly, this looks winning to me. And now, now this will be a pure calculation, yeah? Takes, takes, rook H4, uh, who is coming faster? Rook B6 has to be uh, tried, I believe. But rook B6, rook H4, we are just cutting off and very important. There rook, is no B6, rook B6, the king pawn ending is lost, is drawn? Right. You know, king pawn end game is lost, yeah, for two reasons. One is king d4, the other is king f4 and king g5. No, I meant rook b6. Can't white just take on b6? Are you mean here, yeah? And play king f4. Yeah, but it is, I think white's in time, no? And just yeah, king here you are on time. Yeah, you are on time. Oh, it, it's on the board, by the way. Rook b6 played. Will Daniel go for rook b6 or will he just grab the h4 pawn and cut off black's king far away? But if rook b6 is just winning, then he might... Because I don't see a way for black to hold that. So rook b6, king b6, king f4. Yeah, it looks... looks he goes for uh, it. He goes for it. Just looks on the board. And Danny there celebrating. It's his... First win at the Meltwater Champions chess store after drawing with Anish, losing to a wonder. Draw Look at Danny's. That's a big win for him. Yeah, he's, he, he looks so happy, yeah? Yeah, because it's been a tough tournament. I mean, with Levon, he really deserved to win that game and then he messed it up. And there we see him with a fist pump. He's done it. He wins his first game. And it's been a good event so far. Despite missing that win against Levon, he drew with Anish. He drew with Lev. He lost to a wonder and now comes back, strikes back with a win against Jordan. A very happy Danny there on our screen. We have one more game going on. We do have another game going on with Shark against Artemiev. And what is going on here? So equal pawns, but I do have to say that I like Black's rooks way better than White's rooks. Definitely, definitely so. Also, even the bishop, yeah, it can come to d5, claiming that you cannot play e4. Still g4, uh, yeah, bishop d5 on the board. How do I play? King is stalemated. You have to play you can't play e4. I was going to say you have to play e4 to block that bishop and then you realize the g4 pawn will be hanging. So he repeats with rook f2, rook f1 and white will have to play rook f2 again. I am, I am amazed actually Shark is thinking here. So he is uh, thinking how he can win or what? Yeah, he's trying to repeat now. Um, it comes down Probably to a rook f1 black. check and now takes and play f5 maybe? He needs to take that call. He needs to take that call because if he goes rook c2, uh, the computer, the, it will be stopped at that very moment. The computer just stops the game. And now he's having a think, does he want to continue? So the line that you're saying is rook takes f1. No, he says he's he's Draw. bailing out. And with that, that's a threefold repetition. Wow. And that is it. That is it for our round four. Uh, let's take a look at our results from this very exciting round that we just witnessed. Uh, lots of turnarounds there. Daniel Naroditsky celebrating his win against Jordan uh, after missing that big chance he had against Lev in the previous game. But I think, gangs, the position, the moment of the round was Ali Reza giving mate to Magnus Carlsen with Queen E5 on the board. Abs 
absolutely uh, this was this was a spectacular moment and uh, yeah we we were a bit shocked with uh, this bishop g5 and allowing uh, uh, this queen side uh, attack right allowing the queen side attack yeah, and then him finding this move c6 at the right time, blowing open the position on the queen side. A really nicely played uh, game by Ali Reza in a very wild position out of the opening. And then Magnus just messing it up in the end. And uh, let's quickly have our standings up uh, that we saw on our screens one more time time and there we have it our Tammy gangs he's just so good in these formats we always see him up on the leaderboard and uh, let's not forget this is a very important event for Maxime Vachel Lagrave who is on the edge with his qualification through the tour standings he needs to qualify for the knockout stages to confirm his spot if he's knocked out before in the round robin stage then he doesn't make it to the finals. Right now, Artemiev and Levon leading the pack with three points, half a point behind them. Magnus, Wesley, Ali Reza, Shakriar Mamedarov, and with two points, a bunch of players on two. Uh, we are going to be back with the final round of the day. See you after this break. Want to raise your chest to a new level? Challenge Yourself is an exclusive, innovative experience designed for Chess24 Premium members. Train like a champ, with a unique set of lessons prepared by the coaches of the challengers. Boris Girlfriend and co. will help you improve your chess. Play a champ. Play a grandmaster each day in Banter Blitz. Take advantage of this incredible opportunity from June 10th. Go Premium and challenge yourself. Air quality isn't the first thing that comes to mind when you think about chess and esports, but it affects our focus, decision making, health, sleep, and more. What's in the air you breathe? Find out with Air Things. Breathe better, live better. I'm ahead of the game. Up my rocker, but follow me. I'm ahead of the game. I'm ahead of the game. I'm only ever slinging and working overtime. Got the song and I'm the singer, the melody, the vibe. I'm a prodigy, logically, I'm impossibly wanted. Then they'll remember my name. this question okay yeah this one i remember okay. this one i think i have seen but uh, I, I don't seen, remember uh yeah just the analysis i will be uh, more curious the game you i'm pretty sure you have seen the game yeah i remember it okay put it in chat how do you know all the positions yeah okay so <laughs> completely ruining the fun yeah <laughs> you guys know this position yeah, Mamedia Rao. Oh, okay. What do I do with you? <laughs> to say is that when you play versus the opponent who has only one opening, it's a uh, like rather. I think it's rather you uh, really prepare some strong idea in the line where they play, like you are preparing against something yeah, what they played in their games, and then you prepare some strong idea. 
Uh, or you choose something different where it's like both of you are not in this theory. Uh, just maybe some sideline or, or whatever, uh, where she doesn't have so many games. So let's take someone with a random, with a random account, with a random name that just seems attractive. Play live online against the world's top chess players while they stream their thoughts live. As a Chess24 Premium member, seize the chance to have your moment of fame. Get a peek inside their lives with question and answer sessions, in-depth teaching, analysis and interviews. The Champions Chess Tour, with countless accompanying events, is happening now. Tune in on Chess24. Watch chess tournaments online? Don't just watch. Go to Chess24 and make it an interactive learning experience. You get live commentary in multiple languages, including different streams in English from beginner to expert. It's not just commentary, since there's also an interactive live board. Choose your game and try out your own moves. All moves by the players get near instant cloud analysis from the latest chess engine, which will also analyze any move made by a premium user. Open the tab Opening Tree. It contains a database of half a billion positions from historical games. Has the current position ever occurred before? What did the best players play? The database tab lets you search full games and load them on the interactive board. There are many more tools for chess learners and experts. Come to Chess24 to watch all the online and over... Welcome back everyone as we are about to lift off the final game of day one of the preliminaries. And this is the moment that I think is the picture perfect moment of the day when it comes to the position that we have on the board. Magnus is king, mated on e6, queen e5 check, but not just this. The entire game, the way Ali Reza played, blew my mind, gangs. Absolutely. Um, do you want to go through this one quickly, at least uh, the last few moves or something? Sure, we can just take a quick look at what happened and how, because it, it, it felt as if White also had play on the king side, but I think Queen H2 is where we should start. Right, so it was here, yeah? King C8, yeah, it felt uh, like a blunder, but at this point already we were discussing, yeah? Black is struggling. We check the variation Queen D6, and a simple move like we take on D6, let's say, forcing to take on D6. And just, uh, no, we didn't want this, sorry. We didn't want this because of Bishop F4, but we said to play Bishop F4, Bishop G3 at this point, stopping Bishop F4, and after Rook F1, King F1, we mentioned that this end game could be extremely difficult uh, for black Magnus. hold. Yeah. Mm. So what was the move actually? I, I have no idea. Uh, also, 90s? I think it was very impressive just the way in playing on seconds. Ali Reza was down to seconds and he took on e3 and found this move queen h2 check. Yeah, yeah. Queen h2 was uh, aesthetically very pleasing. Absolutely. And then after Queen H2, it looks like Black is in trouble already. Uh, maybe it was this whole thing that we were talking about, Bishop G5, Knight F6, this whole plan felt wrong from the start. Absolutely. I mean, at this point, uh, it felt uh, Black is in complete control. And I, even now, I st still like the move King B8. You know, just get away from all these things. It will take so much time for uh, White to actually open up the position. Think about this. Let's say you play a move like rook c1. I can even play knight f6. c6, I'll play b6. Yeah, I, I think it all went wrong for Magnus when he went bishop g5, knight f6, and Ali Reza up to the task of making the most of it. We've got one more game remaining. Let's quickly bring up our pairings for the final round of the day. And here we have it, Artemia, who is on fire. He is currently leading the preliminary stakes on Jan Fristov Duda. 
who has been having a bit of an up and down day. He drew his last game with with it. Anish, who's been super solid so far with four draws, takes on Shakriar Mamedyarov. A wonder. I think it's been an impressive de- debut for the American Grandmaster. Is up against Len- Lenia Dominguez and Levon against Maxime. That is going to be a thrilling matchup. Jordan takes on Eric. I think it's for Jordan. It's been a disappointing start on day one. Magnus against Daniel. Uh, Magnus, after a tough loss against Ali Reza, will he bounce back against Daniel, who almost beat Aronian and then went on to win the next game? Wesley So takes on Ali Reza with it against Liam. We already do have liftoff on our boards. And the first game that I want to jump to is Magnus Carlson against Daniel Naroditsky, because I see Magnus has just made the move. Queen to G4. Yeah, uh, we got Karokan advanced. Queen G4 is uh, definitely one of the one of the move. Although the main uh, main re- main response still remains uh, Knight F3. I believe both players are prepared at this point. Uh, White is mainly trying to fix the bishop. And Black says, you know, you fix the bishop. Now I want to go for your pawns and try to say that your queen is misplaced. Knight f3 as expected. So here the question is, do we want to take here or we want to harass the queen further? How would you continue, Tanya? So, yeah, uh, at this point, um, also there is a move queen c7 <clears throat> attacking on uh, e5. It's interesting to see uh, <clears throat> what direction uh, Daniel would go for. Probably, yeah, he, he takes on c5, which makes a lot of sense. Um, not, not going for this e5 pawn. But still, there is an uh, issue with the f8 bishop. By playing knight c5, black says, you know, I'm taking away a very important square. And you don't want to really develop your bishop on e2. So I'm thinking for uh, moves like uh, maybe knight c3, maybe bishop e3. Just delaying bishop e2 uh, for a while. Very interesting. And and after queen g4, after Magnus went queen g4, we saw Dani taking a little bit of a thing, slowing down there, eventually taking this call of picking up the c5 pawn with the knight. And now it was Magnus who slowed down, uh, goes for the move bishop e2. So still asking this question that you're mentioning, that how are you going to develop your king side? We will see how Danny does that. Do you want to take a quick opening tour? Because we've got interesting, interesting action all through. And I want to get an update from you gangs on the board. Lavon Aronian versus Maxime Vashiel Lagrave. What do we have here? Lavon's taken a little bit of time. We've always seen him up on the clock, but he's taken about three minutes in the opening. Maxime playing super fast. And now knight d4 hits the queen. Let's take it from the top. Yeah, we got uh, Grunfin, knight e5. It's pretty thematic uh, to play knight g4. We usually get this also with short castle included, but this is without short castle. And um, yeah, to be honest, I'm not, uh, at this point, I'm not up to date what is the latest theory uh, going on here. But um, just looking at the position, it feels uh, that white is still uh, pressing. Black has one problem to solve that is uh, not that, yeah, the bishop on c8. While white's bishops are definitely nicely placed, knight d4, and black tries to solve the problem by sacrificing a pawn on b7, which of course we don't want to take. We don't want to allow rook, b, rook b8, and um, which is hitting on the b2 pawn. So rook a d1 instead. That's now, a lot of pieces on the D file. That's uh, the rook on D1 is pinning that knight, pinning that bishop. Uh, that looks like it could be trouble if black isn't careful. 
Yeah, so the first move that comes in mind is uh, Rook C8. Rook C8. Basically, that's the first and the last move comes in mind. <laughs> Rook C8. Okay, I'll move the queen. Actually, how do you protect this guy? Maybe A5. Maybe you keep hitting that queen. Start collecting material, and then you want Rook B8 or what? Rook B8 and is. Yeah, because I don't see rook c3, knight e2 ever working. So if that's not an option, rook b8, queen e4. No, this looks... Uh, this looks wrong. This, this looks, looks like wrong. things have gone wrong. But do I go knight f5? But then there is queen to b7. Queen c4, rook c8, queen b4. Played and knight f5, as you're mentioning, hitting that bishop on h6. Queen to b7, maybe rook c7 is the point. Yeah, queen b7, rook c7 is definitely the point. And queen e4, uh, if you just, is the line over? Uh, queen e4, you take bishop, bishop c3. Bishop c3, yeah. Yeah. Actually, how is bishop g5? Uh, at least black isn't losing material. So you just, let's see what happens if you take on g5. Take here. I don't like black's position at all. Hmm. Oh, bishop g5 on the board. Bishop g5, queen g5 played, rook d7. And now, as you're mentioning, all those pawns attack b7 and a7. Not very easy for Maxim here. Levon looking relaxed. Levon looking chill. We can say that Levon mm. is the winner of the opening battle in this one. Let's move on and take a look at some of the other uh, matchups that we've got. Can we jump to the Wesley Ali Reza board? Wesley storming down on the queen side with his pawns. Black eyeing that f4 square with his knight. What is going on here? Well, until here it was uh, theory for sure. I don't remember seeing dc4, but uh, d4 I have seen. This comes from Italian, yeah, with rook e8 and bishop e6. Now, the the plan with uh, castle rook e8, bishop e6, sorry, uh, castle rook e8 and bishop e6. It can happen with uh, inclusion of bishop a7, h6 in all sorts of permutation combination that is possible to imagine. Now, in the game, black included everything and then played bishop e6. Uh, he could have also done this without h6, without bishop a, uh, a7. There are like million transposition there. But bishop e6 takes, takes b4, uh, very standard theory. We also get this with the knight on d2, where white plays queen uh, c2, but here it's with the knight on f1, d5. Uh, uh, so right now giving d takes e4 threat, so queen c2 is also a very natural move. Uh, I have caught this position a number of times with the knight on d2, when there is knight b3, knight c5 ideas also that, uh, that works. Queen d7, we are back to again uh, uh, one of the main lines. I don't know how many games have been played, but this is, uh, you know, one of the most thematic positions. There are there are so many ideas at this point for both sides. Uh, yeah, there, there, there is a5, there is c4, there are uh, some g3 ideas. And I mainly saw uh, d4 and I d5 uh, plans. So d takes c4 is somewhat new to me. Uh, I would pick uh, white here. The main reason is uh, these knights actually do not do much. At some point, uh, white plays g3. Not now, obviously. This is under attack. And then this knight uh, on uh, on g6 kind of remains passive. Very interesting that you mentioned that you think white is doing well here because even if the knight does jump on f4, the knight on e3 keeps everything defended and in control while the pawns are really quite advanced. Lots of space for white. Rook D1 continues with development. Now, you picked white. Let's take a look at gangs. What aim chess stats have to say about these two players and who is a favorite in this one? Well, in the opening phase, Wesley so with a clear 100% opening accuracy. Not so. And, of course, Ali Reza also at 99%. Uh, almost equal advantage capitalization. So, both players very good at converting their advantage. Resourcefulness also very, very similar. Accuracy, I do see a little difference here where Wesley's accuracy is, is, is higher 
than Ali Reza's accuracy. Time management, we've seen Wesley always up on the clock, while Ali Reza does struggle on the clock. And I think in this game, it will come down to that as well. Ali Reza will have to keep the time management. Uh, he'll, have to he'll have to take control of the clock situation. Otherwise, this is what our stats have to say. Both players pretty much equal there. We see a lot of decisive games. Lot of decisive games from Ali Reza at 60% and Wesley with his Berlin draws at 42%. Tanya, I was just uh, looking at this position and uh, looks like there was an opportunity. After Queen C6, this was possible somehow. Oh, wow. Cannot take. I mean, initially I saw this move, but I rejected because of Queen E4. But. Uh, uh, knight D5 is your. Yeah, idea. there is there is knight D5. Yeah. I don't, I don't that, stay away. That's a very nasty double attack. Hitting that knight on E4 and that pawn on C7. And if knight takes C5, it just doesn't feel like it's going to be enough. Yeah, because uh, I'll pick up the exchange. Probably this pawn will be falling so b5 uh, and also yeah. a takes b5 is impossible because after a b5 a b5 you hit the queen you hit the rook on a8 so watch out yeah and then at this point we are just uh, completely dominating at some point you know we just uh, maybe we can knight d5 take. as well you can just cruise through with knight d5 yeah. you can take on a8 or even before that b5 exactly. that might have been a bit of a missed opportunity there he did play b5 but under different circumstances i hear yeah very interesting. So what happens if I, let's say, take, take, that's on the board. Uh, now my problem is I cannot protect both the pawns. So now uh, he will take on c5 and aim for the c pawn. I would desperately try to play c6 here if I can. But uh, I'll also be petrified for something like this. Mm not a big fan so queen takes c5 so currently you're loving white's position uh yes i do all right so ali reza will he be able to create and be tricky and that's something that ali reza often does we'll find oh, that mean oh knight f4 tanya speaking of being tricky <laughs> knight f4 so rookie five you want to jump in knight d3 was was that again another missed opportunity or or I'm blundering somewhere. No, looks like I'm not. Wait, is queen d5 a move? I'll go completely queen mad now. Queen no. takes d5 and no, rook e5? There's rook in d5. There is rook e5. Yeah, there is rook e5. So that's not working. So yeah, knight f4, what you would have played? Rook somewhere? Yeah, but then so, there's also rook g6 stuff. I mean, if you're forcing the yeah. rook to go back to d1, that's success already. Yeah, absolutely. So... Well, maybe All we right. can, a tad can confirm if knight f4 was a missed opportunity by Ali Reza. We have this position that we do on our live board. Uh, Queen e3, all pawns have been traded off. It's only on the king side that we've got pawns left. I'll have to say, looking at this position... King h1 has be... to be played. <laughs> you have to play king h1. Come on, have some aesthetic beauty. You have to play king h1 here just for, just for fun. Yeah. <laughs> That's every square on the diagonal having a piece. But that aside, can we say that Black has shouldn't have any problems keeping this position under control? Totally, totally agree. All right, let's move on then. Let's take a look at some of the other boards. What is the update on the Vidit Ale Kwang Liam game? Vidit uh, coming in with H4. Well, it's Vidit, yeah. There, got him. Hmm. H4 is nice controlling the g5 square black should try to get d5 as quickly as possible and this is the first move that comes in mind what can i play d5 or not i believe he wants to play knight g4 mm -hmm. because take you can still take knight g4 is a bit of a threat in the position yeah I, I really want to get, uh, if I could get g6, h5, it would be possible. But here, there is a square you have available. Queen e3. I was just saying, the way you can get it is if white plays rook e3 here. Yeah, true, true. <laughs> just a little bit of help from friends. 
a5 on the board so that's another way to break open the position and trying to get some counter play on the queen side so ab4 is a threat uh, and probably white doesn't have time to go knight g4 immediately because of a takes b4 bishop b3 was played like in instantly yeah like in a couple of seconds mm. So white is sort of provoking black to make the move a4, after which all counterplay on the queen side will be dead. You'll be a happy camper after a move like a4. You probably even just fall back with the bishop. You have all the play on the king side. Yeah. Uh, actually, this bishop would be so much better here. But then, let's say, let's say I try to get the bishop there. But then I'm also inviting some sort of king side. Uh, attack no but why does it have so many pieces i mean knight h6 g8 6 queen h6 it, it feels like you only have a queen and suddenly this g3 h4 pawn coming in the way of rook e3 rook g3 ideas yeah i mean not immediately but let's say slowly so let's bishop, continue bishop b6 now still bringing some more pieces maybe here or actually I don't know where should I put. So bishop e7 played on the board. He decided to go with the bishop to e7. Probably also trying to get in bishop f8 g6 ideas. If white allows. Absolutely. Without a doubt. But yeah, knight g4 uh, still I would like to play. Make sure there is no g6 happening. So now you want bishop f8, yeah? Yes, bishop f8. And maybe g6 is a threat now. g6, knight h6, king h7 could be a threat, no? It, it looks like a threat. It uh, definitely looks like a threat. So how do I respond to that? Do I play queen f5? Uh, maybe just knight to e3. Be positional. And then get uh, get your pieces. Wow. But even there, I don't like this knight on d2. Knight g4 on the board, by the way. Knight g4 on the board. All right, this one is going to be a long strategic fight. We will come back to this. Crazy stuff going on in the A Wonder Lenia game. Can we just jump to that? A Wonder throughout the event has been playing such combative, aggressive chess. Absolutely fearless play there. Uh, and this game is no different from what he's been bringing on the board. And currently, he won. A, he drew with Ali Reza in the first game. He beat Daniel Naroditsky, then went down to Eric and Maxime Vashel Lagraf. And what is this position? What is our evaluation of uh, what's on the board? Well, my first thing would be, can I actually take it? Something like this, but probably not. Your king is... Uh... But maybe take with the rook, but, no gangs, because then you're threatening rook g6 and the knight. Does that help? Uh, yeah, this I started to think, but knight h4, I was not 100% sure how I'm uh, mm. dealing with. Like queen no, h5, I saw, and then queen g5. Or bishop g5, queen <laughs> or bishop g5, g5 as well, yeah. Yeah. Maybe this whole thing doesn't work because I'm not seeing enough counter here. So, yeah, uh, just move the knight somewhere. Actually, knight d5 happened on the game and knight h4 knight d so yeah this looks so much better you're just taking the pawn there is very little white can do here has white over pushed on the quick on the king side then if you're not creating any threats or breaking open then you'll just end up losing these pawns i mean you would win this position if you can play bishop e4 but that is unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately not legal I don't see a way of actually defending the f5 pawn. You can't go f6. Black will simply capture that pawn on f6. What happens after f6? Can we take a look at that gf6, gf6, rook g8 coming in? Yeah, I don't believe that. Yeah. Also, there is no g6. I think the main main problem in the position is white is playing one piece down. Hmm. Uh, this is a very long term. Yeah. Think about this. How this bishop is going to come to the game anytime ever? Just do not uh, see this thing happening at all. Only if this was a white color bishop, yeah? And we've got e5, d4, c3 completely taking away all the squares and dominating the position. All right, it looks like a wonder is in a bit of a trouble here. 
Uh, yeah. We'll see if he manages to create his chances. Let's take a look at, let's get the update on the Magnus game. We saw the Carol with Queen G4, an interesting opening choice by Magnus there, which put Daniel in a bit of a think. What is the current position? And Black is still not castled. King. King is the issue. The king cannot go this side thanks to h5. I am whenever I'm looking at the position, I want to make these illegal moves like h h5 <laughs> to h7. Oh, castle. What about queen h5? I have absolutely no idea, Tanya. What about queen h5? Queen takes b2. Yeah, this has to be the only justification. Hmm. And then let's. Yeah, not that easy maybe because how do you come in with your rook? Rook h4 is not possible right now. I really want to get a piece on the h line. Probably okay, so let's move play. the knight. Let's move the knight. What happens after knight e2? Knight e2 on the board? Uh, if knight e2 here? I would, I would resign. <laughs> No, wait, I can play probably rook f d8 because there is can back rank. Can you play? Is there back rank stuff? Hmm. There is back rank. So queen h5 picked up. No, no, no. Knight, knight e2 is not... You don't want to play knight e2. You want to play rook g4. All right. Rook g4. You want to play rook g4, especially if it's not your game. Uh, in this case, actually, I would play in my game also. That is true. So game. let's take a look at what's your idea, gangs. What happens after queen c3 if black gets greedy? How do you checkmate? Uh, there is bishop h6, but right now I'm really getting... Uh, tempted. Uh, yeah, tempted to play Rook this. Rook g4 on the board, by the way. Here, now it's mate. And after king, here, at least if I don't want to calculate, I have bishop d2. Wow. Rook G4. And it was Shakriar who missed the move Rook G7, but Magnus is not going to miss Rook G7 in this position. Yeah. Rook G4. Is this all over for Daniel already? Can he fight this threat of Rook G7 Bishop F8 check? I mean... A Bishop, F, a Bishop H6 check. I, with this kind of coordination and when all the pieces are there, you, it's just intuition tells it's just over. There cannot be any defense. G6, black even, maybe? Black doesn't even have an extra pawn for all of this. Okay, so G6, let's take a look. I would like to take here, actually. Ah, no, no, no. Or maybe I will, actually. Why not? And then decide whether I want to allow Queen F to check King F on win. Or, sorry, not that, of course. Or do I, do I mate like this? How Somewhere do you after King H8? <laughs> I, have, I have absolutely no idea. If you're I not probably don't. after King H8, Queen F7, and it's I will. Evening, yeah? Somehow, yeah. Yeah, I don't believe that the king can survive after Queen C3. I don't but, believe it, but maybe there's no option but to go for it. Yeah, but one thing I know that uh, Queen and Bishop like this, uh, it's the worst possible combination. So probably there is no mate at this point. I mean, oh, no direct you, can match. Can you tell us a bit about that? What do you mean it's the worst possible combination? Uh, have an empty board in mind. And uh, imagine, uh, uh, let's say this king on g1, okay? Yeah. And uh, let's say black has a queen on f4. And uh, sorry, queen on f3 and bishop on f4. You cannot give check, checkmate. It is like mm. as close as you can get. But uh, with uh, here we cannot uh, mate. Mm. Now imagine there's queen on f3 and f4 is a knight. If that is a knight, you put knight in any of this position, it is actually check, checkmate. <laughs> but with queen and bishop, you know, being so close, it's still not a mate. Oh. So okay, by the so way, g6, 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 g6 on, on the board. board. We're going to see, we're going to see a blow up. We're going to see some sacrifice. Rook g6 or bishop c5. Is there a direct line here? I, I really, I mean, if this... This has to work. But he doesn't go for it. He goes bishop h6. I'm a little surprised with that choice. And Magnus did not think a lot before making this move. And bishop e8, what is happening here? Well, I, I saw uh, Magnus' uh, amazing video on chess 24 uh, where he says attack without sacrifices. Yeah, so he, he's actually doing that. He's still yeah. continuing the same series. 
And the rook can't run. The rook can't run because rook g6, this bishop and queen would mate after rook, rook anywhere, rook g6, H, fg6, queen g6. Oh, finally, he sacrifices. <laughs> finally, yeah. Takes, oh, he wants to beautiful. take. Maybe you can start with rook g6. And take and now give check, yeah? And take on g6 and... Two. No. This... Bishop f8? Oh, that's gh5. I completely yeah, forgot yeah. the queen is hanging. Yeah, yeah. No, wait, you can start with uh, bishop d5. Okay, you're moving h7. I don't like this attacking uh, <laughs> idea. I mean, it just felt a bit slower. I mean, I'm still winning. I am pretty sure it's still winning. But... Uh, Knight d5, it's very pretty. He takes on d5. Bishop d5 will happen without a doubt. Bishop d5 and hitting that pawn on g6. The rook only way to... Rook a6, you just take rook g6, right? Rook That's G6. over. Yeah, yeah. And knight e6, I take and I take here. That is mate. That is definitely mate. So king h7 and then I kind of have to play queen h3. I don't see what else can I do. Magnus thinking now a little bit and looking a little surprised. Did he miss something? Because he's shaking his head. Did he miss? You know, it's he's not happy. And maybe he just missed this idea that after rook g6, f g6, bishop d5, king h7, the queen on h5 is hanging. It's not made after bishop f8. No, but why is he why is he under panic? Bishop d5 is just uh, I don't see a way to save. Okay, let's when take a play? look. So king h king h8. Or king h7, doesn't matter. Yeah, bishop d5 played on the board after a bit of a head shake. Daniel Naroditsky, not looking happy at all. Why is Magnus throwing his hands in the air? What is going on? Gangs, are we missing something? No, I believe you pointed out right. He he probably thought uh, this is just mate. Mm, that is check, check, mate, but it wasn't. Yeah, and also this... It has to be that, yeah, because otherwise you don't uh, end up playing bishop h6. Uh, sorry, you don't end up playing bishop h6. You just take and take on g6 and give mate. I am, I'm absolutely sure this has to be winning. There's just, uh, there's just no question about that. Hmm. Uh, but uh, yeah, in the game, um... hmm. I think you're right. And now Magnus looking a bit more calm and composed. We saw him um, getting his composure back which means that bishop d5, he still realizes that it's still winning for him. King h7, queen h3 on the board. And this looks like black is finally busted. It is. Queen c2 is the move that comes to mind. But the problem is even the move like rook c1, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't see a direct mate here, though. Is there a mate? Probably not, no? But you can play rook c1, queen f5, and then just win material. Hmm. All right, Daniel, down to about a minute on the clock. So what's the line after queen c2 or queen e2? Does that make any difference? A queen e2 is very interesting also. I would play At bishop least... f3. Hmm, bishop f3. Bishop f3. Is there some ideas like queen e5, queen h5? You just win a lot of material, yeah? Yeah, I just want to now win the game. I don't want to mate anymore. By the <laughs> way, rook h8 was played. Ah, now, finally, Magnus gives a mate. Beautiful mate. Very pretty. King g8, right. rook g6, and queen h8. That is a nice uh, comeback, is... mate. After getting mated with the king on e6 yeah. with queen e5, Magnus delivering the mate this time. That's just the yeah. kind of win you need uh, after the loss you've just had. Yeah, exactly. So uh, what game should we uh, look at? Lots of action. I'm, I'm, I've got my eyes out on all the boards. Can we take a look at the Artemiev Duda board? Uh, it looks... Very interesting with black having a pawn on b3, white having a pawn on b5. But my feeling is that this has to be good for black if it's good for anyone. 
Hmm. It looks like uh, white is not doing bad either at this point. It should be uh, equal because I am seeing there is no entry. Like let's let's break it down. Yeah, b two is not happening because it's nicely controlled. This queen has to protect this knight. This knight has to protect the pawn uh, from going. And this pawn is not moving. So if at this point I ask black, what is your next move? Uh, is there a good answer? Uh, Duda is going to tell us very soon. E4, I don't know. Was it uh, necessary well, or queen not? Queen B6 at least now as an answer. Yeah, queen B6, then I take, take, and I just want to play king E3. No, then there's knight C4, B. oh, you don't and have knight C4, king D3. Yeah, and this is what I was. Uh, ah, this is even better. For. Yeah. Mm. Nice. But e4, don't like it uh, much because it, in a way, kind of exposes my king. I was hoping for some something else, some other moves. I don't know which four. Not sure what was the best possible way there. We do have um, we do have Daniel Naroditsky with us in our studio. Let's hear it from Kaya and Daniel. Played a phenomenal attacking game. I haven't played this line much, so I, I guess I figured I was doing fine. And then knight d4 um, surprised me. I think knight d4 was just is just a crushing move because without the knight on f5, uh, Black's position, uh, you know, it's like you know, it, it's like running on a treadmill that keeps getting faster and faster. So. Um, uh, of course, castling was really bad. I should have played g6, but my position was was terrible. I completely overlooked uh, rook g4. I was only focused on the fact that he couldn't play rook h4, and I figured knight d5 was, was amazing, so I thought that it's only fair to let him checkmate me. <laughs> I, that is that is a cool thing to do for for the sport. I think I don't think we actually have seen it like that. You're actually letting them uh, get to the checkmate. So so cool stuff there. And I want to ask you because uh, two draws, uh, one win today, and and also you had some tough matches. Geary was there, Aronian there, Magnus. Of course, how happy are you with your performance overall on on day one? Um, well, I, I don't know whether to be happy or sad. I I feel like I played well. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe save for the last game. I was better winning in, in all four of my games. Uh, game one was good. I was winning against the Wonder, but he, he played really, really nicely in, in time pressure, so it was a well-deserved win. Um, then I was beating Levon right out of the opening, and I, I got too excited. I played too quickly, and I completely blundered this uh, drawing idea. Um, you know, then, of course, against Jordan, it was a crazy time scramble. Um, at one point, I thought I botched it. I was really, really happy to at least win one game. So I'm satisfied. At least I don't have zero out of five. And, you know, this time control is pretty new for me. So um, hopefully by tomorrow, I'll make some adjustments and maybe start spending a little bit less time in the opening. Yeah. And what is your ambition in the tournament overall? Well, of course, qualifying would be nice. Um, I think people like Magnus and Wesley have something to say about that. Um, but overall, I'm, I'm playing the U.S. Championship in, in about... I guess a month from now. So this is really, really good practice. Uh, this is my first such tournament, so it's it's very nerve wracking. Uh, and I'm just trying to play every game for a win. I think it always sucks when when the lowest rated is just trying to squeeze draws out of people. Uh, it kills the fun. So I'm just trying to give everybody uh, an interesting game. Uh, and you know, it's been topsy turvy, but I'll continue doing that into tomorrow. Yeah, music to our ears, David. The, have you enjoyed following uh, Daniel today? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I know Daniel very well. Yeah, and always, always exciting games with you, right? How did you actually prepare for this tournament? Uh, I prepared with no, copious amounts on Netflix and uh, <laughs> <laughs> Amazon Prime Video. No, but I mean, I, I basically decided on on a couple of openings that I'm going to play. Um, it's quite impractical to try to predict what these guys are going to play. They play everything. Mm. You know, they're preparing for me. I'm not really preparing for them. Uh, <laughs> so my goal is just, you know, I'm playing the Kings Indian, uh, trying to prove that it can survive at the top level. I've been okay so far and just trying to keep a clear head, get a lot of sleep, all the, all the usual cliches. Yeah. Are, are you enjoying it, though, playing in this tournament with a bunch oh, of yeah. the top 10, top 20 players in the world? 
I'm having a blast. Um, of course, not when I draw winning positions. Uh, in the moment, it's it's emotional. But looking back, this is again, this is a great honor for me. Uh, and you know, let's be real. I, my chances to qualify are, are very very slim. But um, that doesn't mean I'm not going to give it my best. Uh, and this is amazing practice, as I said, for the U.S. Championship. And uh, if I can get a couple more, uh, you know, if I can bite a couple more times and, and ruin some people's tournaments, I'll be happy. <laughs> and Daniel, I know you've probably played most of these players online in Bullet and Blitz, mm -hmm. and you've probably got quite decent scores uh, against them. Do you have any predictions for how the tournament as a whole might go? Um, do you have any favorites for the event? Uh, what is Magnus on right now after beating me? Is he four to five? Uh, three, three and a half. Three and a half. Oh, yeah. three and a half. Did he? Oh, so he, he was drawing. Yeah, I think Magnus is very clearly the favorite. I think he beat Wesley. Um, I don't I don't know if anything insane is going to happen. I view my role, like I said, uh, perhaps Eric, not to put words in, in his mouth, but we're the sort of, uh, you know, we're, we're going to make the tournament interesting maybe with a couple of well-timed wins or draws. Uh, but I think realistically, Magnus is in phenomenal form. You know, I could just feel while playing him that this guy is like, he's on a completely another level. It's mm. insane. So I think he's back in business and I honestly would, would have to give him my, my vote. Mm. All right. And we know, of course, it's not too late over there in the U.S. So for the rest of the day, will it be like all about streaming and playing bullet for you now? Or are you just <laughs> staying away from that and preparing uh, for this tournament? More like the latter. You know, I'll, I'll take a look at the games. Um, I'll, um, you know, I'll obviously just relax, prepare for tomorrow. Uh, but after the tournament, I'm definitely going to celebrate with a lot of food and a lot of bullets. So but that'll have to wait until the, the main bracket is over. Fantastic. We're loving the entertainment you're bringing to the tournament, Daniel. Thank you for joining us. And good luck tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. All right. What a what a cool ending to the day for Daniel. Uh, well, for, for Magnus Carlsen, but it was a checkmate. Another applause from Daniel there. And we're going to jump into another game. In round five, Anish Giri is playing against Chakdiar Mamadiarov. And the bar is slightly over to Anish's side. Is it too early to call, though? It's too early to call, but for sure, it's easier playing white in this position. Such a great interview and uh, Daniel mentioning that he feels that Magnus is on another level, that he is absolutely back in business. I have to say, I didn't ever believe or think that Magnus was out of business, but definitely, uh, Gangs, the way he's played on day one of the preliminaries, the way he beat Wesley, uh, also this game, there was a little hiccup against Ali Reza, but I think Magnus is going to make life very difficult for his opponents uh, in this one. Nothing new there. Uh, yeah, agreed on that part, but uh, <clears throat> saying that Magnus is in the best form when he was, uh, yeah, when he got mated in one game and then uh, he was also lost, uh, almost lost against Vidit. Mm. And yet he is uh, still leading the tournament. It actually shows, you know, what kind of player he is. I mean, he's not in exactly, in my opinion, it is not the best shape, but still mm. he's leading the tournament, still he's killing. So it just we shows got his strength. Absolutely. He's finished the day with three and a half out of five. We've seen this narrative often with Magnus. He does take a lot of chances in this preliminaries part of the uh, of the event where he plays riskier chess, where he takes these more uh, dynamic decisions. Going to be interesting to see what happens on day two. But all the best to Daniel Naroditsky and Magnus. Uh, but right now we've got a lot of action on on the other boards. Can we get an update on the Anish Shark game? Or do you want to just quickly let's take a look at this one that we have? Um, yeah, this one, it is uh, uh, equal, of course, but um, I would still prefer to be black here uh, if this is the position I got. Like, trying to understand why I feel like that. Yeah, because of probably the knight position and the bishop position and also the rook. Mm -hmm. But having said that, this is essentially a draw. Hmm. But um, black is more equal than white. I don't even know if that is a sentence. I like it though. Black is more equal than white. It's <laughs> it's not equal plus. It's somewhere between equal and equal plus. Yeah. Uh, we'll see whether anything is made of this position or not. Let's get a quick update on the Anish Mamadiaro board. Anish down to about a minute on his clock. And he's had four draws so far. But this one, anything can happen in this position. How are we evaluating this? My first feeling is I kind of like white's pieces better here. That A5 pawn under attack. Uh, having this light squared bishop, which can't be challenged, doesn't Nish have some winning chances here? Yeah, uh, definitely. If uh, 
at this point uh, not only white has winning chances but also white is playing for two results mm. so for sure um, it is white who is uh, who will be pressing for long time but there are decisions has to be taken do you want to play e4 e5 he doesn't he says no he wants to go rook d1 he wants to go rook d1 so threatening to pick up a pawn immediately with bishop d5 it makes makes a lot of sense well it is a direct threat but can a black how can how can shark actually counter this idea because white also has a weakness in b2 he goes rook b5 i like this move as well i i just feel that he needs to watch out for this knight d6 check at some point that bishop moves away from d6 and a fork is incoming so what happens after a move like bishop a3 for example i have to stick to the same plan here yeah? to play bishop e7 or to play mm. uh, bishop to c7 I would really like my bishop on a4 at this point. Ah, see, uh, rook d2 was played. You Anish he preparing. Bishop d1, bishop a4 with your idea. I am 100% sure this is what he had in mind. Well, can he do it now? Because bishop d6 is not an option. So what happens after bishop d1 uh, with this deadly trick of bishop a4? Probably I'll be forced to play knight b6. I just don't see any other uh, alternative. Anish has got 10 seconds on the clock and he goes for rook d1. What? That shows a bit of uh, that something he's not feeling in this position, no? Yeah, it feels completely wrong. Actually, I don't even understand why rook d1 I, I think it was, was a 10 played. seconds on the clock. But then you play h4 or anything, yeah? Like why why you do play rook d2 rook d1? and shock thinking now he's down to 30 seconds he's not going to play bishop d8 that's for sure <laughs> he's not going to play bishop d8 but he needs to make a move you can't take on d6 you can't move the rook from b5 because the d5 is a uh, knight is hanging maybe not so easy for black to come up with a move does he c b4 uh, that's on the board knight b4 played as you're mentioning looks like black um... actually just couple of moves before it looked more scary yeah this is uh this is strange really wrong. No? i mean because this is the position we had uh, at this point yeah the last five moves that anish had was rook d1 rook d2 rook d1 rook a1 and now finally yeah. bishop comes to d1 your idea knight b6 by the way talking about bishop d1 if i had played bishop d1 at this point there was no knight b6 eh? because of the a5 probably, pawn probably here it was much uh, stronger clear no because you take and you go knight c4 bishop a4 actually yeah let's just that's that's that. actually knight that's a actually mate yeah let's just wow. show that rook a5 and knight c4 runs into bishop a4 yeah some sort of uh, yeah you have to give material yeah so rook d1 Hmm. And Bishop has again. three back. Something is not right, Anish. I think he's. It looks like he wants to bail out, or not. Oh, he doesn't repeat continue. for the third time. Tricky, Anish. Yeah. Uh. But I I don't see any progress has been made now. Rook takes. Uh, oh, Rook B two. Do I have Bishop A one? Rook B two, Bishop A four. So King D seven. Yeah, it's a draw now. Takes takes rook takes b two and that's it. Yeah. Hmm. But uh, gangs, one got the feeling with those last couple of moves that Anish made, putting that rook from a one to d one, then from d one to d two, and then back to d one. Can we just take a look at this little rook dance that we witnessed? Yes, yeah, so it started here. Probably, if he wanted to do bishop d one, this was uh, somehow the right moment. He played rook d one. Rook b five, uh, rook d two. At this point, I really felt he wants to play bishop to d one. And uh, after bishop e seven, here he did not want to play bishop d one, probably because of knight b six. And then again, rook d one, rook a one. It felt so wrong somehow. And then again, bishop f three, uh, bishop d one, bishop f three. And then he decides not to repeat. 
but yeah uh, clearly he missed his uh, chance his chance and that moment also down to second it's so difficult to grasp that moment when you're playing on 10 seconds on the clock uh, it's never an easy situation and with that they finally repeat and this ends in a draw a very interesting end game in the jordan eric hansen board and i want to take you there uh, gangs and ask you what is going on here white has got a bishop black has got three pawns one of them on d3 but king e3 there's rook d4 or is there rook d4 what is uh, rook uh, oh rook d4 there was king d4 here rook h6 check Oh, that's super nice. Can we just see that line? And rook h6, king h6, bishop f4 would win. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm coming rook h1. And here takes... And it's very important that... But wait, uh, rook d4 happened. He didn't take king d4. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. He didn't take king d4. It was winning. Oh, wow. He missed uh, rook h6. That is incredible. And now what is happening after? But still, it feels like white should be doing well after this pawn has gone to f4. How are you defending the d3 pawn anyway that's going to fall? The d5 pawn, one by one, all these pawns are going to fall. Your, your, our best bet for oh, this pawn. That's unexpected. I was hoping he'll go for this pawn at least. Because this pawn will be controlled all the time. So now if I take rook d5, maybe he wants rook f4. This is his point. Uh, that is not being allowed. So now try to push this pawn maybe. Takes h3. But just... Rook a2. Yeah, rook a2 and he will pick up. Actually, uh, not rook a2. There was also after h3, he could play king d2 and then rook h3. King g6. I like king g6 actually. It is trying to get to f5. It makes a lot of sense. But it's a Ru whole piece, no? It's a whole piece uh, with True. The bishop on e5. True, and you're also not going to allow this um, this king to enter. So after king f5, you just cut off and then play rook g5 and then slowly start collecting pawns one by one. This looks like lost. All right, this does look like Eric Hansen is busted in this one. What is the update on the Vidit Liam game that we have? I see that Vidit lost an exchange. This, I. But he has picked up these pawns. What's going on here? Does he have a chance? Because I, if one gets the feeling that black is eventually going to pick up the g6 pawn. Yeah. I mean, there's rook h6 coming next. Actually, main problem is these two pawns are fixed. Oh, this is... Uh, uh, Vidit wants knight h4, knight f5, and pawn on h6, and try to hold this position. And with it shaking his head there, something went very wrong for with it because we thought he was doing fine out of the opening. And even if you get knight to f5 in those lines, can black actually go king f7, king g6 and give up that exchange? Uh, absolutely. And at this point, yeah, rook h3, check. King f7, king f7 h6, and king, king g6, g6 and give up your rook and well, win that uh, king pawn endgame. This, I won't be 100% sure if I have uh, my king on h4. Can we take a look at this line? Because uh, it's quite... A, so he goes knight g3, he doesn't allow it. And maybe the point was also, gangs, that there was this idea of going rook h5, rook f5. True. And I think that was probably uh, clearer. Yeah, that, that, that was for sure. That? Can we just show yeah. that on our board? Yeah, so h6, you play king g6. And after this... Actually, at this point, maybe you can take, but definitely rook h5 is so much... Uh, Cleaner. Not sure. <laughs> no, this has to be, no? It should be, yeah, somehow. Just just push the pawn, maybe. How? No, you cannot. <laughs> okay, go king g7. Oh, but this... This has why, to be. Why do you give me this kind of endgames? Yeah, it is, it is winning. It's winning, but none of that happened. What we do have is, well, with it decided not to give that chance, holding on to that H pawn with knight to G3. Oh, this is just dead lost. King comes to G5 and at some point, uh, rook G4. Uh, yeah, this is completely lost. But how did this happen? We saw this position, no? You remember, we saw this position and I was saying I would rather be black here. 
because of the fees placement. But it did look like you you mentioned it's more equal for black than it is for white. But we thought that it, it can't be all that bad. It can't be that difficult for white. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. I would have probably taken this and played rook d two, uh, king g two. I can't imagine uh, losing this because okay, I have knight and it's uh, only we are playing only on one side, so the knight should be able to hold. But here suddenly pieces are coming. And guys, this is what you were mentioning. Simply because of the piece activity that Black had, that there were some dangers involved, and now no. it's real. Now this is oh no, wow! Wait. How did he wait? What happened? There is no way White is worse at this point. How did he lose? I mean, you piece can play here? G four. He could. He could just play G four. Okay, this no, is also it's fine. Blundered, yeah, somewhere he, he it has, it to, has be to be. It has to be a blunder. There's, uh, first of all, this is a blunder. So that's okay. the first blunder. Yeah, you could just play King F one. Wow. So, ah, wait. Take his King F two. So he's still. But why? King F two ah, actually traps the rook. Now it's Duke Zhuang. But what about but Bishop H three? Bishop H three exactly. No, why not Bishop H three. Rook G three, Rook H three, and Rook F three. Yeah, yeah. Ah, so this is some kind of a Zug Zhuang. Hmm. And maybe this is what Vidit missed when he calculated this entire line. We will come back to this. We've got a niche in our studio, so let's head over to Oslo. Yeah, I had uh, like a little bit of a tough day. I think I had some chances, but I, my intuition let me down. Like I felt there was a win, so I was looking for it uh, in two different games, and it was identical. Like I was much better, and I have a lot of time, and I felt like I have a win, so I spent all my time looking for one. I didn't find it. And then later, when I checked with the computer, in both cases, I didn't have any win. You know, and it's very important in chess to to feel when you have the win and to look for it. So, but sometimes, yeah, you feel it's there, but it's not. So. Yeah, yes, we we could see it on the camera that like right after this final game, you you were sitting at the computer, and we could almost see from your body language when you sort of were looking for that win that we that we understood that you sensed. What what is that like when you go into the computer afterwards to look for it? Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, uh, in the last game, there was one crucial moment. At some point, I had a very good position, and I. Like everything is in its best place, and now I should have something. And I had like one minute at the time, and I just didn't see where it was, so I just made a rook move. And then later I realized I had this bishop maneuver, you know, bishop swinging over to the queen side. And I realized it later, and when I did it later, I thought he fell for it anyway. But then he has a defense already, and then it's already too late. So uh, it was a missed opportunity there against Shah, and also with Eric was good. But you know, this rapids, to be honest. Uh, if you look at uh, the games, I mean, it just goes back and forth three really. So you just have to hope for better luck yeah. next time. So Anish, what are your goals for this tournament? We know that uh, some of the players, they've got an eye on the standings, trying to position themselves well for the final. Yeah, it's very, very hard. I mean, I uh, played a lot of these tournaments. I'm very experienced by now of the Champions Tour. And, you know, I've had starts of like um, winning three games or even more. And I can tell you, even if you won three games, uh, still, it's not easy to force your way through qualification. Because once you start uh, taking too much, uh, paying too much attention, you know, in chess, it's always hard because it's a game of two players. So you cannot force uh, the draws, you cannot force the wins. You might think, okay, I have, you know, play an outsider here, so I try to win, but okay, he's also playing, yeah? And the same with the draws. I mean, you, you might want the draw, but the opponent might not. So uh, it's never easy to force these qualifications, to be honest much more important to play well, to play all the 15 games well. And, uh, okay, if you are so fortunate that in the last couple of games uh, you are almost there, you can force a draw against someone who is also there, well, go ahead. But otherwise, I think um, paying too much attention to setting is, is early. Um, and, you know, I have a, a kind of busy busy household today, like at some point, um, because they ask you to they ask you to share your audio. I mean, against you know, it's for their own risk. Uh, they ask uh, they ask me, so I share. But the mid, like I see in the midway mile game at some point it says you'll have been muted. <laughs> <laughs> I can very well understand why, but then don't ask me. I mean, don't ask me to share my audio. So I share my audio, and then they, they can't stand it anymore. I mean, come on, guys, you have to be a little tougher. Which of your sons was making the noise, or, or was it you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. Sometimes you're surprised uh, who is the baby in the house. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and I mean, 
very often uh, it's me, you know, who's acting the, the worst from all three boys. But um, yeah, no, it's a, it's good, a good time, of course. Uh, and I have to say, I'm very lucky that I'm sleeping extremely well, at least. Um, with the previous baby, I wasn't. I, uh, but this, this one, this one is being a very, uh, very quiet, uh, as quiet as baby can be. But yeah, when the push comes to shove and games get exciting, he also gets excited, and then the host uses him. So that's that's life. Well, that's life, Anish. It's, it sounds lovely to me. <laughs> uh, we wish you the best of luck tomorrow. Hope you get some sleep tonight then with uh, not too much noise. Yeah, for sure. Really. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Good luck tomorrow. Anish Giri, five draws today. And now we're also joined by Vidit, ending the day uh, with a loss. How are you feeling, Vidit? Uh, not so good, I mean, The yeah. last game was just a draw. It was a pity to just blunder in the end. Yeah. Um, oh, overall, uh, the performance today, uh, what has it been like? Well, I'm just uh, happy that I'm able to play because um, I've not been feeling too well since past oh, no. two, three days. And um, I spiked a fever, so I'm just like, just trying to play, you know, not thinking about the games at all, actually. Wow. Um, is it, um, is the situation still that you're feeling very sick or are you feeling better are you having hopes for the next few days um no actually even like until this afternoon i was thinking of probably uh, i was not sure if i'll be able to play uh, even one game today wow um, and i thought it would be like you know pity to withdraw at such a last moment uh, and i wanted to i really wanted to play so i'm just like forcing myself physically to come here and uh, play as many games as i can Wow. Well, then, I have to say we're so impressed with the star you had to the tournament, especially winning game one. And, and it was also looking really good against Magnus and a, and a draw. So how do you explain that fantastic start you had? Yeah, uh, against Jordan, Jordan just plundered a bishop, which was, uh, I mean, thanks to him, at least I scored one win. <laughs> uh, yeah, and against Magnus, I felt like I played well, quite well, actually. In the end game, I think the queen end game should be winning. Uh, maybe if I put my king on h3, uh, it should be winning uh, against Magnus this end game. Um, but after that, it was just downhill. So, I mean, the first two games were good, but after that, it went started going wrong. All right. Well, uh, no wonder then if you're feeling sick. So what's going to be just the focus now before tomorrow? Then get get some sleep and and rest maybe. Yeah, yeah. Just sleep. Yeah, that's oh. that's the only thing. All right. Well, we definitely don't want to hold you. Uh, we hope you feel better tomorrow, Vide. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, wow. That mm. must be tough. That Playing is tough. while you're sick. Yeah, and especially he mentioned he had a fever as yeah. well. That's difficult, you know, because you can play chess when you're not feeling so well. And chess can sometimes even be a welcome distraction yeah. to the pain. But uh, a fever, mm, that's difficult. Right. So, uh, well, well, well played to Vidal actually for showing up, fighting and uh, playing some good. Uh, we do hope that Vidit feels better soon, Surya. That explains the jacket that you were talking about earlier. Exactly, exactly. I mean, 26 degree and jacket, it felt a bit wrong somehow. Mm. Well, it's he's uh, not feeling well. And despite that, a pretty decent start for him. Uh, he did get a better position against Magnus, winning that first game. And of course, uh, still a long way to go. We will see how the players perform on day two. Gangs, we were just... Okay, let's first bring up our standings after day one of the preliminaries. And this is how the field looks. Lavon Aronian, we do have a sole leader with four points. That is massive scoring on day one. Behind him, like half a point, Magnus Carlson and Artemiev. Artem Artemiev continues to impress in this format, format of the Meltwater Champions Chester. A big pack of Hungry Wolves at three points. Tom Inguez, Wesley So, Ali Reza, and Shakrar Mamedyarov. Two and a half points for Anish, and then a lot of players with two points. At the bottom of the table with one and a half, Jan Khrushchev Duda, big heavy favorite in this one. And I have to say that Maxime needs to watch out. He is the one player for whom there is so much at stake here at the AIM Chess US Rapid. He needs to make it to the knockouts to secure his spot in the grand final of the Champions Chess Tour in September. Gangs, you were taking us through the very last moments in that game. Uh, Vidit mentioned himself that this should have been a draw, but he, 
he missed a uh, he missed that moment where you were showing us the so yeah. where white didn't have a move yeah so i was saying first of all probably it was much wiser to not to allow this uh, knight to jump into d3 and just just eliminate this knight put your king on g2 this would have been the safest way to do it but uh, once this knight came it's very interesting that uh, liam thought uh, this will give him uh, chances it felt like a completely drawn uh, end game and i believe at this point if uh, vidit would simply play king f1 most likely the game would have ended in a draw rook g2 uh, still uh, black could not take the pawn because either way uh, white white will sort of okay we, we cannot play bishop c8 yet but uh, still kind of keep it keep this rook uh, engaged hmm. actually having said that i'm just wondering maybe it was better to take immediately and get to this square but anyway that did not happen king d6 here now we really cannot take because it's trapped and at this point it is some kind of zugzua but uh, practically any move should draw i mean even if i lose this pawn uh, let's say yeah just for sake of argument like if i play something like this threatening king f2 you probably have to come here and even if i just uh, maintain this position it's it's hard to imagine why it is going to lose this with uh, two pieces but what happened here was um with it thought g even g4 is fine i'm i'm sure that he was counting on a g4 and after that he wanted to play the move knight e1 threat attacking the pawn and rook g1 there is king f2 rook g1 or rook g3 both there is king f2 but what he must have overlooked is instead of taking this there is an additional move rook c2 i'm hitting that bishop on c8 hitting that bishop yeah and it doesn't have a square where it can defend the g4 pawn yes exactly and then all the pawns are coming you once you move the knight yeah you will move the rook somewhere and then the pawns are rolling in and this is where it went wrong and then he became desperate to uh, sacrifice and then that's how we got into this end game and here there was no chance Absolutely. Well, this was a yeah. tough end for Vidit. And let's once again take a look at our standings finishing day one. And this is where we're at with Levon leading the scoreboard uh, with four points. And at three and a half, we've got Magnus and Artemiev. We've got day two coming up with five more rapid games, but the action doesn't stop on chess 24. Throughout the event, we've got great, great tournaments, Side events planned for our viewers. There are daily arena tournaments happening on Chess24 every day at 4 p.m. Central Time. And uh, you can go participate, play against grandmasters, top players. Uh, so go on Chess24 and definitely look at taking part in the arena tournaments. Once you've taken part in these tournaments, also consider going to aim chess to find out how you can do better on the next day the next tournament because aim chess will tell you with that data analytics where you need to improve where can you get stronger and provide you with a digital personal trainer who will take care of all the weaknesses in the game there are some very cool prizes as well and gangs we've got something very exciting planned for tomorrow uh we are going to be reviewing the games of our audience so i'm going to ask the mods on chess 24 as well as on twitch and on youtube to please spam the chat with the link for where our chess 24 members can go and they have to just leave a comment we'll be picking up the usernames analyzing and reviewing their games with aim chess uh, to provide some digital personal training Wow, that's that, that sounds very exciting. Can I also give some of my games? <laughs> sure, gangs. You know what you have to do. Just I'll WhatsApp you the link right away. Just go leave a comment about what a fun day you've had commentating with me. And I'll make sure that we pick you. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, by the way, Tanya, before, uh, before we uh, wrap up, I just want to show one moment. It just uh, stumbled. Uh, we never saw this game. Just the last bit, last two moves. Sure. This is from actually round two, uh, a game between uh, uh, Dominguez and Mamaderos. Completely normal position there, nothing can go wrong. Will you be surprised if I tell in another four moves why it got mated? 
I'm actually just shocked because I just realized I saw the position, I saw the result. Shark beat Dominguez in this position. It's an opposite color bishop endgame. It's equal pawns currently. I, and I have a feeling that king on h4. Something happened yeah. to that king on h4. <laughs> yeah. So c5 was played in the game. And very strange move, rook h3. He probably wanted to play king g3 attacking on h6. g5, still nothing wrong. Absolutely nothing wrong. White plays king to g3. Attacking the pawn on h6, everything is fine. But instead, white played king h5. White says, you know, I want to take this. How are you going to defend that? You take on f4, I take on f4 back. A quick quiz for you, Tanya. Oh my Find god, I was hoping you wouldn't say that at the end. Oh my god, but I think I see your idea. Is it rook e5, f5, king g7? Exactly. Rook e5, oh f5, king g7. And after e6, shark doesn't even take yet. Eh? Shark plays bishop e4. But this and is important, gangs, because bishop e6, there might be rook f3. Yeah, there is rook f3, exactly. There is rook f3. I believe still it should be winning because... Uh, can I go... I don't know. I just feel it should be winning, but I still don't see it. Because h4, maybe the king is getting out of trouble, but bishop e4, like you're pointing bishop out, taking yeah. control of the f3 square and bishop g6. This is stunning. And I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of happy I found it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah after. all right well this is a really nice tactic taking sacrificing and i knew it that king on h4 was going to be in big trouble and with that shark won his final game of the day beating alania dominguez yeah um we just missed it actually we, we were seeing this game until certain point and then we left we thought you know it'll be some kind of uh, easy draw but such a turnaround so yeah, it's been absolutely a pleasure doing day one with you. And I am being told that you won't be joining us tomorrow. You've got other commitments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, but I'll, I'll come back. I'll come back one of these days for sure. And it was, uh, yeah, it was, a, uh, it was great fun and uh, fantastic to comment with you. We look forward Thanks. to having that. Before you go, I want to ask you, what was the moment of the day for you in day one? Uh, the checkmate on King on E6. Alireza Magnus. Mm -hmm. And let's not forget Rook 6 by level. Oh, yeah. That was a stunning. Oh, yeah. yeah. Rook 6. Rook 6 is move of the day. Move of the day. Position move of, of the, the day, day given to Alireza. Move of the day given to Levon. Absolutely. It's so tricky. <laughs> Super tricky. Well, uh, a big shout out to everyone who joined us on all our different platforms. It's been a pleasure commentating. The actions just started. We will be back with day two of the preliminaries as it heats up. The race to the quarterfinals is getting hot. Lots at stake for players here. We'll be back tomorrow. See you then, chat. Bye-bye. Air quality isn't the first thing that comes to mind when you think about chess and esports, but it affects our focus, decision making, health, sleep, and more. What's in the air you breathe? Find out with Air Things. Breathe better, live better. Freedom! So fresh, so new. Freedom! It's all for you. It's all for you. Freedom! Your ears to the ground. Talking about the freedom. It's the best show in town. Freedom. up my rocker but follow me i'm ahead of the game i'm ahead of the game i'm only ever slinging i'm working over time got the song and i'm the singer the melody the vibe i'm a prodigy logically i'm impossibly wanted to never remember my name they remember my name well i'm ahead i'm ahead of the game i'm ahead of the game
Want to raise your chest to a new level? Challenge Yourself is an exclusive, innovative experience designed for Chess24 Premium members. Train like a champ, with a unique set of lessons prepared by the coaches of the challengers. Boris Girlfriend and Co. will help you improve your chess. Play a champ. Play a grandmaster each day in Banter Blitz. Take advantage of this incredible opportunity from June 10th. Go premium and challenge yourself.